So if you can put us live now, please, Sarah. Well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Smart, and I am the chair of this committee. I would like to welcome you all to the Chamber City Council's planning committee meeting taking place at 10 a.m. on 11th of the 1st, 23. Other members of the committee, I will allow to introduce themselves to get their microphones working. So we start with Councillor Bajant. I've just been introduced. So I'm Dave Bajant from Romsey. I'm Councillor Katie Thornber from Petersfield. I'm Councillor Katie Porra from Market Ward. I'm Councillor Jennifer Pagecroft, Queen Edith Ward. Jenny Gawthrop Ward, King's Hedges Councillor. Alex Collis, King's Hedges Councillor as well. Thanks, councillors. Where's, where's Matthew, Councillor Howard? He's... Oh, you're over there, right. Sorry, I didn't see you over there, councillor. Councillor Matthew Howard, Abbey Ward. Thank you. OK. So the officers permanent at the table for meeting are Interim Development and Planning and Compliance Manager, Toby Williams, Legal Advisor, Keith Barber, Committee Manager, uh, James Goddard, Producer, Sarah Steed. Other officers and public speakers will join us throughout the course of the meeting. I will introduce them at the start of relevant agenda items. Housekeeping. Copies of the agenda can be found on the City Council's website under committee meetings, minutes and agendas. Sorry, I can't hear. You can't hear. Okay, I'll speak a bit closer to the microphone. How, is that better? Okay. Shall I... I won't read the previous bit out. It's not that important, really. I think as long as someone's here, that that's fine for the actual item. So I'll carry on. Other officers and public speakers will join us throughout the course of the meeting. I will introduce them at the start of relevant agenda items. Housekeeping. Copies of the agenda can be found on the City Council's website under committee meetings, minutes and agendas. Please try and refer to specific page numbers within the agenda if you are referring to a specific paragraph or plan. Also useful to refer to the item number if people are looking online. Can I remind all of those present of the importance of using the microphones at all times when speaking? Please speak close to and clearly into the microphone. Please ensure you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt the proceedings. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. If anyone has any problems hearing me throughout the meeting, please alert me by waving their hands or advising a council officer. We aim to take a 30-minute lunch break between noon and 2 p.m. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of minutes, seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column or raised hand option. Please do not use the chat col column for any other purpose. The meeting chat is neither confidential nor private and can be subject to an FOI or DPA request. So that's uh, Freedom of Information and Data Protection Act. Is that correct on the second acronym? I think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> Make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to speak. Please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. Could public speakers turn their cameras off until we come to the application we have registered you to speak about? If a report officer drops out from the committee due to poor broadband signal, the senior officer present will take over their presentation or report and respond to questions. The process for each planning application will be <clears throat> the case officer will give a brief introduction to his or her report. Registered public speakers will be invited to have their say. There will be three minutes for those speaking in support and three minutes for those speaking against, unless I've advised otherwise. The committee manager will ring a bell when you have 30 seconds remaining. Once public speakers have addressed the committee, their speaking time is over. 
public speakers are unable to join in with the councillor debate. And as previously said, that includes the chat column online. <clears throat> Excuse me. The committee will then discuss and debate the item and may ask questions of the case officer. At the end of the deliberation, I will ask members to vote on the officer's recommendation by a show of hands. The council has a convention for major planning applications known as the adjourned decision protocol. Where there is a majority resolution that is minded to make a decision contrary to the officer recommendation, the decision to determine the application will then be adjourned and the officers will prepare a further report which will come back to a future meeting of this committee. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. For the comfort of councillors, officers and the public, I may choose to call short breaks during the proceedings. If councillors or officers require a break at any point, please indicate to me and I will halt proceedings at the next convenient opportunity. We only have questions, but go on then. Use the microphone at the back there, because people online won't be able to hear you. Just speak on that, yeah, you. Mr Chairman, I was advised two days ago that the uh, time for speaking for and against had been doubled. You, you mentioned three minutes each. Yeah, just, just turn the microphone off then and sit down. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you for that question. So I was aware that someone might perk up at that comment, but you see, the thing is, this introduction is for all the items today. Your item that you're interested in, Alston Croft, is only one of those items. So yes, you're correct. There is six minutes allocated for speaking time for that item, as I've increased the speaking time. And just to say on that, I was going to say, but I'll say it now, what normally happens is we have the number of minutes and the 30 seconds before the end, the little bell goes, but the idea is that you say your piece, so try and judge it. But if you're still saying the sentence at the end, obviously finish your sentence, let's get the information out there so we have the evidence to make a robust conclusion and have a good debate, that sort of thing. Thank you. So, um, set my screen up again. Apologies, um, I've had apologies from uh, Councillor Dryden and I believe Councillor Bennett, yes, so Councillor uh, Howard is here in Councillor Bennett's place. Any more apologies? No, no, that's it, we're all here, good. Uh, moving on to agenda item three, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest, councillors? Councillor Paige Croft. Thank you, Chair. On item six, it is in my ward, but I have kept myself completely away from it, so I'm completely unfettered and have no opinions one way or the other about it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Porra, make sure you speak close to the microphone, everyone, please. Uh, similarly, for um, the second item, um, Thompson's Lane, it's in my ward. I've been, you know, I'm aware of the issues, but Councillor Bick has dealt with them, or Councillor Gildedale, so I'm unfettered. I had some contact from some residents from Newnham in the last few days by email, which I forwarded to the case officers to ensure that they're included in the presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Very good. Uh, Councillor Bajant. Yeah, I'm a member of Cambridge Cycling Campaign, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Collis. Thank you, Chair. Um, two items. So item four, I'm the executive councillor with responsibility for local nature reserves. So I will withdraw from the decision on that item and speak on the item instead. And item eight, um, Milton Road, that is in my ward. Um, I have had discussions with officers, so I will be not taking part in that item. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah, Councillor Gawthrop Wood. Similarly, for item eight, um, for various reasons it will come to light later, I will be sitting out on that item. Thank you which is in my ward. Thank you, Councillor. And I too will not be taking part in the debate on that same item for the same reasons. Any more for any more? Yes, Councillor Howard. Uh, given the Green Party's objection to Alstone Croft, I've been advised to not vote on the uh, Alstone Croft item. Just to be clear, this is not a political meeting. This is a meeting of the planning committee. It's a quasi-judicial meeting. 
which means it's sort of legal status. We make decisions on the basis of national and local legislation in planning. So I'm surprised that you say that, Councillor, but it's your prerogative to say that which you wish. Anything further you wish to say, or is that it? Yeah, I didn't quite hear that. Could that be said again, please? Well, further to that, I've had it whispered in my ear that you've had legal advice from our legal officer that that is the best thing to do. So perhaps that is the best thing to do in that respect. So I'll leave it there, I think. I won't say any more. Sorry, it wasn't your comment that I didn't hear. It was the councillor's comment. Uh, councillor, do you mind repeating it for Councillor Bajan who didn't hear what you said? So given that uh, there was an objection made on behalf of the Cambridge Green Party for the Alstone Crofter application, I was given advice to therefore withdraw my voting rights in on this item. Chair, I understand uh, Councillor Howard is registered to speak as a ward councillor as such, he wouldn't vote anyway. It would be either or one speaks as a ward councillor or one participates in the committee. And I believe Councillor Howard registered as a ward councillor to speak on our Croft item. Thanks, James. Is that, is that right, Councillor? You're speaking as a ward councillor. I haven't looked at the That's list. correct, yeah. You are. Okay, yes. Uh, councillor Collis. Sorry, just a point of clarification. Um, Alstone Croft is in Newnham Ward, isn't it? I'm sure ha Councillor Howard can speak, but not as a ward councillor. Well, yes and no. So any councillor can speak on, it, on any item in any ward in this committee. Uh, we often sort of, mm, sort of lump that together as meaning that it has to be a councillor in that particular ward which the item, uh, the application is in, but that isn't really the case. So it's he's called a ward councillor, but he's not actually in that particular ward. So... There you are. Any more? It's not really a debate, mine, councillors. Let's get on with the business. But, Councillor Bajan? Chair, I'm really shocked at the decision by Councillor Howard because most people. Keep that shock to yourself, Councillor. Let's get on with the business now. So, we don't need to talk about that now. That's, that's well, their I'm trying decision. to, Chair. Are you stopping me? Yes, I am, Councillor. In that case, let's get on with the business. As I said, item four, Alston Croft. We've got quite a lot of speakers, so we need to get on. And just on that, um, if councillors could be succinct and not repeat things, that would be good. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have, I think, seven councillors speaking, which is probably a record in terms of how long I've been on this committee, uh, which shows the strength of feeling about the item, which is good. Nevertheless, um, I'm always cognizant of the fact that we have a presentation which councillors hear, in addition to all the evidence they've already seen and the site visit and all of that, but they need to keep that fresh in their mind. So we want to approach the item and have a robust debate with that fresh in our mind. So, and also councillors, on the other hand, if you feel you need anything repeated because you've forgotten it, then by all means, let's go back to the case officer and have that information repeated for us because it is going to be a longish debate. So let's pace ourselves and be sensible about getting information and good information and not something we sort of slightly remember, but perhaps not. We're all human. So on that, in that case, uh, Tom, are you ready to present the item? We've got, um, just, just to say, we've got, uh, uh, I don't know if I need to go through the list or not, perhaps I will. I've got David Camero, Pam Gatterall, Andrew Bainbridge, Emma Mundis, and then the, I won't list all the councillors, but speaking afterwards, but the presentation first. So, Tom, if you're ready to present them, please. Hello, Tom, good morning. Hello, good morning. Right. When you're ready, then. Can you confirm, Chair, that you can see my screen? Yep, see it. Thank you. So before I start the presentation, um, just draw a member's attention to some minor amendments. Speak uh, up a bit, the... Tom, if you can, because some people aren't hearing things so well in the, in, okay. here in the Guildhall. So before I start my presentation, I'll just uh, refer members to the amendment sheets that was published today and um, this includes some clarifications to some of the paragraphs in the officer report and also um, in addition to an update on the an option for uh, the relocation of the children's nursery um, along Barton Road 
uh, which is a live planning application. Um, also, one of the conditions has been slightly amended. Uh, further representations have been received from Friends of Paradise Nature Reserve, uh, the parents of the adjacent school at Newnham Croft and other third parties. Um, these concern uh, biodiversity impacts and uh, construction impacts um, and are covered in the officer report. So the proposed development is at Alstone Croft is for the demolition of the nursery building, part of the outbuildings, partial demolition, refurbishment and extension of other existing college buildings and the erection of four accommodation blocks containing 60 rooms for postgraduate students. It also includes associated landscaping, car parking and cycle parking, refuse and other storage and a new electricity, electricity substation within the outbuildings. The application site is here outlined in red. Um, it's approached from Barton Road and down Grantchester Street via a section of unadopted highway called Short Lane and then Alstone Road, which leads up to the entrance of the application site. The, construct, the indicative construction route would also follow that, uh, that route. So in terms of the site constraints, the application site is located adjacent to a protected uh, open space and city and county wildlife site known as Paradise no uh, Local Nature Reserve. This is situated in this, this green area here to the south and the east of the application site. There are trees within the application site and adjacent to it. Um, although mainly within flood zone one, uh, to the east, uh, east side of the application site is located in flood zone two and three. It is also adjacent to the green belt. It is within the Newnham Croft conservation area and is adjacent to the school grounds to the north, which is also protected open space. This is the aerial view of the site. Uh, here is the Newnham Croft Conservation Area Appraisal. Um, details are found within the officer report um, in terms of the assessment against that appraisal. You note that there's no positive views uh, identified in the appraisal within that go towards the application site itself. The exist this is the existing site plan. This shows uh, the, that the um, site comprises three blocks of accommodation, block A here, block B and block D. The ground floor area is uh, currently used as a children's nursery. There's also a maintenance compound and other cycle storage and a substation. Uh, also, there is an outbuilding and uh, the, a porter's lodge, which is a building of local interest. In terms of demolition, the, the proposal is to demolish some of the extension, the later extensions to block A here, this marked in hashed lines. Also demolition of the nursery building and the demolition of the cycle stores. This is the proposed site plan. The proposal is for four blocks of accommodation um, arranged in so individual houses arranged in three to four blocks of terraces uh, and it's arranged in an east-west um, configuration. Uh, the um, distances I have included on this plan um, showing the relationship to the school grounds to the north, so the, the distances are between 12 and 25 metres. In terms of the relationship with the local nature reserve to the east and the south, I've also put some figures on that, and that ranges from 16 to 30 metres. This is the proposed roof plan. Um, 
showing the arrangement of solar panels and air source heat pumps on the proposed blocks. There'll be a reduction in the number of car spaces on site going down from 19 to eight um, accessible um, bays and one um, standard bay and also a delivery, um, a delivery and servicing space. So in terms of the elevations, this is the block four, which is the southernmost block. And uh, this is uh, the what it would um, look like in terms of the elevation drawing. The height of the building is 10.5 metres. And this is the east and west elevation. In terms of the internal configuration of the blocks, the uh, as I said before, um, they'll be arranged in three or four uh, blocks of accommodation to individual houses. The five bed units would accommodate uh, an accessible um, bedroom, um, is as, as, as shown here, and it also provide communal space such as dining and living area. It's the first floor plan showing a good sized bedroom and also a separate study area and ensuite. And the similar on the second floor is the proposed roof plan showing solar PVs and air source heat pumps. In terms of the blocks nearest the school grounds, this would be blocks one and two. Um, and this is what would be, uh, these are the northern elevations. So these are the ones um, in the closest proximity to the school boundary. So in terms of the relationship with the local nature reserve, Site sections have been provided by the applicant and uh, as can be seen in this section one, which is the northeastern block, so block two. Um, this shows distant, the distance of 21 metres um, from the two and a half storey block element to the boardwalk itself. In terms of block three, which is the middle block, this shows distance of 31 metres to the existing boardwalk. And then finally block four, which is the southernmost block. This shows distances of between 19 and 28 metres um, when taken on these sections. So a landscape visual impact assessment has been carried out and submitted as part of the application. This is uh, a verified view of uh, the, near the entrance to the site, showing the existing view on the left, and you just about see the nursery building here, the white rendered nursery building, and the replacement with the new block. That is at year one. In terms of block four, this is um, a view to, from the eastern side of the local nature reserve towards the application site, showing the proposed change. You can see the existing view on the left here, showing the nursery building and the proposed block that would what it look like after year one. And then this is what it would look like at year five with the landscaping uh, shown, so the trees shown within that. This is a view from further up the boardwalk to the north, showing in between block three and block two, showing the existing site on the left-hand side, 
and then the proposed. This is a sum that would be a, a summer view. And then at year five. In terms of the uh, changes to the existing blocks, the Alstone house, which is the original house on the site, which is block A, there'll be changes to the front facade, um, uh, again, uh, removing the, the later extensions and replacing them with new extensions, um, uh, comprising study centre, seminar room and cycle stores. In terms of the ground and first floor, um, the ground floor is on the left hand side. The red um, line around here shows what would be demolished as part of the proposal. Um, and then uh, this new uh, study centre would be uh, installed as well as a seminar room and a cycle store down here. In terms of changes to block B, which is the, the four storey uh, block on the site, this is to be externally rendered um, and thermally upgraded. We have a parapet wall um, erected um, above and air source heat pump enclosures. And here are the changes in terms of the ground and first floor plan. This would include a cycle store, and a cafe, a small cafe for students. But the proposed um, outbuilding would be uh, partially, demol partially demolished to make way for the new block four, and uh, this would accommodate a refuse store as well as a substation. Here's a uh, proposed soft landscaping layouts um, showing the placement of trees um, and this would be subject to condition to re require details of these. This shows uh, medium and small trees being uh, in this light green colour and then larger trees um, in these in this darker green. Um, this allows for filtered views through the application site and uh, also this these swales as part of the drainage scheme as well shown on the on the plan. The main considerations as part of this uh, application, the principal development, um, the site is an established student uh, use of student accommodation. Um, there is demonstra uh, demonstrable need for uh, additional uh, postgraduate accommodation um, and the proposal would improve welfare and study spaces. The nursery would be located um, off site. This would reduce the number of car movements um, coming onto the site um, and a condition is recommended to ensure a suitable replacement is found and is in operation prior to demolition of the existing nursery building. Design, scale and massing of the new blocks. Um, so although the openness of the site would be reduced, the landscape led scheme would enhance the application site and allow for filtered views from the uh, local nature reserve. It's considered that the blocks uh, sit comfortably within their surroundings and on, offer interesting views into the site. And the scheme has support of the urban design, conservation and landscape officers. The impact upon the character of the conservation area and the adjacent protected open space. So the character of the conservation area would be preserved and the built form and landscape, uh, landscape um, scheme would successfully be integrated into the site with hedging and trees blurring the boundary with the local nature reserve and the immediate value of the Paradise, Paradise Nature Reserve would not be adversely impacted. Sustainability, so the new blocks would achieve passive house standards 
um, existing buildings will be upgraded and a whole life carbon study has been carried out to, um, in terms of the loss of the nursery building. The biodiversity impacts, the lighting scheme um, would be uh, a sensitive one in terms of bat, bat species. This has the support of the uh, Nature Conservation Officer and a measurable gain in biodiversity would be achieved within the application site. The proposed scheme would use sustainable drainage features um, and the development would not increase flood risk elsewhere. The application has support of the uh, local lead for the flood authority. The um, construction route is considered um, achievable and realistic. Um, conditions and Section 106 obligations are recommended to ensure the access route is safely managed during construction. And finally, um, construction impacts upon uh, amenities and adjacent schools have been considered um, and uh, have the support of the environmental health officer that it's considered that subject to condition that can be safely um, uh, sorry, appropriately managed and mitigated. So the offer recommendation is approval subject to conditions, section 106 obligations and informatives. Um, on this call, I also have specialist offices from the City Council and County Council um, to assist in answering members' questions. So these include as follows, uh, Guy Belcher, uh, the Council's Nature Conservation Officer, Adam Finch and Greg Kearney, uh, the Council's en Environmental Health Officers, Susan Smith, the Council's Conservation Officer, Trevine Montero, the Council's Urban Design Officer, Helen Sayers, the Council's Landscape Officer, Emma Davis, the Council's Sustainability Officer, and then from the County Council, uh, Dr John Finney, the Development Management Engineer from the Local Highways Authority, Jez Tuttle from the Transport Assessment Team, and then finally Hilary Tandy from the Lead Local Flood Authority. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Tom. So just to say <clears throat> that's a, a good spread of um, consultants you got there. So we'll do make use of those. I mean, you're the boss, you're the case officer, but make use of those with questions from councillors. Let's get some responses from those people as well. It'd be good. So the two um, objectors are David and Pam. So you've got six minutes to speak. The public speaker table is at the back there in the middle. If you want to come to that table first, so David first. And um, obviously, we'll stop the clock in between the two of you, so you can say your piece within the six minutes. I just want to check something with my officer as well here a minute. Right, that's something confirmed. That's good. So, OK, when you're ready then, objectors. Hello, David. Good morning. So if you... You press the right hand button, the thing should light up and then say your piece when you're ready. Fine. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, ladies and gentlemen, with ownership come responsibilities. Just because you have rights doesn't mean you have to do with them what you please. Queen's College is a respected institution, one of the oldest colleges of Cambridge University. But now it has submitted a planning application that we believe will blight the neighborhood we live in, the one where our children go to school. From the elder pillars of our community, many of whom are frail and vulnerable, to the youngsters whose laughter brings joy and hope to our streets, all will suffer from this callous attempt to profit for profit's sake. This college wants to squeeze all it can from Alston Grove, no matter what the consequences on the wider community will be. This site already has around 100 rental rooms and a garden. They want to concrete over the garden to add over 60 new rental rooms. This garden,
borders a nature reserve on one side and a school on the other. Because the development will be built on a flat plain, it is likely that major earthworks and piling will be required. This work, the demolition and construction, and the thousands of truck movements through narrow streets will cause tremendous disruption to our small and quiet neighborhood. Newnham Croft School, which is right next door to Alston Croft, will be blighted by noise, dust, vibration for, for years, possibly. The children missed school during the pandemic. They will once again be unable to learn on site. If you approve this development, it will also forever blight the Paradise Nature Reserve with increased traffic, light, and noise pollution at night, disturbing and damaging a rare natural space that is a vital habitat for wildlife and is beloved by the people of Cambridge. It looks like this development will cause great harm to the area just to enrich an already wealthy and established institution. Cambridge is a very successful city, but we must balance growth and development against damage to quality of life and the environment. As an elected body, the council has a responsibility to weigh the benefit of a real estate development to the developer versus the harm caused to the community, the city, and the environment. In this case, it looks like the bursa of Queen's College is making a play for maximum profit at everyone else's expense. I respectfully call upon you to reject this proposed development, or failing this, to set the stage for negotiations in which representatives on all sides can reach a sensible compromise. Queen's College is many hundreds years old. There is no hurry. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. So the, the clock is stopped at the moment, and Pam, you're next to speak, I think. So just to say, everyone, this isn't a piece of theatre. This is a quasi-judicial meeting, as I said earlier. We're here to do some business. We want to make a good decision. So there's no need to applaud things. I know you may feel it's a good speech and all of that, but we just want to hear what people have to say, that's all. Thank you. Pam. I'm speaking as the chair of the Friends of Paradise, which has 160 members from across the city and is loved by people from Cambridge and beyond. We were not consulted on these plans, as is claimed. We were shown them. And concerns were then raised, not just by our group, but by every local RA, the forum, the school, and our councillors. Our views were ignored, the plans submitted are unchanged, and the opposition to them is widespread and virtually unanimous. It's not an exaggeration to say that this development, with construction lasting around two years, would have a disastrous impact on wildlife and biodiversity in this small area. There had been no environmental assessment and the Friends of Paradise worked to raise substantial funds to pay for consultants to give their expert opinions. The city's ecology officer has said in his report that the plans are acceptable based on the information supplied by the applicant. But what these consultants have found is that the applicant has provided inadequate and misleading information, and there has been a lack of scrutiny of the important issues regarding the nature reserve and the impact on the neighbourhood. It was claimed that bat activity was negligible, but the Bioscan bat surveys found at least eight species, including the endangered Barbastel bat. It's claimed that there will be no harm to the bats as they are accustomed to high levels of light. This has been proven to be incorrect. It is claimed that the line of trees to be felled for the drainage scheme are in poor condition, but this is untrue and they are vital for the bats. 
as a conduit and foraging ground. It's claimed that there is no flood risk to the site or surrounding area. But consultant hydrologist GWP have said the flood risk assessment and proposed drainage scheme is inadequate. It was claimed that the access to Arlstone Croft is a highway, but it is a footpath and the safety of the many pedestrians using it to visit the nature reserve, including people with disabilities, has not been considered. These issues are not mentioned by the council's access officer in his report. He, like all the other council officers, has failed to look at this development in its context. Paradise is a priceless natural asset which should be being protected rather than exploited as an asset for a building project. The council has declared climate and biodiversity emergencies and has policies in the local plan and the biodiversity SPD that should protect it. The decision made today on this application... just come to a conclusion item, please, Pam? Sorry, sorry yes. The decision made on this application will be seen in Cambridge and more widely as a test of whether these policies can be upheld when faced with a powerful college determined to force through plans regardless of the harmful impact on the environment and our community. These plans may be deemed accessible, but this has been shown to be inadequate at best, misleading in many cases. It does not stand up to any scrutiny and cannot possibly be a basis on which to approve this planning application. Uh, uh, as I said, I prefer not to have the applause or anything else. I um, appreciate it's already happened. But just to say, during the debate, uh, if you could please not be clapping or booing or anything like that, because we just want to get on with the debate, everyone, not have that sort of interruption when we're, when we're discussing the item. So it was just under seven minutes, in fact, not six minutes. So the applicant and the supporter who wishes to speak we'll have that time also. So, Andrew, you wish to speak now, the applicant? Hello, morning. So it's the right-hand button on the speaker. Press that down, it should light up, and then you're off. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good morning. I'm Andrew Bainbridge, domestic bursar of Queen's College, and I've led this project for the last three years. Newnham has always been a special place for Queen's. In addition to fellows making their homes there, for over 30 years, each year, more than 100 members of the college have lived at Alstone Croft, with more in neighbouring homes. Those residents and college members support local businesses and community groups and have helped other local provisions. In the past, we provided the neighbouring school with temporary classroom space over two terms whilst they carried out their own building works. Alstone Croft is of great importance to us as a place of learning and well-being, located close to the heart of the college on Silver Street. We have always dreamt of enhancing the site to create accommodation opportunities and make sustainable use of the land. Our love and respect of the location, ordering the nature reserve, is why we challenged the team to design the site master plan with ecology, environment and landscape leading the brief. The proposed design aims to increase biodiversity by over 50% and encourage wildlife to flourish on and off site. We are reducing artificial light levels at the boundaries to protect transit routes of bats and other animals. Green roofs are being installed to encourage insects to the site. And breaking away from college tradition, we are replacing sterile lawns with species-rich wetland, long grass meadows, and planting native hedgerows and over 30 new trees. All this supports a sustainable drainage plan, which will enhance on and off-site drainage. The plans also support our long-term net zero carbon aspirations by removing dependency on gas and utilising sustainable technologies and approaches to building design. We have always recognised the constraints of the site. That is why we embarked on an open public consultation and detailed planning performance agreement with the council. Transparency has been very important to the college, which is why we have repeatedly agreed to extensions of time during the application review providing clear and detailed responses to objections and questions raised during this nine-month period. The quality of the proposed development is clear from your officer's report, with no objections from any officer or statutory consultee. 
You have heard objections raised by a few residents throughout this last 18 months. We have responded to those comments, requests for further information and misunderstandings which may have come to light. We did have some positive engagement with local people. Amongst the negatives were the Friends of Paradise. The group refused our invitation at early stages to input constructively to the landscape and ecology designs, wanting only to comment after the application had been submitted. Personally, it has been a real shame that there's been such strong political use of the nature reserve against this application. It's time to bring the focus on the ecological and environmental long-term benefits and opportunities this project will bring to the location. And the college is still open to input from the Friends of Paradise and other groups. In the short term, construction transport is a major consideration. The development will, closely, will have closely controlled plans throughout the project and the design aims to reduce dependency on heavy vehicles. However, the finished article will provide long term reduction in traffic and low levels of parking on site with no nursery drop offs. We are committed in providing an ongoing nursery provision and have plans in place to provide a new nursery within the local area in a more accessible location. This is something the college is very passionate about. Once complete, Alstonecroft will house an additional 45 existing postgraduate students. In turn, this will reduce pressure on local domestic housing. The proposed improvements at Alstonecroft will outlive us all, with sustainable, long-lasting homes in an enhanced biodiverse landscape, whilst addressing much needed improvements to the existing buildings. Thank you for your time and contributions to this process, including the challenges. They have all led to an enriched design and clearly viable project. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So next speaker, please. Thank you. I believe it's Emma. Hi. Um, how many minutes have we got left, James? Just under three minutes, Chair. Okay. Yep. So it's the right, um, right hand button should light up and then you're away. Okay. <clears throat> I requested to speak today because I think it's important to hear from people like me who are often underrepresented on decisions like this and yet are the mo who are those who are most directly impacted, by which I mean young people, students, and people who rent in this city. And looking around the room today, I think clearly demonstrates this lack of representation. I am an undergraduate at Queen's, and I'm in fact currently living at Alston Croft, so I know firsthand that the college and the university as a whole has a severe shortage of accommodation of all types. Uh, this pushes students into the private sector, which is problematic for two reasons. Firstly, due to the housing crisis, both nationally and most severely in the city, renting in the private sector is deeply unaffordable, especially on student budgets. Pushing students into the, into, the private, into the private sector acts to widen inequalities in the student body and disadvantages low-income students. Also, students displaced put greater pressure on the private rental sector, only furthering the existing supply shortage and increasing rents for everybody, impacting citywide issues. A city which, according to many sources, is already the second most expensive city in the country. I think it's also important to look at the wider picture environmentally. This development is for modern, energy efficient accommodation built to the highest energy efficiency standards within a five minute cycle of the city centre and a 10 minute cycle of the main university sites. And in fact, this morning it was an eight minute cycle to the Guildhall. Um, during a climate crisis and a simultaneous cost of living crisis, largely being driven by energy unaffordability, this is exactly the sort of development we should all welcome. Um, thanks to the committee for listening to my comments. Thank you. Okay, so we're done, I think, with public speakers. In that case, we'll move on to councillors. So the first on the list is Councillor Smith. So the war councillor area is over there, but you can speak wherever, as long as the microphone works. And you have unlimited time to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Councillor Simon Smith. Um, I'm the Labour Councillor for Castle Ward. My name is Simon Smith. I'm Councillor for Castle Ward. In this submission... Councillor Smith, just, just check. Can, can everyone hear that? No. OK. Bit of a problem. Don't know. Maybe the, the microphone isn't working very well or something. Thanks, on. Yeah, just shout later, I think, Councillor Smith. Project. Okay. You know, you're a poet or something, you need to get to the back of the audience. I shall do my best. Thank you. Don't rustle your paper either, that'll be awful on the right no, I... Thank you, Chair. 
In this submission, I will refer to the inadequacies in the evidence required to meet vital local plan policy tests, which have led to a fundamentally flawed proposal. It fails to justify site selection as required in the biodiversity SPD. It fails to demonstrate a positive response to site context as required under local plan policy 55 to ensure the special character of Cambridge is protected and enhanced. It fails to demonstrate it would not have an adverse effect on the biodiversity of the adjoining Paradise Nature Reserve as required under local plan policy 69. And it fails to provide details of measures to fully protect identified species and habitats as required under local plan policy 70. Over 2,000 people have signed a petition against this proposal and 200 objections have been submitted by residents and local nature and conservation groups. Why? Well, because they recognise this proposal to develop Alstone Croft Garden would be harmful to the special character of the area and the ecology and biodiversity of the adjoining nature reserve. In April 2022, solicitors acting for, on behalf of the Friends of Paradise informed the planning service and applicant that the proposal of Butts Local Nature Reserve with protected species and an ecological assessment would be required in accordance with the biodiversity SPD and the policies I've just referred to. The SPD sets out policies and text to guide the preparation of planning applications with potential negative impacts on, on species and habitats. The easiest way to avoid a negative impact on species, as set out in the SPD and habitats, is to maximise the gain for biodiversity that can be achieved from a development, is to select a site that has low existing ecological value and low strategic potential for habitat creation, buffering and connectivity. And this site does have that existing um, role in buffering and connectivity. The SPD continues, developers will be expected to avoid direct and indirect impacts on irreplaceable habitats and embed measures to achieve this within the design of any development proposal. To meet policy requirements, the council will refuse applications that would result in the loss, deterioration or fragmentation of irreplaceable habitats, unless the need for and benefits of the development clearly outweigh the loss and a suitable compensation strategy exists. The burden of proof falls to developers. People are more powerful than planning policies. Applicants ignore policies in part or whole, misinterpret them, or otherwise seek to evade their public purpose. But they do give weight to policies in their interest to justify a planning balance or bias in their favour. Planning committees have a duty to hold such gaming to account by determining planning applications in accordance with national and local plan policies. Local plan policy 55. Development will be supported where it's demonstrated the proposal responds positively to its context and draws inspiration from the key characteristics of its surroundings. The key characteristics of this site context are of such high quality and importance they are identified in the local plan. There's a Green River corridor which comprises the Alstone Garden, the school playing field, the grove, both local plan protected open spaces, and the Paradise Statutory Local Nature Reserve and the River Cam. There's the Newnham Croft Conservation Area designation to which the Alstone Garden is part of the green setting of the, urban, of the area's urban form, and of course the Paradise Nature Reserve to which the garden serves as a habitat buffer and a foraging area for a wide range of habitats, including rare bat species. The main part of the proposal is to build four blocks for postgraduate students across the garden towards River Cam, with blocks close to the boundary of the nature reserve, an ancient hedge, and the Newnham Croft Primary School beyond. The applicant has described the site as a rather bland carpet of grass currently in evidence that could, would be improved by constructing buildings and purports of proposal would have a beneficial impact on the character and appearance of the conservation area, providing areas of attractive landscaping and constructing buildings which respect the form, typology, and materials of prevailing townscape and character. 
I don't think I'm alone in thinking that this is going to be an incongruous urban etch that would sever part of the green corridor, enclose the remaining garden, and require the applicant to demonstrate the proposal would not have an adverse impact on the nature reserve. Local plan policy 69 simply cannot be ignored. They must be given considerable weight in determining this planning application. These policies provide strong protection of nature conservation sites, priority habitats and species from development proposals on adjoining land. <clears throat> and they set a high bar for applicants to demonstrate proposals will not have an adverse effect on biodiversity. Local plan six, policy 69 protection of sites of local nature conservation importance sets out a presumption against approval where development is proposed within or adjoining or which will otherwise affect a locally designated nature conservation site. The policy requires applicants to demonstrate the proposal will not have an adverse impact on biodiversity by addressing three tests required to undertake comprehensive surveys of the historic and existing biodiversity importance, provide a professional assessment of the impact of the proposed development, provide details of measures to protect and enhance the habitat or species identified where adverse effects have been identified. Local plan policy 70, protection of priority species and habitat states, where development is proposed within or adjoining a site hosting priority species and habitats, assessments will be required on the current status of the species population, the species use of the site and other adjacent habitats, the impact of proposed development on legally protected species and their habitats, measures to protect fully the species and habitats identified. The applicant has not provided a comprehensive survey to evidence the current status of the species population, use of the site, and therefore demonstrate the proposal will not have an adverse effect on biodiversity. The local plan records water vole and four rare species of bat and the wet woodland as a priority habitat. Surveys at the reserve have identified eight species, about eight of bat, a reserve comprising three pipistral species, along with the brown long-eared, Dorbertons, Noctul, and the light-sensitive Serentine and Barbastor bats. The latter two are among the 11 mammal species identified on the International Union of Conservation of Nature's Red List as being in imminent risk of extinction. The Narthesis pipistral is one of two bat species identified as near-threatened. Bats are protected in legislation. In addition, the hedge between the primary school and the application site is ancient species rich and important, and important, with an estimated age of 500 to 600 years. The case officer's report, section 9.21, states a preliminary ecological assessment identified sens sensitive species using the site and the adjacent nature reserve and vital tests were carried out. Colleges commissioned by the Friends of Paradise has reviewed the applicants' bat activity surveys and lighting assessments on the bat commuting route along the site boundary and has reported just one of the six survey months <coughs> was carried out in accordance with the industry standard as specified for sites with high quality, high suitability for bats in the Bat Conservation Trust Good Practice Guidelines. Not all of the results have been presented. But those that have record the presence of the rare barbastor bat throughout the survey period, which is exceptional, as is generally, generally only occasional on other registered sites. Turning to lighting, the applicant has confirmed the post-development maximum light level along the nature reserve boundary will be 2.9 lux vertical level. This would be 7.4 times recommended cutoff of 0.4 lux vertical as advised in the Bat Conservation Trust guidelines. It is very difficult to achieve a building in proximity to a boundary where a lighting level of 0.4 lux can be achieved. The presence of the barber stool elevates the matter to one of national significance. The Joint National Conservation Council's guidelines for selection of biological triple SIs 
requires habitats of all species on annex to the Habitats Directive, which includes the Barbastle bat, to be designated special areas of conservation and be protected through triple SI mechanisms. The guidelines continue. Designating routes alone offer only partial protection for bat species as they're reliant on feeding areas and commuting routes within their territories. When designating new sites for bats, efforts should be made to include key feeding areas and commuting routes where possible. In conclusion, it appears this proposal has been informed by a development requirement and evidence has been tailored to justify it. A failure to respond positively to context as required under Local Plan Policy 55 has resulted in a proposal for an incongruous urban wedge across open space and development in, in proximity to the nature reserve and the ancient hedge. If approved, this would irreversibly harm the special character of this distinctive part of the city. Local Plan Policy 69 confirms a presumption against approval of this application as the applicant has failed to demonstrate whether the proposal would not have an adverse impact on biodiversity in the adjoining locally designated nature conservation site. The officer recommendation is to approve subject to conditions that require submission of some, not all, of the evidence required by local plan policies and to repair, and to, to repair severe flaws in submitted evidence. This is a suboptimal approach. Detailed scrutiny by industry experts has found vital evidence to be profoundly flawed and identified since systemic conflicts where a solution of one problem creates another, notably in respect of biodiversity and related protection of bat foraging areas and commuting routes, protection of trees and lighting, flood and water management, air pollution, and access. There's simply too much doubt as to whether the policy requirements and physical constraints and systemic conflicts could be resolved without significant changes to the scheme. As matters stand, the committee does not have all of the evidence required to determine this application on the balance of benefits and policy-based harm, and it should be refused but on the grounds on the following policy grounds. There are 14 local plan policy grounds and two national planning policy framework policy grounds for refusal of this application. National planning policy grounds 199 and 200. Local plan policy grounds 8, 31, 32, 34, 52, 55, 57, 58, 59, 61, 67, 69, 70, and 71. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, councillor. So I uh, guess I would normally leave it to the end, but I'll just say it now. So a couple of acronyms I picked up along the way were SPD, so Supplementary Planning Document, that's one of our things. And then the other thing was that triple SI, as you described them as SSSI, that's a site of special scientific interest. So next councillor is Councillor Holloway. Uh, are you here? I think you might be online, is he? Or... Uh, Chair, I have statements from councillors Holloway, Copley and Gilderdale. Would you like me to do them all and then you come back to councillors in the room or you prefer to do councillors in the room and then I read some statements? We'll do it in order, that'll give you a bit of a break then as well. So if you would do, do Holloway and Copley then, and then we'll go to Howard, thanks. Statement from Councillor Cameron Holloway. Over the last year, I have spent many happy hours listening to Newnham residents' views on this planning application. While there have been some residents who have expressed their support for the application, the overwhelming majority appear to be opposed. There are certainly some advantages to the proposed development. It will provide much needed housing on a very conveniently located site and would in many senses be highly sustainable. I'm also grateful to Queen's College for their willingness to engage with residents on issues that have been raised. However, on balance, 
I'll oppose the application based on two major areas of concern. The impact on the safety and well-being of children at Newton Croft School and increased flood risk posed to the school and Paradise Nature Reserve. Newnham Croft School. Newnham Croft Primary School is within 50 metres of the proposed development with the classrooms and play area for the youngest children immediately adjacent. Construction will cause air pollution throughout the emission of harmful particulates such as PM10, NO2 and PM2.5. Air pollution poses a major health risk to young children, including through increased susceptibility to respiratory illness and reduced lung function. International Air Quality Guidance classifies children as high risk. The applicant's air quality statement uses incorrect and out-of-date assessments. There are no site-specific criteria on air pollution, and Condition 8 does not set any standard or show how this could be achieved. The proposed criterion for particulate matter, PM 2.5, is five times higher than considered safe. Before this application can be determined, Reliable evidence is required on the air pollution risks to children at Newnham Croft School, as well as proposals for their mitigation. The proposals would also overlook the school, the buildings would also overlook the school and its playing field, creating potential safeguarding issues. Once complete, the development would cause increased traffic, including from visitors, taxis and delivery vehicles. This increased traffic could increase risk for children arriving at and leaving school. The proposed development would potentially significantly increase the flood risk to Newnham Croft School and Paradise Nature Reserve. Consultants with expertise in flood risk assessment, management and mitigation design have reviewed the submitted flood risk assessment and drainage strategy on behalf of the Friends of Paradise Nature Reserve. The consultants identified 17 failures, including failure to carry out the flood risk assessment in accordance with best practice and national guidance for a major site, the fluvial flood risks for the 1 in 100 and 1 in 1,000 annual probable events were not adequately assessed. It remains to be proved that the site development and adjacent properties would not be subject to high levels of flood risk and adverse impacts. Failure to demonstrate the effectiveness and reliability of stormwater drainage scheme. Winter groundwater monitoring data is required to inform a robust design of effective attenuation and infiltration systems. The consultants felt that data would be likely to demonstrate the proposed on-site stormwater runoff scheme would be ineffective. Failure to assess adequately assess winter groundwater flooding risk. An assessment is required to establish the impact of the foundations on existing groundwater flows and the potential to exacerbate groundwater flood risk to adjacent properties. Failure to assess interaction and fluvial flooding. In the absence of a correctly defined fluvial flood level for the site that accounts for climate change, it has not been proved that the proposed swales would not be impacted by flooding. Failure to demonstrate no adverse impact on biodiversity as required by Local Plan Policy 69. In the absence of evidence about the flow of stormwater from the ditch into the nature reserve, the, reservoir, the reserves, not biodiversity, should be considered highly vulnerable due to changes in existing runoff characteristics and volumes and low-level pollution. The consultants conclude, quote, in the absence of an adequate flood risk assessment, including a demonstrably viable drainage scheme, planning permission should not be grant, granted, unquote. For these reasons and for those set out by others opposing the application, I do not believe this application should go ahead. End of statement by Councillor Holloway. Thanks for that, James. So now if you read out the next statement from <laughs> Councillor Copley. Uh, statement from Councillor Copley. I'm speaking today about my concerns regarding the risk to children attending Newnham Croft School as a result of a large development on the immediate boundary to the site. The British Lung Foundation and Asthma UK published a report, The Invisible Threat, in February 2021, which described the huge harm done due to a lack of action on air pollution, how there are huge risks of breathing in polluted air, 
and that there is still far too little being done to protect those at risk. As a medical doctor, to hear a fellow medical doctor, Professor Sir Stephen Holgate, Special Advisor to the Royal College of Physicians on Air Quality, describe how serious the problem is using the following words, quote, those toxic gases and tiny particles cut thousands of lives short each year and affect the lives of many more, unquote, makes me compelled to share those concerns. The report uses the strongest possible terms, that is a healthy emergency, a health emergency, and it demands urgent action. Their research attached to the report showed that over a third of schools in England are located in areas with air pollution, specifically fine particulate matter of, or PM 2.5, over levels recommended in the World Health Organization, and that in Cambridge, their modeling indicates there are 39 schools and colleges in areas above the Hughes guideline for PM 2.5. Newnham Croft School is in the current air quality management area for Cambridge, indicating this is in, within a wider area of increased pollution. Air pollution has a, has a huge impact on children's developing lungs and their risk of having further respiratory problems. In 2021, during the inquest of Ella Kissy Deborah, it was finally recognised that air pollution was a major cause for the tragic loss of life of this young girl with severe asthma and air pollution featured on her death certificate. If this development is permitted, 250 children will be forced to play and exercise on a daily basis, just metres from the building of the next door development for at least two years, exposing them to dust and particulate matter, which represents air pollution and avoidable harm. The need for Queen's College to have an additional 40 bedrooms cannot possibly outweigh the risk presented to 250 children for a long period of their formative development. And I point out to the college that there is a 36 student property currently for sale less than half a mile away on Grange Road that could readily meet Queen's College accommodation needs with significantly reduced harm. I urge the committee to reject the application statement from Councillor Copley Ends. Thanks again, James. So next councillor <laughs> is Councillor Howard. He's here today. So hello, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. Just to check, you can hear me okay at that volume? I can, yeah. I'd just like to start with appreciation to yourself and Councillor Bajant for reminding us that this is not a political uh, forum. And I'd just like to confirm and clarify that uh, the, the reason I have stood away uh, due to the declaration of interest from voting on this topic uh, was because on this occasion, due to the fact that the Green Party has objected uh, publicly to this the council team judged that I would therefore be pre, uh, predetermined and, and therefore the, any outcome of this meeting could uh, be subject to a potential legal challenge. So uh, that's the reason that I'm speaking as a, a councillor, not on the committee. But to, to address that directly, I was surprised that the applicant specifically suggested that there was, there was political motive behind uh, the objections to these, because I think that's uh, absolutely wrong it's not the case at all and it's very much about people's and residents protection of the local environment on this occasion the green party has objected to the planning application because it clearly contravenes so many policies in the cambridge local plan 2018 and the biodiversity supplementary planning document that was approved less than a year ago especially policies 69 and 70. our green spaces are precious and people in Cambridge care passionately about them. They have made clear in their almost unanimous opposition and by raising money in particular for experts to even review these plans. Paradise Nature Reserve is loved by thousands of residents from the city and beyond. Objections have been made by many environmental groups such as the Wildlife Trust who have calculated that the claimed 51 percent biodiversity net gain by the applicant is more likely to be at most around 10 percent only 10 percent and more importantly it relates only to the development site itself and takes no account of tree losses on the site and the adverse impact on the nature reserve itself the rich biodiversity of paradise has been well documented including in the recently published the nature of cambridge 
Objections from respected ecologists such as Robert McFarlane give detailed evidence of the wide variety of important habitats and species found there. Some of them from very, are very rare and endangered. Bird expert Bob Jarman considers this to be, quote, the most diverse breeding bird habitat in Cambridge. A full assessment of the local nature reserve is required to demonstrate that development will have no adverse impacts on biodiversity and wildlife, but the applicant has only done a preliminary ecological assessment. Assessments carried out relating to other aspects of this development repeatedly are also inadequate and carried out to criteria with far lower standards than required. These include bat surveys that do not comply with guidelines, an out-of-date tree survey, a flood risk assessment that wrongly classifies the site as minor, not major, groundwater levels assessed only in the summer, and classifying the school as a medium rather than high risk of air pollution. The report proposes addressing the many flaws in this application with conditions, but the correct time to establish a robust baseline is before development, prior to permission being granted. Without the necessary data and correct baseline evidence, it is not possible to know whether the conditions proposed for mitigation are adequate to prevent harm, and the risks of harm in this case are very high. I do not think we can rely on merely conditions for, for this applicant to mitigate unknown risks. The Council declared climate and biodiversity emergencies in 2019 and has policies in the local plan and biodiversity supplementary planning document that should enable us to make sure the decisions we make are all in line with them. What use are these policies if we cannot protect the rare species and habitats in a much-loved city nature reserve or the children at a Cambridge State Primary School? It is very disappointing that the planning team's recommendation is to approve the application despite so many serious and well-founded concerns. The planning balance is about weighing benefit and harm, and the many residents who have objected hope the members of the planning committee will recognise that a decision to grant permission cannot be made with so many important outstanding issues unresolved. I'd just like to finish by addressing the applicant's second speaker, Emma's, Emma's thoughts on, on housing. I think everyone on the, on the committee will agree that we need affordable, sustainable homes. And my point here is that we shouldn't, just, we shouldn't just say we can do that anywhere, regardless of the impact, in this case, of a very sensitive biodiversity uh, site. And with that, I strongly urge the committee to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Uh, I just want to ask a question about the officers. So, just for full transparency, I was just checking with officers, so we've got um, Councillor Howard and Councillor Collis to speak next. I just wanted to check, because those officers would be planning committee members, but won't be taking part in this debate. So, if you could, at the end of this session of Councillor speaking, maybe sit somewhere towards the front of the debating room, so you don't, you're not taking part in any way with the debate that then ensues in terms of your facial expression or anything else, if, you, if that's acceptable. Thank you very much. Okay, so not yet. Councillor Howard, you're okay for the minute. Councillor Collis, you're next. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so some people I will know, and for those who don't know me, um, I'm Alex Collis. I'm the Executive Councillor with responsibility for open spaces, including our local nature reserves. Um, and I was also responsible for the signing off last year of our new biodiversity strategy. So that's my particular interest in this item and it's why I'm not taking part in the debate as a member of the planning committee. Um, I felt I couldn't in good conscious, uh, conscience not speak up on this. Um, I want to thank everyone who's made representations. There is clearly a, a great strength of feeling in the chamber about this. Um, a particular thank you to the Friends of Paradise 
and apologies for not being able to speak with you about this for obvious reasons relating to the committee. Um, but thank you for standing up for the Nature Reserve. I want to start with a quote, um, and I don't think on a morning like this there's anyone better to quote than David Attenborough, because he knows better than the rest of us what he's talking about. And he said, the whole of life is coming to terms with yourself and the natural world. Why are you here and how do you fit in? And I think the key words there are how do you fit in? It's not how do you fit the natural world around what you need or what you think you need. Considerations like this have to be uppermost in how we approach any growth and development around us. And that's what I believe we're talking about here um, today. I don't think there's any more important question that we can ask as councillors particularly. Any development which is a potential risk to biodiversity, um, any development resulting in the loss of green open space, something in which our city, we're very lucky, we're very rich in that, but we can't afford to lose that green open space. Any development um, resulting in the loss of open space must be looked at carefully, looked at again and again and again. And we have to ask those difficult questions. I would add as well that I think, I mean, others have touched on this, but Cambridge colleges are rich institutions. They have lots of um, resources at their disposal and they have alternatives that they can turn to. Um, the biodiversity in the nature reserve doesn't have that luxury. One of the first things I did when I took over this portfolio was visit each of our local nature reserves across the city to understand what they were like and what their importance was both in, in environmental terms um, and in terms of their value to the community. Um, anyone who has visited Paradise Nature Reserve can see what a special and unique environment it is. And once that is damaged, once it is gone, we're not going to be able to get that back. It will be lost forever. And the high community and environmental value that it has, has to be given sufficient consideration in any decision like this. Uh, it's one of the few wet wooden sites along the CAM. It has huge importance to nature. And we have a responsibility, all of us, councillors and everyone, to protect that. Uh, it's got chiff chaffs there, it's got willow warblers, it's got a stand of butterbur, it's got musk beetles in the willow, you know, all life is in that place. I've also spoken um, about the importance of the habitat to bats, and the Bioscan survey that others have mentioned um, have found eight species of bat there, um, red-listed, some of them, as Councillor Smith um, observed, and we have a responsibility to look after those species. There are some serious questions that we've heard about um, over the results of the um, applicant's bat survey, the MKA survey. And we just simply cannot risk any negative, any negative impact at all from any disturbance to the bat population. The plans may well have been judged acceptable based on the information supplied by the applicant. And I have every confidence in our ecology officer, and I know that he will have judged that on the evidence given to him. However, if there is even a single scrap of doubt over this, I just I don't see how that conclusion can stand. I don't, I really do not want us to find ourselves several years or months down the line sitting here thinking about the damage done to the bat population and saying what a shame it is, because by that time, it will be too late. They won't be coming back. We've heard a lot of objections today on a whole range of grounds. Um, I'm not going to you know, go through all of them again. We've heard all of those. I did want to talk about the, the blocks, um, the accommodation blocks, as um, discussed by the case officer when we went through the plans. They are simply too close, too intrusive. And I want to finish by repeating, referring back to the quote that I started with. So 
you know, we need to be asking how we fit into the natural world, not the other way around. We are committed as a council to tackling the biodiversity crisis. Um, last year, as I said, we introduced our new biodiversity strategy. You know, I believed in the words in that strategy then, I still believe in it. But now we have to follow through on that strategy and we have to do what we promised to do. We've got a chance now to get this right. If we get it wrong, it is just going to be too late further down the line. So I would urge councillors to have that uppermost in their mind when they're making their decision, and I call on them to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so Councillor Nsinga is next. Hello, good morning, Councillor. Um, just to check, so you're not in the proper position. You're on screen, that's good. Just to check, you were going to be seen on screen online. Okay, thank so you everyone. very much indeed. Um, when you're ready, Councillor. Uh, yes, I'm ready, and um, <laughs> thank you to everybody who has spoken on this application. Um, uh, and particularly um, all of those councillors who have spoken um, against it. There are many, many concerns in the community about this proposal, as indicated by the very, very large number of um, residents and others who are present today. Um, th there are huge reasons for those concerns, local concerns ranging from uh, worries about the impact, the overlooking of the school, the impact of the um, of the building on the health of the children. There are equally valid concerns about the impact of construction um, on a small residential community and on the small residential roads of Newnham Croft. Uh, these are absolutely valid concerns, but these are valid concerns in many applications. And the thing for me that is the most important about this one is the um, relationship between this site and the Paradise Nature Reserve. Um, and we really need to keep focused on the planning reasons and the planning importance of that site of great biodiversity value. Um, the planning officer talked about um, the, the, the buildings being 21 metres and 31 metres to the boardwalk. And for me, that kind of sums up the problem between the way in which planning officers have to assess is, issues like this and the actual issue... Um, impact that there would be on that site because the insects and the animals that use that nature reserve for them the boardwalk is irrelevant um, and they're not going to be measuring that distance they're going to be thinking about the light spill or not but it's the light spill that's going to matter it's the um, the larger number of people on that site that's going to matter um, and and that the assessment of the site needs to be taken in that context and not simply about what's on the site itself the Paradise Reserve is an absolutely crucial area of rich biodiversity, and we are all aware of the biodiversity crisis that we are facing with rapid glo global collapse in insect numbers and um, uh, implications for animal numbers as a result. Areas like the Paradise Reserve are absolutely crucial in preserving a rich biodiversity, and they are irreplaceable. Um, the loss of trees is also an indication of the huge amount of earthwork and change which is needed to mitigate and manage the water runoff from this scheme. And again, if you look at the way in which the planning officers have to assess that, um, the, the way in which flood risk is looked at is to do with buildings and it's to do with the impact on roads. In this case, we need to look at the impact on the Paradise Nature Reserve. Um, and again, I don't think that that's been picked up sufficiently in the way in which the officers have assessed this. I understand that they are under constraints from the national planning documents, but it's important for us to consider that as we're looking forward. Um, I was really disappointed to hear the applicant speak about um, the, the, the overemphasis that there's been on the, paradise, of, on the Paradise Nature Reserve. It is not, not possible to overemphasize the importance of that site for our city and for the biodiversity of our area. Um, and, and the fact that the applicant was saying we're, we're placing too much emphasis on it doesn't give me any indication that they are um, taking that seriously enough themselves. Uh, they also spoke about the increase in biodiversity, but that, as has been pointed out, that is all on site. It's not looking at the impact on biodiversity off site. And I think that that's the thing that, um, as councillors for the area and for the whole city, we need to be taking extremely seriously. I'm really glad that there's been such strong opposition to this application from councillors from all parties and across the whole of Cambridge. 
Um, and I know that having sat on this committee for many years, it's not easy for councillors to go against the recommendation of officers. I'm really profoundly grateful to the um, to councillors Howard and Smith um, and uh, Collis for, for the really clear way in which they've um, indicated all of the planning reasons why it is possible to turn down this application. And, and I urge you to take those seriously. Um, this application is the wrong application for this site. I mean, it, this site is so precious and so sensitive. Um, planning decisions are always made on a balance of risk against the balance of benefits. And for me, it is absolutely clear that the risks from this application are really significant and the benefits simply do not outweigh those risks to our natural environment um, and to the health and well-being of the children of the school next door. Um, and, and the most important of those is the impact on the Paradise Nature Reserve. So I hope very much that you will take on board everything that's been said and reject this application today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. So one more Councillor and then we're done. Uh, and it's a statement from Councillor Alice Gilda Dell, which James, would you mind kindly reading? Thank you. Statement from Councillor Gilda Dell. Our Stonecroft is part of the Green River Corridor, which stretches from the city centre to Grantchester Meadows. It adjoins Newnham Croft Primary School playing field, a protected open space, and Paradise Nature Reserve, a city and county wildlife site and local nature reserve. The committee report gives little weight to this wider site context. The conservation officer's assessment focuses on the existing built form and street pattern and impact on the original Alston Croft buildings. The assessment pays no regard to the gardens place in the river corridor and its significance in the urban-rural interface, which is recognised as a key characteristic in the conservation area appraisal. The only mention of the local nature reserve is the reference to the good landscape linkages back to the Paradise Nature Reserve. This seems the local nature reserve, this sees the local nature reserve only as a visual backdrop to the proposed development, diminishing its significance. The planning officer's opinion that large blocks a few metres away will enhance the view from the local nature reserve boundary is not shared by the hundreds of people who have objected. The proximity of the buildings to this boundary is one of the most opposed elements of the proposal. Cambridge past, present and future sum up the harm that would be caused, stating, quote, the development of three-storey high buildings in close proximity to the local nature reserve Will have an adverse impact on the character and amenity of the reserve." Unquote. It would affect the experience of people visiting the reserve, especially when using the boardwalk next to the boundary. This was installed by the City Council and provides one of the few places it is possible for people with disabilities to access and enjoy unspoiled green space. The Adverse impact of this development would be greatest for people with disabilities as they cannot use the alternative path by the river. They would also be at particular risk on the access track to Alstone Croft, which is not a highway as claimed by the applicant and has no segregated footpath. Construction traffic using this narrow lane over a likely two year period raises serious concerns about the safety of the many pedestrians visiting the local nature reserve. In the event of fire, this lane would be an evacuation route for people and access route for fire engines. The committee report notes in points 243 and 244 that, quote, following discussion with Cambridgeshire Fire and Rescue Department, the presence of parked cars on the double yellows along Alston Road is currently presenting difficulties for the turning of fire vehicles in the application site, unquote. The applicant asserts that, quote, the City Council have a responsibility to ensure short lane is adequate for fire tender access, unquote. However, ownership of this lane is unknown, parking controls cannot be enforced, and the Council's legal liability is unclear. These issues of legal responsibilities and liability are complex and cannot be left to conditions. They need to be decided before planning permission is granted, as it may not be possible to resolve afterwards. Statement from Councillor Gilderdale ends. Thank you, James.
So I've been here just under two hours now, so we're going to have a comfort break for about five or ten minutes. We'll, um, you know, have a little walk if you need to, and people online as well, and then come back to start again, ideally at about ten to, if we can all manage that, ten to twelve. Thanks.
Sarah. So members of the public listening online, I've just been through a list of topics I'm going to go through uh, for this item, and I'll go through that again later for your benefit. Um, so Tom, uh, in terms of what speaker said, a few things stuck out for me. If you, is Tom back online? Yeah. Okay. Can't see him, that's all. But I thought we'd see him on the screen, not me, because I'm speaking to myself here. So I'm, I'm here. Keep, hi, Tom. Can hear me? So, um, Okay, I've got about three, four, five points I just want to put to you, Tom, to, to pick up on some things that the speakers said before we get going on the main debate so that they're not lost. So it was commented that there were 2,000 people had signed a petition and 200 um, had, people had made um, comments on planning portal. So can you uh, speak about the importance of the numbers and the importance of planning matters uh, in terms of what we consider for the item. So is it important that a large number of people say something or is it important that the, the something they're saying is important in terms of the planning considerations for the, for the matter? Second, you can answer this at the end, Tom, if that's all right. Secondly, um, it was said that people are more important than planning policies. So can you just comment on that in terms of how we work in planning committee considering the national planning policy framework, so national policies, local policies and plans and all of that, and, and how we consider people, as was said there. Um, there was a comment on Lux, but I'll pick that up under the particular item, I think, 2.9 Lux, so I won't, don't do that one now, Tom, we'll do that later. Um, the, the safety of children was uh, spoken about in terms of the local school, and I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that, Tom, or leave that till later. I'll leave that up to you. And uh, actually, air pollution as well, the 2.5 p.m. and dust. Perhaps I'll pick that up later. So those were the only things that stuck out for me. Any other councillors had anything particular? Yes, Councillor Thornborough. And we've not started on the topics yet, of course. Um, uh, Councillor Nessinger um, con commented on the distance to the boardwalk, and would I, I would would like to know what the distances are to the site. And the other, the other po points I'll leave to the list. Yeah, yeah that's fine, Councillor. And if you do something twice, that's fine, just as long as we do it. That's the main thing. Anything else? No, Tom, can you just comment on any of those things you want to say anything about them that I've asked you about and Councillor Thornborough has? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of the numbers of people, um, uh, uh, understand that yeah, there's been um, 2,000 people signed the petition um, and then and 200 objections on the application. Um, what it comes down to from my point of view is uh, the, the planning uh, merits of their objections. So numbers don't necessarily make a difference is what, what is said in the in the in the um, in their objections. Um, in terms of the people or policies, um, obviously, in a, in a, when we're considering planning applications, the policies are um, of paramount importance. And um, in terms of, yeah, I, I'm not sure what I, I can say in terms of that. Um, but in terms of people, uh, in terms of like the impacts upon uh, health and safety and noise and things like that, obviously, that the impacts upon people is important and that comes within those policy documents a lot of the time um, so there are policies uh, to, to support um, and protect neighbour amenities for example and that is obviously um, has to do with people. Um, in terms of safety and school children air pollution I'm going to leave that um, for number four construction impacts including pollution. Uh, and I can show sure, I can show the distances in terms of the sites in relation to the actual boundary of the local nature reserve. I'll just share my screen. If you want, Tom, we could do that under item two on the topic list. Maybe it might be easier. It's just yeah, I sure. wanted to pick those things up, make sure they were picked up and not lost as speakers have taken the trouble to say the things. We want to make sure we, you know, we respond to that. 
and of course speakers can further engage in debate, so we have to take it forward. So let's do that then, Tom, okay? So just for people listening online, because you, you, we had this topic list before the uh, thing was made live online again, I'll just go through the topic list today for everyone. So it's eight items. Uh, we're going to go through ecological tree landscape impacts to scale massing design impact on the conservation area and Paradise Nature Reserve. Three, highway safety and transport impacts. Four, construction impacts, including pollution. Five, flood risk and drainage impacts. Six, amenity impacts, including privacy on the school and users of Paradise Nature Reserve. Seven, sustainability provisions. Eight, other matters. Councillors okay with that? Okay, let's get going then. So e ecological tree and landscape impacts. Councillor Thornborough. Um, the, there were lots of... Uh, uh, the, people, the objectors were talking about new evidence and I know that the officers will have uh, made their considerations based on what was provided with the application, I believe, or what came forward. So I wondered what the case officer says about the new evidence that has been referred to, particularly on bats and wildlife and the light levels and flood risks and whether the case, the statutory consultees have had time to look at that new evidence. I, I would also like to know if there has been reference to uh, natural England protected species on the red list and um, I would like to know if if the case officer can c confirm that they are on the red list at, but they are on the site and also councillor collis referred to this area as a wet woodland which is very unusual um, in cambridge and if if does that does this wet woodland area give this local nature reserve some special some further special uh significance and would could the wet woodland be i don't know i was going to bring up about possible flood issues affecting the wet woodland aspect of the nature reserve thanks thanks councillor councillor poro i echo councillor thornborough's um comments about the surveys um i'd be interested to hear from the case officer for one of our experts um about the loss of obviously the poplars and the ash, which I think are described as low quality trees, versus the gain of having that wetland boundary. So I think that's quite an important issue because my original concerns were about losing the trees. It's unusual on tree application to have our officers supporting tree loss. But equally, I gather the wetland might provide more of a buffer. So I'd be grateful if we could just get some more sort of explanation about how that decision was arrived at. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dwarfrit Wood. Okay, um, so following on from both Councillor uh, Thornborough and Councillor Poria, um, my interest is, again, this green corridors and fragmentation. Now, would it be possible to have an ecological survey uh, that is fuller than we appear to have? We seem to have competing views on this, um, but one that covers both uh, both sides of the boundary, basically Queen's College and land plus um, plus the, the woodland, um, the nature reserve. And, and looking at tracking um, where, where, the, where the bats, where, where other wildlife go. So it's really, you know, have we got something that's sufficient to make a judgment about the ecological impact at the moment? Is this a case for deferring the application until we get that? Um, on context, you know, that is, that is an issue, you know, when you've got a development. So we have to look at it, you know, what's going on over the boundary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pagecroft. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd quite like to know if there is any new information that's come forward, any more new proof that I think was 
mentioned in, in the um, report we had, but also from the speakers, I think I'd quite like to know what that information is, and just how important it is. If we have got this, this I can't pronounce it, this very important bat, I don't know the name, <coughs> I can't pronounce it. Um, I'd, I'd like to know if that information um, has anything to do with this bat, if it's important that we, we we move away from them a bit more because we need to keep this back, we need to keep it happy. We need to know a bit more information about keeping it, about preserving it, and about um, um, uh, any more information that we should have before we can make a decision. And I think I agree with Councillor Gorthrop Wood that we should defer until we have some more information. Thank you, Councillor. Well, I prefer not to be talking about deferring quite yet if we can help it, but let's see how we get on with that. Councillor Bajan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank the members of the public that have come here today to show their interest in what is clearly a very hot topic in, in Cambridge. And, I, and I, I regret, unfortunately, that we don't very often get this sort of interest in planning applications. I'm sure that the minute this subject is ended, a lot of people will vacate the chamber. Now, I don't mean that as an insult. I'm really pleased that you're here because we're here to represent both government's legislation and the people that we represent. And so I think it's really interesting and I'm pleased that we've got about 70 people in the chamber. It makes it much more real and it perhaps sharpens our act a little bit as well. My point would be I'd like to hear from our council's ecology officer on his views I know we have written reports, but I'd like to see him on the screen and hear what he has to say, please. Thank you, Councillor. So um, just to say the trade officer is unfortunately unwell, but other officers will cover for that. And just on that, I did say earlier that the case officer is the boss here, and that is how it works. So the case officer has made a recommendation, and that's informed by the consultees who will feed into this discussion today. So it's useful to get their expert input but the case officer will defer to them where he finds it necessary. So, um, Tom, aside from that, I'll just add a couple of things. If you could just um, either tell us or uh, ask one of your people to tell us about uh, bats and lights and light uh, problems that bats get on, will get on the site and what the proposed light levels will be. Some, so I said earlier, didn't I, that the, one of the speakers spoke about there being 2.9 lux on, on the site, um, the proposed lux level, I think I understood, because we've had briefings and we've been on site meetings and so on as well, ourselves as councillors, that the lux level was meant to be a lot lower than that. But so if we could get some clarity on that, that'd be good. Um, I think that's all from me. So back to you then, Tom, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Guy, would you like to answer, so the Nature Conservation Officer, would you like to answer those questions. Certainly, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I'll take them in order. So, so Councillor Thornborough's um, uh, request to, for information on on further evidence. So, um, um, the the key issue has been raised by by, by many this morning is around um, bats commuting through, through and along the edge of the site um, and using that wider river, river cam corridor uh, and the various local nature reserves from sort of Byron's Pool right up through Sheep's Green Coat Fen. Um, so all of our bat species are insectivorous and nocturnal and um, depending on the species, they have different hunting techniques. Um, the um, the barbastel bat that has been mentioned is a relatively long distance sort of commuter um, from its um, roost sites and fast flying and uses different levels of both tree canopy and also over open water marshland for, for foraging for insects. Um, so uh, uh, and it's, it's one of the bats known as being particularly light sensitive. So being nocturnal, bats uh, use echolocation to find their, their insect prey and navigate around their environment. And um, in, in doing so, um, they tend to avoid, uh, in general, artificial lights. Um, but that's not the case for all species. So, so some of the commoner species, such as common pipistrelle, which are large numbers using 
uh, the site and throughout our city, um, they actually will hunt around lights. Uh, but that's not necessarily to their benefit um, and certainly not to other species benefit because insects can be drawn to lights and away from darker foraging habitat, which is potentially um, a, a safer place from predators because things like um, uh, hobbies, uh, a falcon and sparrowhawk will take bats, particularly um, in dusk and dawn. So it really is around about keeping uh, light levels uh, low within these sort of key corridors and spaces. So that's been right from the pre-app stage um, where we've been sort of having discussions with the applicant and asking for information on potential light levels and also how the site is currently being used by bats. Um, Barb Barbastel has been identified and it is light sensitive. Um, uh, and I think from a, when we talk about lux levels, we need to be looking at a, a clear understanding of, of what they are. So um, a sort of typical moonlit cloudy sky would be 0.1 lux. A clear full moon would be between the range between 0.25 and to below 1 lux and twilight is around 1 lux. So when we're talking about potential potential um, disturbance, though those sort of natural light levels are not seen as particularly disturbing to bats. And, and I would quote from the um, uh, Bat Conservation Trust and Institute for Lighting Professionals um, guidance. Um, this is Stone 2012, where complete darkness on a feature or buffer is required. It may be appropriate to consider this to be where illuminance is below 0.2 lux on the horizontal plane and below 0.4 on the vertical plane. And these figures are still lower than what might be expected on a moonlit night and are in line with research findings for the illuminance found at hedgerows used by lesser horseshoe bats, a species well known for its light adverse behaviour. So a lesser horseshoe bat, we don't get them within, within our region, but they are classed in the same sort of category as a light averse species. So um, from, from very early discussions with, with the applicant and then working with their ecologists and looking at the, um, the, the sort of uh, the, the activity along that, that um, boundary of the site, these were the sort of lux levels that we were saying would need to be achievable. Um, there's been some questions around um, the amount of uh, information and whether it meets um, standards as far as um, the Bat Conservation Trust guidelines for survey standards. And um, they they do fall short with the MKA Ecology Report, doesn't meet the exact number of static nights of static detection and transect surveys. Um, although that said, there has been over 99 nights of static surveys throughout May, um, uh, right through to um, October. Um, but we are, uh, from a guideline point of view, we are missing sort of early spring, that sort of April period at the moment. However, from the evidence um, shown, the, the activity has varied relatively li little other than the potential, the sort of expected slightly lower in, in, in spring, higher in summer, then dropping off in the autumn. And that's across the range of, of bat species, both light sensitive and less light sensitive. So um, in, in, in my view, in looking at that data uh, and, and the, and the, the proposed condition of, um, of this 0.2 lux horizontal, 0.4 lux vertical, then um, there, there should not be a negative impact of, of bats using that corridor. Um, so that's around sort of light levels. Um, as far as the, the Barbastel status, uh, it, it is a protected species and it is on the red list. Um, the the data that we have would indicate that we're probably dealing with an individual or individuals actually commuting along this corridor. They tend to appear um, the, 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 the passes, the, the bat passes which pass the, bat, the, the detectors, um, they can't actually count individual bats or whether there's more than one bat at any one time. That's that's quite tricky with the software. But so a, a pass is, is considered um, a, a single bat but it looks to be uh, an individual or two or three individuals, but more likely a single individual commuting along the river corridor, uh, occasionally using that boundary of the, of the local nature reserve and our stone croft, 
and then moving through and then coming back again, um, probably leaving the city um, uh, prior to, to dusk, prior to dawn. So and the timings of that indicate that it's coming quite late um, of the evening and, and then leaving quite quite early, which would suggest that the actual roof site is some distance from our Stonecroft. So this is forming part of quite a large sort of territory. So when I was looking at reviewing this in sort of the proportionality side of things, it's um, it's it's not a roost site. It is part of a wider territory. Um, Councillor Forbrough mentioned wet woodlands. Um, it, yes, indeed, that is a priority habitat. Um, woodland in general is in very short supply within um, uh, Cambridgeshire. Um, and as a wet woodland, it is subject to riparian flooding. So the river going up and down, albeit it is quite controlled, that section of the river from um, artificial structures further down. But um, the, the site does get inundated um, and that can be to the benefit of many of the species that, that, that are there and have evolved to be there. And um, we, we've at the City Council, we've managed the site, have created sort of wetland habitats to, to hold back some of that water as well. Um, it, it seems to me in looking at the, the drainage um, reports that um, increase in uh, the sort of flooding events is not going to be a, a, an immediate immediately from the proposed application. Um, Councillor Poor mentioned the loss of the proposed loss of four poplar trees um, along the boundary. So this was debated with the tree officer who cannot be present um, and, and myself and the applicant um, in the early stages of this sort of outline landscaping scheme. Um, the site currently is largely a um uh, amenity grassland next to the, the reserve and there's quite an abrupt boundary between the two there is a small ditch feature and some um uh, relatively young elm trees that have been planted uh, a very large um, unpollarded poplar tree um which we have seen sought to retain uh, and then the four pollarded poplar trees due to um, previous failures in their limb structure. So um, it was deemed that these trees, although not um, imminently sort of going to be lost over time, they will sort of continue to decline. And it was thought felt it would be preferable to have those removed to create the, the proposed wetland habitats, part of the drainage scheme, but those habitats would actually complement the reserve. Um, and allow the new proposed planting, particularly the lower level planting, to establish. Um, any loss of tree, uh, particularly on the flight path, is obviously going to have an impact on how bats are using that, that corridor. Um, but with the, the, the single large tree retained, um, the, the tree line already is, uh, present along the reserve, I think it's a balance. And again, within wood within woodlands, trees are sort of constantly being lost and and, uh, and new regeneration coming. So it's a it's a that's a discussion. It was potentially um, talk, talked about that we could actually phase um, that that removal, repollarding those trees, get new planting established, and then allow that. To um, uh, rather than an abrupt removal, um, but uh, the tree officer uh, did have concerns about that with potential um, damage to the roots of those trees during the construction of the um, proposed wetland feature, and then that causing um, you know, further risk of failure to those trees. Um, Councillor Gulfort would raise the. Um, the sort of the wider issue of the green corridor and the tracking. So I mentioned that um, you know bat, bats will be using a much wider landscape, as you, as you rightly point out, than just um, that part of the reserve and, and the application site. Um, Barbastel would be a particularly good example of that. Now, um, I think if we were dealing with a, a roost site, then certainly we would want to, to know exactly where those bats were moving and moving to. And it, it's it's something that the, the committee could ask. We have a, a better understanding of how Barbastales are using that space. Um, wider tracking is tricky. It can be done with, to a certain extent, with static detectors mounted along a, a, a wider area. Um, but the best way of doing it would be to actually um, radio track the bats. But that obviously that requires licensing from Natural England, action capture of the bats to do that. And so then there's again, there's that proportionality of impact 
on on the actual individuals and the species um, to, to sort of answer the question that you're trying to find out. So I think that's um, yeah, that that's something that, that could be debated um, and it, it it may not, I say, get that sort of um, approval by Natural England to license that that, that kind of impact um, on a, you know, a relatively small impact on the on the wider sort of um, area that the, the bat would be using. Um, so on the, the lighting in general um, and sort of new evidence, um, there have been, there are certainly, I think, been confused, in, including um, myself, as to the lux levels, and, and f further queries have been made to the both the um, MKA Ecology and the um, Hawley Lighting Engineers, and um, particularly with reference to locations 18 and 19. Um, I don't know, Tom, if you'll be able to to get that that up for us. So, so this is the area the area um, where the, currently the built form of the nursery is closest to the boundary of the local nature reserve, um, and also sort of proposed development would come closest to the boundary, and therefore any um, light spill, both external lighting and internal lighting on reserve, would be the greatest. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, um, pre-construction uh, illuminance measurements at location 18. So, these are existing lighting. Now, um, by existing lighting, that um, again, there's been, been some confusion. There's operational lighting um, within the actual uh, existing nursery building, um, and this can see sort of light, light spill from windows and some bollard lighting in, 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 the, in the immediate sort of open space. Um, and many of the, when the static detectors have been deployed or bat, bat walks have been undertaken by the ecologists, these, these lights have been on um, for some of those occasions and it's recorded within the data sets when those have been on. Um, there is also associated with the um, nursery some flood lighting which is um, and that's for uh, that's rarely uh, rarely used uh, and hasn't been on during the um uh, the, the sort of sur surveys and stuff and wasn't used to, to to actually create this baseline survey so the baseline is based on when just the operational lighting around the nursery was on and um, so essentially they're giving a a, a pre-construction horizontal peak illuminance at, at location 18 of 0.21 lux and at location 9 of the um, of 2.93 lux so when those operational light, lighting is on we currently have 2.93 lux um, on that boundary and sort of light spill into the local nature reserve um, now Bat species, including light sensitive uh, bat species, including Barbastel, were seen to be using that edge by the, by the ecologists during the um, actual um, uh, surveys, the transit, the walk transit surveys, where they have handheld detectors. Um, so, yeah, arguably they weren't be, being impacted at that stage. But again, the risk of predation and things increases, so it shouldn't be used as, as an argument for. But to the ability to reduce that as part of the development that sort of is currently uncontrolled lighting um, is certainly uh, attractive. Um, and location, so post development, um, location 18, um, they are saying they, they could have a vertical peak illuminance measurement. Oops, excuse me. Um, so post construction, a vertical peak illuminance of 0.35. So that's within the, the, you know, the 0.4 and is with, within sort of natural moonlight uh, and a post construction horizontal peak of 0.03 lux, so well below. So um, the, the lighting engineers are demonstrating that they could, you know, it could be well within sort of the light sensitive bat species, uh, what, what's deemed as um, you know, available for light sensitive bat species. Um, and hence, sort of my, my comments that you know, I wouldn't object on that on that if uh, a suitable condition could could be imposed to ensure that that they, that they are reached. Um, I think I picked up on most there, but I, I, Tom, is there anything I've missed? 
think there was just a, about the new evidence being provided by a third party and whether we've taken that into account. So the, I think this is the Bioscan data set. Bioscan, yeah, the Bioscan data sets. So, um, so yeah, I, I think you know the Bi Bi Bioscan report. They they have challenged the um, the, the number of, um, of, of transits, the, the, the number of times that the um, static detectors have, have been placed against against the guidance. And um, yes, I, I can I can I, I can see that. But I say as as I pointed out within the um, I think the the proposed reduction uh, of light levels on that boundary from current lighting and the fact that it's it's well within the um, the light sensitive the, the light sensitive bat species sort of uh, deemed threshold of light then um, additional survey information or additional is unlikely to to to, to change that um, proposed condition uh, considerably. Hey Tom. Right, so Thank you. Yeah. thanks for that. That's excellent, Tom Guy. Good information. Um, normally I try and do it in one go with councillors per topic, but obviously there's a lot of detail there. They might want to come back on any of that. And I'll, I'll just sum up what I've made notes of, and you correct me, Tom or Guy, if I've got anything wrong. So as I understand it, the, the Barbara Shell is the most sensitive bat. That's the one that we need to concern ourselves with in terms of concerning ourselves with all of them. And you said that you suspect there may be one of those, but there could be a small number. And you've also said that the natural lux levels vary between 0.1 and 1 lux, the highest level being twilight. Uh, I did mention earlier that there was a mention by one speaker that 2.9 lux would be the level that would exist on the site post-application. You seem to not be agreeing with that and that the condition that would be applied to this application would be for LUX levels to be kept between 0.2 and 0.4 LUX. You've said that the applicant uh, um, proposes to have a LUX level of a maximum of 0.35 LUX, so that's within that band, and that's what's proposed, what exists at the moment, that that's the vertical component of the LUX level at 0.19, so 0.35. The, existing lux level at that point at the moment is 7.29 so 7.28 lux which is obviously significantly higher um, and the final thing to say is that you've said that we're missing the spring data but that you also said the spring data usually has less um, data in it because there are less less sightings so we've got the important data i took from that but please correct me if i'm wrong um, and also you said that we could have data about the Barbastels using the space. Um, I got the impression from what you said that on balance, we had the information we needed to make a decision. So uh, any other questions to go back to Tom and Guy with? Thanks to Thornbra. I'd like to know what the distances of the buildings to the boundary are. And are there any other protected species in paradise, not just the bats. Are there any other protective species, please? Uh, Councillor, we can do that now if you like, but we could cover that in topic two, scale massing design impact on the conservation area in Paradise Nature Reserve. It's up to you. If you want to stick with it now, that's fine. Let's leave it now then and we'll, we'll cover it now. Anything else, councillors? No, okay, so back to you, Tom, or if you want Guy to answer anything. I do want to pick that, please. Is that? Certainly, so on the, the protected species front, um, absolutely, yep. So um, as um, as outlined by some of our pre previous speakers, um, there are a number of protected species, including a range of breeding birds that, that use that use for site that that wet woodland for breeding, um, otters, water voles, um, some um, notable and, and red listed invertebrates such as the musk beetle also used for site. So um, yeah, it's um, as would be expected by a sort of a well connected wet woodland within the river valley. It supports supports a range of species. Um, the the, the lighting, um, because the, the development isn't building right into the reserve, the lighting has always been sort of the, the key sort of um, uh, 
ecological um, question uh, around around this site, um, but that also mentioned, you know, obviously the, the sort of potential for contamination and uh, dust during development. So that's that's really then the key um, uh, thing to, to get right with the the conditions would be um, yeah to to prevent impacts to those other protected species using that boundary. I'll just pick up the point about uh, distances. So these are the distances from block four, the seven, seven uh, block um, to the local nature reserve. So its nearest point is approximately six metres from the corner of this building here. Um, and then extends up to 14 metres to 14 and a half metres away to the boundary edge. And just for completeness, Tom, just do the, the, the other uh, measurements to the other blocks. Yeah, so to the boundary edge from the middle block, block three, 23 metres, and then the northern block, block two, 20, nearly 21 metres to the boundary from that two and a half story element. OK, thanks, Tom. So any more questions on that topic, councillors? No. OK, moving on then. So next topic is scale massing design and impact on the conservation area and Paradise Nature Reserve, councillors. Councillor Thornborough. Um, currently, the, um, the area near the boundary is, has, is not really used. My, my understanding is it's not really used by uh, the, anybody on the site because there's trees and it's um, area of foliage and it's going to be cleared into wetland. But is there, will the, will the, uh, the number, the students who live there be able to access the 20 metres or 23 metres between the edge of the buildings and the edge of the site? Because, um, so basically, is it an amenity area that the students could come out and use um, when the weather's good or whenever? I just, I'd like to know about increased activity in that area if it is an amenity space. Um, I, I'm pleased to see that the buildings are designed to such a high standard for energy efficiency and other, other features. Um, so, yeah. That's my question, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Porer. Thank you very much. Yes, my concern, I have a couple here. So setting aside the wildlife issues, if we're looking just literally at the building and the massing, um, I found, initially I was most, most concerned with the nursery block, but actually in the views that the office has shown, it was the one between block three and two. I don't know if Tom might be willing to bring that up at some point to show us, because that for me, did show quite a substantial massing towards the boundary. My other concern relates to the amenity of the occupants. So there's going to be, well, 45 new students there. Obviously, our policy doesn't require garden space for students. But I am a little concerned that whilst I support the idea of the wetlands, because I think that does help create a buffer and stop people going up to a boundary, my concern is the people living in those houses, where are they going to sit out? Because actually, we're... we're in effect, chopping off what was the lawn, building quite a few blocks on it. And then if you look at the sustainable urban drainage, my understanding is there's actually swales running down the middle between each block. So actually setting aside all the other considerations about the local nature reserve, just looking at this as a development on, on that site, I have concerns anyway about the lack of amenity space. So I do appreciate our local plan doesn't force us to have amenity space for students. But nonetheless, these are postgrad students living there for a full year. This is not your kind of eight weeks in and out. And I do recognise and thank the, the officers for the condition to restrict conference use. That's much appreciated as we've raised that before. So I think I'm just really interested in the loss of the lawn, obviously, because we're building on it. But more importantly, the wetland, which I support, is also cutting off immunity space and how the suds drainage will also do that because I think in the report it describes a pleasant atmosphere between the blocks but as far as I can see from the plans some of that is going to be drainage and, and sustainable urban drainage so kind of lumps and bumps so I'd be grateful for some comments on that. 
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bajan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to refresh my memory if the officer could put a plan up including the Paradise Local Nature Reserve to point out the extent of this nature reserve so that I can refresh my brain as to what we were talking about, if that was possible. And I, I can't help thinking that Councillor Poor is raising a very interesting point about where will the students go in the summer's evening? Will they be going right up to the nature reserve, holding barbecues, things like that? I think that's something that we would need some indication or some, some restriction on, if we could. I also would like to hear, I know what the rules are regarding the nursery. I'd like to hear that formalised by the officer, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? Uh, so I'll ask uh, um, whether Tom wants to refer to any other consultees in terms of responding to this topic, the scale and massing. I think we've got the urban design or conservation officers here as well. So it appears to me that the scale and massing for the applicant site is appropriate for the site. Um, it, it's been talked about by speakers as being three stories high. Normally in committee, when we have an application like this with windows in the roof, basically, we call it two and a half stories, but effectively to all sort of common sense people, it's like three stories high because it is 10.5 uh, metres high, I think, at the highest point. The impact on the conservation area, it would, would be, a, it'd be interesting to hear what the officers have to say about that. Um, and in terms of the nature reserve, that's obviously something we're discussing today, so I won't comment on that further. But, I mean, on, on balance, I'd say that what I see in front of me is a, is a robust, acceptable design. Um, I'd say it's not outstanding architecture, but it, it's satisfactory. And um, I'd say for all that, that's sort of what we look for at the very least. And also, of course, as has already been commented, the fact that the applicant has uh, plans to invest in uh, sustainable construction, so it's going to be a... Passive house construction would be excellent, of course. Any more questions? No. Okay, back to you then, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, so, picking up the point about uh, the amenity space question, um, the area next to the boundary. Let me just share my screen. So this is the the area here next to the boundary. This wouldn't be used as uh, amenity space for students. This would become a, a wetland area. Um, it's uh, as general meadows, it's described as a general meadow. So the students wouldn't have um, the option to, to, to use that space. It'd be uh, for for habitats, um, for, bio, for for to increase the biodiversity uh, land within the application site. Um, in terms of the immunity space for students, it does meet the policy of policy sixty eight, uh, which talks about open space uh, requirements and provision for um, for students. Um, Helen who is also on the call, a landscape officer, might want to add something in terms of the landscaping scheme and, and, and amenity provision. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, the, the new postgraduate houses all have um, kind of proper allocated terraced gardens on, on the south side of each of the um, postgraduate buildings. So the, with with like tables and chairs and I think they have pergolas and planting. So they so those are quite contained gardens for them. And then in the summer they could access the the sort of more western side of the swales. So those will probably be dry during the summer. So the 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 kind of yeah the swale grassland between each of the new buildings will be accessible during the summer.
Thank you, Helen. Yeah, thanks. Tom, you're on mute, mate. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, yeah, in terms of the policy, policy requirements, it is considered uh, that it meets that. And it's also important to note that the um, Lammas land is, is located nearby in five minutes walk away. For, so for students to access uh, play and recreation areas. Um, the massing question, I'll, um, I think Councillor Pora raised a question about views. Uh, was it this view, Councillor Pora? Next one along, I think. This one here. Um, yeah, that's block three and two, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Thank right. you. Uh, so yeah, the, the one on the right hand side is after one year and then uh, that's a five year. Um, after five years of planting. Uh, uh, yeah, Travine is also on the call. Travine, do you want to add anything to in terms of massing and, 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 and scale? Or oh, you're on Travine, mute? Travine, you're, you're on mute. No, I can't hear you. Chance, guys, we've got to press the button somewhere. Hello? Yeah. That's it. Great. Yeah. Okay. Start again for me, right. please. Start again from the beginning. Thank you. I just wanted to state two points, really. One was regarding the views and the views, how they are taken and how we should conceive them or see them, is that they are dynamic views um, along the boardwalk, and these are not fixed points from where we would view the buildings, and these are passing by views as you go across it. And then the second point I would say is with regard to the before and after position. So the existing situation is a, a lawn that doesn't have any buildings. And then you are comparing that to um, a, what if effect is a three story building and that would have a significant change in 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 views in, in terms of how it appears. So that's just by nature there will be a huge difference between those two things but you know the applicant has considered in our view quite sensitively how you you know create views through uh, across the site and not just block it off uh, from view and that's why those terrace blocks are arranged the way they are arranged as well as you know to maximize subtly um southern aspects um, due to the sustainability features Stop. Thank you, Trevine. Um, just going to share my screen once again. I think uh, Councillor Bajan had a question about um, the nursery condition. Um, so, in terms of the nursery uh, condition, there would be requirement in terms of um, the replacement of uh, nursery off-site um, prior to any demolition of the existing nursery. The applicants have investigated um, other options and there is a, a current live application being considered by, by um, another case officer along Barton Road um, for uh, a nursery there. Um, so that has been uh, taken into consideration and there is a robust condition to require the applicant to submit those details um, and to be it to be operational um, prior to any demolition of the nursery building. I think that was all the questions, but come back to me if I've missed anything. Yeah, I think we've got a little bit to come back on, Tom, there. So um, okay. I'll go first. So just on those views you showed, it struck me earlier that that one you showed, which wasn't the one that the councillor was referring to, the one that shows a lot of greenery along the bottom, 
um, seemed very green and not a lot of buildings in it. It wasn't a very good view of buildings, but it was a very good view of the greenery, which I wasn't quite convinced by. So I just wondered what the viewpoint was of that view. I presume it would be at eye level, about 1.5 metres above ground level or something like that. But perhaps you could confirm. And Councillor Poor has a further question. And so you go first, Councillor Poor. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for those visuals, um, Tom. So can I just confirm, when we're looking at the new screening, so replacing the poplar trees, etc., we are looking at having gaps so you can see through the middle of each building. Because obviously, for me, I'm, I'm finding the massing of the buildings quite significant. And I'd be interested also if the urban designer might comment as to why the buildings aren't sort of more stepped down towards the boundary, which is something we might often quite expect, because obviously that will mitigate something of the massing at the ends. I do appreciate the site does slope. I've been on the site visit in the snow in minus nine, but I got the gist of it. So, because I'm a little bit concerned about the, the volume at, at the end of the blocks, and I wonder why it, the applicant or officers didn't suggest more of a stepped um, move there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thornborough. So, um, the case officer said that the uh, wetland area wouldn't be accessed by the students who live there. But how can that be? How can that physically be? How can they physically be stopped doing that? And one of the block, the southernmost block, um, does come much closer to the boundary, and that does the the basically the 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 natural buffer that was there before is being replaced by a building. That, that concerns me. The, I'm pleased that the other buildings are more than 20 metres away. But what I, but if that is reserved for um, as, a, as a buffer, then it, I do have concerns about the amenity space for the students in the summer or any good weather. It could be in winter too. And um, also, it, the, it seemed for me the local paradise is an, a tremendous asset and actually for this site being next to a local this particular local nature reserve I think is an asset to the site and it the way the as Councillor Porra says the way the buildings are built up to quite and don't step down or don't reflect the change in the nature of the spaces as you approach the the paradise does seem to me that they they ignore they haven't really taken on board fully the real benefits that this site is next to paradise um, so the the form of the architecture the standards are good it's just that the the relation I do have concerns about the relation of the design and massing to this great asset next door thank you councillor councillor Bajant I missed it, but I, I, I'd like to see the plan of the site with Paradise on it and see the officer line out for us what it, where the Paradise, the, the extent of the Paradise site. Thank you, Councillor. So I'll just add, so contrary to what was said by Councillor Thornborough there, I, I sort of feel the scale of massing works quite well on the site in the sense that I didn't say earlier, but it seemed obvious to me that, you know, the, end, the ends of these sort of terraces face towards Paradise Nature Reserve, which is the appropriate thing to do, to have less light impinging on that space and also to then enclose the areas that might be inhabited. I mean, as a student myself, I would probably want to go in the garden if that was with had brick burgers and all that sort of thing. But if they want to go outside in the outside space, they would go between the blocks and not at the end of the blocks. That would be the sort of the natural thing to do, it seems to me. But I'll let the officer respond to Councillor Thornborough also. Thank you. Over to you, Tom. Thank you. So in terms of the um, verified views, yeah, I believe that these were taken from eye level. Um, so that's a, an average eye level um, height that those, those pictures were taken. Um, in terms of the, uh, let me just share my screen for Councillor Bajan's point. So in terms of the relationship 
um, of the application site and Paradise Nature Reserve. This, this shows the the outline of Paradise Nature Reserve uh, to the to the east. Um, so it goes goes along the River Cam um, and then and stops at um, the car park uh, to the north, uh, serving Lammas land. Um, the um, the blocks, uh, in terms of the massing and scale, have been considered with the urban design conservation officer and and landscape officers. And the gable ends of these these blocks, which face is um, east and, and west, um, these uh, these reduce the sense of massing upon the the um, upon the nature reserve itself. Um, and in terms of the amenity space. Um, controls the um the application site is warden controlled um so there is an element of management there um and the college will be managing these um these amenity spaces as well as the habitats um uh, to make to ensure that they are they are maintained um for that specific purpose. So the the wetland habitats will be maintained um, to ensure that uh, the biodiversity um, net gain is achieved on the site. Thanks, Tom. Did you want the urban design uh, officer to say anything about the scale of massing as that's been raised? Yeah, Trevine, would you like to comment? Sorry, I'll just touch on the stepping down um, approach um, and that point that was made with regard to the schemes. I think if you show a plan in the first instance, I think that'd be helpful, Tom. Um, a site plan might be useful. Um, yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so the approach that you know, has been taken is to be reflective of the terraces um, from the Newnham area and to see how that kind of works in, on, on this side. And the fact that this is also a edge of settlement site, so it has a rural characteristic, you know, was, uh, you know, the point was that, you know, the building should sit within the landscape um, and the neatness of block into one composition because these are not huge blocks. Uh, the massing of buildings, you know, if they come down or step down, has an awkward relationship in the form um, that they are uh, positioned at. And so that causes a problem in terms of articulation of that, of that massing when it comes to the edge. The second point uh, would be around, you know, the uh, neatness of the form towards the edge, and there has been uh, mitigation in terms of how the the buildings and the roof turns the corner um, towards the ends of the block, so as you know, it doesn't produce a full gabled frontage, but it ac actually has a, a roof um, eaves uh, kind of um, articulation. When it comes to the views, you know, I don't know if there is a view that you can show from uh, from the side. Um, yeah, this 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 is a view from the park, but there's a view that is, I think, within the site that shows the edge, and I think that's where you can appreciate that there is sufficient kind of space between the end of the boundary and and the um, building edge to have a sufficient uh, breathing space for the buildings. I think it's in, in the DAS statement. If you can't get it, it's fine. You then, Tom? It's in the DAS, I think. It's in, uh, is it not in the, the verified views? No, it's in the dust. Okay. 
Yeah, this is one one view where you can actually see the sides of the buildings and its relationship from the internal area. And it seems to have a comfortable relationship between the growth of planting that is quite substantial along the woodland edge and the form of building seems comfortable um, and its distance feels comfortable to where it sits. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Trevi. Was there anything else on? Any other questions on that? Uh, I think that's pretty much it, Tom. We might have a one follow up, and I'll just say on what I said, and Councillor Thornbrook can speak for herself. But I guess there's two ways of approaching that in terms of form, massing, scale, etc. Is that the um, the ends of the blocks form a sort of full stop? which is quite satisfactory in terms of the look of the thing. Um, it makes sense architecturally. Uh, on the other hand, you could argue it should be a completely different approach. You know, you, anything could happen on that side. It's, it's a very urban design in a very natural landscape, which could contrast, but could, you could also argue it rather conflicts. Councillor Poor. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Just, I suppose, to sum up for my concerns at the moment is particularly the lack of amenity in the sense that it is a very small terrace garden and the fact that, as I think I'm correct in saying, this, the sustainable urban drainage isn't really fully accessible for most of the year. My concern is what will happen is we're all humans, you'll come out your house or your lodgings and you'll go towards the school boundary or you'll go to the wetland, hopefully not paddling in it, but, you know, I don't know. Depends what they fancy doing and it depends what the state of the wetland is as to obviously how flooded it is or not. So I am concerned at the moment about the amenity. I suppose for me, picking up on what you said, Chair, there are ways of designing. I, I actually understand what Tremaine is saying. I do like the idea that we're mimicking the kind of house thing rather than having big blocks of student housing. I do actually find that a much better example. But if you look at, for example, in my ward, you've got New Square College Housing where you have the big bits in the middle and the side steps down. And to me, at the moment, I'm sitting a little bit that this is too blocky at the ends and I whilst I take the officer's point about houses being better than blocks to me this is still quite blocky and the, the middle could be more substantial but for me the ends potentially should be more stepped down thank you chair thank you councillor in that case I think that's more a statement than a question so we'll move on yes so okay so councillors before we go to topic three we've done two quite important ones so quite rightly we've debated them for quite a while um we normally take a break between 12 and 2, and um, I'd like to carry on and decide this item before lunch, ideally. But if you want to have a lunch break, we can do that and come back to it. No one's saying yes, so we'll carry on for the minute, but we'll hold that on the back burner if you want to do that, all right? So, uh, uh, topic three, then, highway safety and transport impacts. And we, I believe we have the highways officer, if he's still here with us today, which is very useful. So, Councillor Thornbury, you had your hand up. Um, the highway... I, I was considering the, how the, the increased number of students will uh, get to Queen's College. And if I was them, I'd cycle through Paradise, which is off-road on the boardwalk, and then through the various off-road routes, which is a, a really, really pleasant route, um, up through Fen Causeway to the museum. I mean, to the college. Now, there are, there are alternatives, but I, one of the things that hasn't been mentioned by the highways is whether this, the risk of increasing uh, the number of movements, people walking and cycling through paradise. So my, my understanding is that the boardwalk has been very success, has been successful in keeping people to those routes because of the very special nature of Paradise. Um, it's very important that people are on those routes and the boardwalk does that. But already there is a problem with uh, people using that as a cycle route. Um, and it's, it's caused, there are, I, I believe there have been incidences where often the gates are left open, dogs and uh, get in and to the detriment of Paradise. So what is the impact of this increased number of students on the site on that uh, uh, route through um, Paradise? And um, 
Also, Councillor Gilderdale uh, mentioned the track and if that, if that has no separation for cycles and if there's going to be increased use once it's built, um, how are we going to separate cycle from car, increased cycle routes from um, the uh, car use? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Gothrop Wood. Um, I'm still a bit confused, so I'd like some clarification on who owns the road, the entrance to the entrance. Um, yeah, and then how, how, how can access be managed? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And following on from Councillor Thornborough, I presume the reduced number of car parking spaces from something like 18 to 9 from memory is to do with needing less car parking spaces because the nursery won't be there, is that correct? Any more questions? No? Okay, Tom? Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the um, point about um, reduced number of um, car movements, that is to do with the the loss of the nursery, um, so the car uh, pickups and drop-offs won't be necessary any longer. Um, the ownership um, of the entrance, uh, the access route to the application site, so this is unadopted um, route, so it's privately owned. Um, the, the part leading um, from the application site to Alstone Road um, is uh, owned by the City Council um, and the, the last part of Short Lane which leads to Grantchester Meadows um, is, uh, is, is, is unregistered land. Um, uh, John Finney is with me, um, if, don't he, if he wants to add any, anything to that. Just before you get going, John, just hold on. So, members of the public, please don't interject. It's a debate by councillors with officers. We can't have members of the public sort of taking part in that. Thank you very much. John, over to you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just just to, to confirm what Thomas said, um, the extent he adopted public highway in Alstone Road ends effectively at the end, the southernmost buildings. Beyond that point, it is a private road. Whether or not it's highway is a separate matter entirely, as that would come into force if it had been open and available for the public for 20 years without interruption. Although I'm not aware of any claims this is a highway. Um, so it is outside the control of Cambridgeshire County Council as highway authority. As Tom has indicated, parts of it are owned by Cambridge City Council as a private landowner, and I assume therefore they have full control over who uses it and how. If I do you want me to respond? Briefly to Councillor Thornborough about the use of our paradise as well, Tom, while I'm here. Yes, thank you. Okay, I mean, essentially, the route through the paradise is not highway, it's a private route. Again, I'm making the assumption it's in the ownership of Cambridge City Council. Um, Jay, my colleague, Jace Tuttle, who did the transport assessment for the site, is also here. I don't know whether or not that was actually as highlighted as a potential route. You are quite right, though, Councillor. It is a very attractive route, um, particularly when you get to the Lammers Land car park. From that point onwards, you're actually on highway. Um, so I could see it would be used, but I don't know if it was ever taken into consideration. So if I may briefly hand over to Jez to maybe be able to respond to that. And you're still on mute, by the way, sir. Um, good afternoon, good afternoon, Chair and Councillors. Um, the the transport cell, the transport statement that was written as part of the application doesn't specifically identify the Paradise route as a cycle route. It um, looks at cyclists using the sort of the on road up to um, Fen Causeway rather than through the Paradise Nature Reserve. Um, you know, as it is not a highway. Um, but I can understand how people might use it. Um, I haven't been there myself, so I don't know how wide it is, but there would be ways and means, I guess, of discouraging cycles through that route or at least um, allowing them maybe to walk by, walk their bikes through a certain part of it and cycle in others. So I think that probably, you know, could be looked at, possibly not necessarily as part of this application, but 
you know if if need be and sort of as a as an aside as you know as a as something else okay officers you done i think so yes, thank um, you i don't know if i can't remember which councillor asked it now whether we need any clarification about what unregistered land is is that required or are you happy with the response councillor gawthor wood I think it's really, if this development were to go ahead, surely this needs to be made clear. And then it's how the road, or the whole, the private road to Grantchester Meadows and the unadopted, possibly city-owned part is how that is also managed. Um, it seems a little old for its city to be city-owned but unadopted, so I'm not sure what it counts as. Shall I, shall I respond to that, Chair? I think probably not a planning matter, um, perhaps no, a civil matter, but um, I'll let, let officers answer that. And perhaps you just clarify for everyone here what unregistered land is, so we all are clear, please, Tom, or if you want to ask an officer. John, do you want to answer that about unregistered I, land? I, I can answer the question in relationship to the highway. Um, unregistered land falls outside my remit because that's the land ownership issues and the highway authority is generally not concerned with those. Um, the adopted public highway is the highway that is maintained at the public expense by the highway authority. There are other forms of highway which are privately owned highway where the public have the right to pass and repass but no other rights. So a privately owned road such as the section leading to the development site from the end of our stone road, as Tom has rightly pointed out, is in the well, appears to be in the ownership of Cambridge City Council. The public may have the right to pass and repass along that section, but it doesn't have the right to park, as images I've seen images of cars parked along that particular section of road. The enforcement of not parking would be a matter for the landowner, not the highway authority. So it would be down to the City Council and or Queen's College, whoever actually owns the access road. Is that sufficient clarification? Yeah, that's great, thanks. You're right, anything else, Thank Tom? You. No, okay. Uh, a member of the public has their hand up, and the thing is, I'm afraid that members of the public don't engage in this debate. It's the way the system works is that we have the presentation, we have a debate with officers, then we come to a conclusion. So, Madam, nobody can hear what you're saying because you're not using the microphone. Um, you're not a speaker, so really you shouldn't be responding. Um, and well, give me a chance. I was going to say that the person could put their microphone on. So if you turn your microphone on and just say what you said... No? Sorry. Oh. oh, okay. Um, no, but the thing is, is the people online can't hear what you're saying. So if, if you want to speak, I mean, this is very... The, the, the thing is, I'd like to have you to speak, you know, in the openness and transparency. I, and I, I right, actually don't it, wish to speak. However, you don't have the correct information. This is the problem. There is nobody here giving the correct information. We'll do what we can. Okay, so, Councillor. I, we can't have a debate and come to a conclusion if the, if the audience is going to start engaging. We just have to... to So what normally happens in these situations is that if we get problems with people booing and, and clapping and, and wanting to engage, that we have to clear the room so that we can have the debate. Now, I don't, I don't think I've ever done that. So let's not get to that stage. Let, just let the councillors debate the item and come to a recommendation. That will be the thing to do. So, Councillor Gawthrop, would I believe you were going to pick up on the ownership of the road? Um. If officers could find out 
I mean, we'd be give, I'd be given a response by the officers. I will assume that that is correct. Um, as I say, my concern is obviously about access, even though it, you know this is not a highway owned or managed access. Um, I don't worry. That's all I can say, really. Is, is there a way that we can get this information and ensure that it's correct? We seem to, you know, the, the officers have come back and said what they said. I would, under normal circumstances, believe them that they've done their job. Thank you. Okay, so just on this ownership and so on, this is an important matter, but it's not the most important matters. There are many other matters to be considered here. Normally, in, when this comes up in planning, and it has done many times before, we refer to it as a civil matter, which means that other people need to work out things between themselves. It's not a matter for this committee to work out in this meeting. So that would be the conclusion. And I'll leave it to Tom or uh, the highways officer to respond to that if there's anything else to add. Councillor Bajan. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question relates to... <laughs> do that on purpose. Um, my question relates to the ability of a fire appliance to access the buildings when they're developed. Is there going to be a metalled road that will take a 25 ton fire engine to the farthest corner? Because we don't actually see from the drawings if there are any roads internal. We can see a parked car at the top left. But Will be in, I mean, these buildings can be of the highest spec. So I recognise that the fire risk is not massive, but there is always a fire risk. So, the top right hand corner, is there a metal road that goes there or to any of the what would be the paradise side of these um, buildings? Perhaps one of the officers can answer that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor, and appreciate your input. I know you are a retired firefighter, so it's excellent to have that input. Thank you. Councillor Thornborough. Could the uh, case officer or the maybe the uh, eco ecology officer uh, um, comment on increased cycle traffic through Paradise on other protected species within Paradise? And thank you. Okay, so that's going back to topic one. I think the officer may well still be here and can comment on that. Thank you. Any further? No. Okay, back to you then, Tom. Thank you, chat. Um, so I'm just finding a, a fire uh, tracking, fire access tracking that was provided by the applicant um, for Councillor Bajan. It definitely is there, Tom, I know, because we looked at it before, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that. I'll, 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 I'll find it um, and come back to you on, on that. Um, the, um, the ownership um, of the entrance, just for clarification, I'll just share my screen um, regarding this. Um, so the uh, this is the application site uh, to over here. Um, the area marked yellow is, is city council owned land. So part of this road is is owned by city council. Uh, the rest of this this section of of, um, of road here, short lane, is unregistered land. So no one has ownership of that uh, isn't registered um, but as it's been pointed out it's, it's ownership it is a civil matter um, outside of the uh, planning process um, I don't know if in terms of the while well, I find the fire access tracking information um, I wonder if, if Guy might be able to comment on the ecology impl implications of cycling 
along Paradise? Certainly, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, so there's um, the existing um, footpath that runs along Owlstone Croft uh, and then a significant stretch of boardwalk um, that the council have installed, um, particularly for when the, 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 the wet woodland does actually flood. And there's also a riverside path and that's pretty much on the surface. It's just a few short sections of boardwalk. Um, so um, we do not, there, there are no actual um, uh, bans, if you like, on cycling through through that route, but it's not encouraged. Working with the friends group, we, we do have signage up saying please no bicycles, uh, and there are kissing gates in place uh, and a self closing gate just to sort of slow it down and, and impede a sort of free commuter route. So it's not a publicised cycle route by any means. Um, so uh, and but that doesn't but stop all cycle traffic. So some people would persist to, to do so. Um, and um, but because it's a raised boardwalk, people tend not to actually move off of that on their bicycles. It is just sticking to the boardwalk and moving through the site. So I don't see a huge amount of additional impact from a proposed development and, and potential increase of cycling on, on the nature reserve. Thanks for that, Guy. Um, Tom, I guess you've been looking for the fire um, thingy, have you? Yeah, I'm still... still uh, here we go. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. So this is part of the transport statement that's provided. So Tom, can you use your laser pointer if possible, the little red uh, box, so it's easy to see if possible, please? Unfortunately, yeah. I, I can't in Adobe. In that case, then wiggle around a bit so everyone can see the arrow because it's white, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so this is showing the the um, uh, fire appliance, the tracking data um, coming from uh, Cranchester Street down short lane um, and then to the application site and then within the application site itself uh, showing um, the movement of vehicles um, showing that they can access um, all the the uh, metal parts of the road um, within the application site and um, it has been that we have consulted the fire and rescue department um, and they have no objection to the application Right, thanks, Tom. Thanks for finding it. So, Councillor Bajan, it's an important matter. Did you want to come back at all? Or are you content with that response? I might find myself in disagreement with the local fire service. Um, I think the far side of the buildings where the metal road ends would be the first fire appliance, I suppose, and then the other stuff would stack up behind it. I'm not I'm not sure that provides the sort of access that I would have been happy with in a previous occupation. So I, I have concerns. The road I take it would take a 25 tonne vehicle, um, but I would like there to be some sort of note made to this application if it's approved that that's rechecked because we wouldn't want to find people stuck on the third floor at the rear end in the top right hand corner unable to be reached because of the 30 yards or so of or 30 meters or so of road so i think that's that's quite important um especially when you when you look at the far the, on the far end it's quite a long way away from a, a possible fire appliance and this concept that you can always get in through the front door of the building has failed so many times and the latest example, of course, in London, where all those 72 people died, proves that it's not infallible, this system. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about that, but I think that we could make a, a note on the file for that to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for that very important input. And um, that can certainly be done, and we've done things like that before, and less important things, so that they go to building control, even though it's not within the... Uh, that we don't discuss those things in planning committee, but we send messages on to others who can then check things. As you just said, which is a very good idea, and we'll certainly do that. 
um, just to say that we, you know, in terms of your challenging the consultee, the consultee has uh, made their statement, uh, they accept, they accept the, rep the um, applicant's um, plans, and in that case, we have to um, certainly consider those uh, with all seriousness, and to go against that will put us in a very difficult position should the applicant appeal if we chose to go against the officer's recommendation, just to be clear on that. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Okay, in that case, um, we'll go to four, which is construction impacts, including pollution. And I'm thinking, councillors, the best thing to do would be to do this one and then have a break for lunch and then come back and do the other half after lunch as time has gone on. That seems a sensible thing to do. So I apologise to everyone here waiting for a decision, but we need to have a robust debate on this very important item and it's taking longer than one might have normally expected an item to take in the morning. So, construction impacts, including pollution, councillors. So, I'll speak first. So, uh, there was talk earlier about um, particulates and especially, I think, PM 2.5, which is the very smallest ones, I believe, and often talked about with diesel car engines, that kind of thing. So, um, I'm a bit confused by that. I'm not an expert, obviously. And I thought, that, again, those small partic particles were to do with things like diesel and things and not to do with the dust from building sites, which would be much bigger particles, but I could, I'd appreciate some sort of input from officers on that, just to clarify, please. Any other questions, Councillor Poor? It's similar to yourself, Chair. Um, I understand, obviously, the schools and air quality management area, but I've just checked, and that is the entire Cambridge anyway, so, I mean, it's the same as everywhere. So I just suppose it's the officer's view, because for me, in the longer term, this will be fossil fuel-free development you know it will be solar panels it'll be air source heat pumps so I suppose I'm interested in the officer's balance between the short-term construction and obviously whether in planning terms that's something we can even consider because that's normally covered by condition versus the longer term benefit because so I do know with the best will in the world construction does have to happen I mean I noticed I think someone mentioned the school had its own construction the other thing I did want to ask was whether the applicant and officers had talked to the school about obviously when you do construction because the most obvious thing would be the summer holiday for example or if we're doing you know piling works and things like that that would potentially have more dust is that something that will be considered as part of the um, construction management plan because obviously that to me would address quite a lot of the short-term concerns if the children aren't actually there at the time thanks thanks councillor any more uh, so I'll also ask about the method of construction. So I know that the, we have the report, but just to outline it for me and for members of the public, it's meant to be a cross-laminated timber construction, which is like big, big sections of plywood, but put together and nailed together, and it's, it's a structure instead of using concrete or steel, that kind of thing. But they tend to come by articulated lorry from somewhere like Austria, and they're very big. So I presume that and I've got, uh, uh, if John Finney could respond to this, maybe, but that there's a plan in place that will satisfactorily bring those um, things to site in an acceptable way. No more questions. Tom. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, on the cross-laminated timber uh, method of construction, um, the applicant does advise that this can be achieved through the use of smaller vehicles. Um, and not necessarily uh, big articulated lorries. Um, obviously, the, the, the access is um, narrow in places, so this would um, dictate what vehicles can actually be used um, accessing the uh, site. Um, uh, John might want to add any, something to that if he wishes. As Tom will explain, I've requested what we call condition of traffic management plan, which is how this development will impact specifically on the adopted public highway. It does, well, I've requested it doesn't form part of the construction environment management plan, so it doesn't get, if you like, lost within that larger document. Um, one of those issues that we regularly encounter is what is the largest vehicle that's going to service this site and how will that actually access? Now, if you have large very rare vehicles coming in and out. There may be a requirement for temporary traffic regulation orders to control on street car parking for very short periods of time. We are not in the business of allowing people to ban parking for long periods. We're talking maybe half a day or a day at the most to enable larger vehicles to get in. 
but my primary drive would be to have smaller vehicles to access the site safely as the as the road layout exists at the moment with parking on both sides. The moment refuse vehicle does it, therefore a vehicle of a similar size should be able to easily access access the site. But this awaits confirmation through the traffic management plan. And I believe, Tom, that is still a pre-commencement condition. So no work it. should that's right. Normally asked to be, be pre-commencement, so no work start on site before this is agreed with the developer. Hope that's clear. Well, I was just gonna say to be clear, then um, you know, what often happens in these things, the plans are made by architects and applicants and so on, but then builders get the job and it's handed, the site's handed over to them and they do it. So a builder could turn out and decide they want to actually use bigger vehicles. So will we be at, is that condition, that, that size of vehicle in terms of entering the site, or is that something we expect to happen, but we haven't conditioned it? I'm not quite clear because I haven't checked the conditions on that matter. Tom, please. The, the condition requires um, a tracking exercise for swept path analysis to be undertaken by the applicant to demonstrate what um, vehicles can access the site um, and what they'd be using. And this this would depend on what the phase of development is. So, for example, the, the existing buildings uh, that might require um, you know, very small, smaller vehicles for, for the proposed blocks that might require slightly larger vehicles. But um, it's up to the um, applicant to provide that information as part of the traffic management plan. Do you need John to say anything for, further, Tom, or is that, that it? No, I think that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, in that case, if, are there any follow-up questions, councillors, on that topic? So that was construction impacts, including pollution. Yeah, so just had a word in my ear. The particular question wasn't answered, Tom. Can you get yeah. that, please? Sure. sure, yeah, the air quality... Um, impacts and pollutants uh, environmental health um, officers are available on this this call and greg uh, adam would you like to to respond to that please hi hi all C can you hear me yeah. yes we can hear yeah, yeah I, i'm greg kearney principal environmental health officer in the environmental quality and growth and um, we, we have considered their quality statement that's been submitted and um, it, it does assess the both the operational and construction impacts on local air quality and um, construction is considered in detail uh, and it's a consideration of both the you know, sensitivity of the receptors and the magnitude of the impact from the construction activities um, construction sites um, do contribute to poor, poor local air quality and um, it's generally seen sort of 30 percent or pm 10 the, the the larger um size particles and about i think it's roughly eight percent of pm 2.5 which is the very small particles that go deep into your lungs and which is emerging as um a major concern currently there's only um objectives for pm 10 and 2.5. The 2.5 is an annual mean of um, 20 micrograms per, per cubic, um, you know, meter of of that um, concentration. Um, DEFRA are reviewing this because it's it's a highly sensitive and involving area. And with the new Environment Act, um, they've finished the consultation in December and have announced they will be announced in January this year what thresholds and targets will be set for these pollutants based upon new emerging evidence um so we've yet to see that um but you know this site in the scheme of things from our point of view that they've looked at the demolition which is quite small um it's, it's below um 4, square, square um or cubic meters which is small in terms of construction projects they've considered the um construction activity that is seen as a medium side activity uh, and um, to, uh, and there's the earthworks, which are quite low level as well. Um, the overall conclusion of of their air quality statement is is, is that is you know it's a, it's it's a negligible impact in terms of magnitude of impact, and we do not we don't envisage a significant adverse impact. But they have committed in in that air quality assessment to, to submit a dust management plan, and that will look at 
when they've confirmed the specific construction methods, whether it's, it would probably, I, I don't even think they need piling, but that will be confirmed in due course. Um, and that will determine and confirm the, the level of um, dust emissions. And they have committed to undertake real time air quality monitoring at the boundary of the site. Um, that will have to be confirmed and we will be setting sort of trigger levels where if it exceeds a particular concentration, it will send alerts to, to, to the site management to stop and review. Um, but we are confident that that's unlikely to happen, but due to the sensitivities and the proximity to the primary school, um, we think that is justified in, in this particular case. Um, and there's a whole raft of mitigation that we'll have to consider, you know, from dampening down to, to, to um, if they are cutting, da dampening down with um, local dust exhaustion, that there's a whole raft of measures that, that they will have to commit to. That is recommended, I think, as condition eight, Tom, you, you have to correct me, it's it's airborne dust measures. Um, they'll have to be submitted in due, due course. Um, so, so, you know, with any site, there will be a degree of dust impacts, but we're confident that they can be managed to an acceptable level to protect the human health of the school and the pupils and the, you know the local residents in the area um, so I think um that has answered that that question um or most of the questions share I, th I think that that you've asked um but I can add, you know add further if necessary thank you that was very good thank you Greg very very good response um, but maybe some more questions so um uh yeah, we'll go to questions. So, Councillor Poro. Thank you very much. I think I would like to see condition 14 strengthened because I think what's been quite effective on some other sites I know in my own ward is where the construction management plan involves active engagement with the local neighbours or schools or whatever. Because what I would really like to see is that any, for example, teaching, they know when the noisy periods are going to be. And then, as far as I can see, having looked through again, I can't find a condition that explicitly said that. So I wondered if the officers would accept a strengthening of condition 14 to actually make clear that, you know, so sending out updates, explaining what phase of the work they're on and when things are going to happen so that if this were to get permission, that could be managed within the local area and particularly for the school children. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thornborough. Um, the, would the construction management uh, plan in, ensure that when the during and when the construction is finished that the road the access road that's owned by city council i think it's adopted that that will be made good during and afterwards and the same would apply to the track um quite often um construction work seems to take a heavy toll on roads and then um for, unfortunately they don't put the roads back into the condition um, that they were before the construction started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Bajant. Chair, if the monitoring could also include noise and vibration on the edge of the site, that would be useful. Thank you, Councillor Gawthrop Wood. In terms of vehicles that will, uh, construction vehicles coming to the site, um, right, I understand they're going to be smaller vehicles. Could they be EV? I mean, that would be an, um, an informative rather than a condition, but to help with reducing particulates in general and pollutants. Um, otherwise, I mean, I ha my concern actually about the ownership of the roads or the adoption was actually to do with construction access, parking and the points that Councillor Thornborough has just raised. And I heartily agree with um, uh, Councillor Poirier's points about um, strengthening conditions so that the, the school is um, fully informed and engaged with the construction. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so, um, just to say that uh, what Greg said to Council T earlier on about government thinking about changing policy. Obviously today we can only make decisions in this committee based on policy that exists at this time. So those things will have to be for the future. So Tom, did you want to come back to those other questions, please? Oh, sorry, Chair, can I just say, um, 
Condition 14 is specifically, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, Condition 14 is specifically um, the traffic management plan for the construction, which is really outside the site and, and for the for John and the County Highway. Um, air conditions are Condition 8, which is dust suppression measures for the construction and demolition period. And that will include all things from communication, you know, we would expect, and we do find the colleges and the contractors are very responsive and understanding of, of sensitive neighbours. And we do encourage, you know, on their mitigation measures will require them to communicate and um, possibly do newsletters, have a ongoing dialogue with, with the nearby receptors and, and be receptive. And hopefully they will sign up to the, to the city's considerate contractor scheme. And there is another condition for construction noise and vibration, which is condition seven. In this case, they're separate. It depends on the, the size of the development. Um, construction environment management plans tend to be for the, you know, the long term 15, 20 year build out projects like, like Darwin Green and that. But but these conditions are sufficient in our view and achieve the same things. Um, so I think that's covers those clarifications and the conditions. Um, Tom may want to just add to that or, or John. Um, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Tom? In terms of the um, uh, condition 14, uh, there is another condition regarding um, the size, the, the, the size of vehicles um, being used. So this, um, I'm not sure the exact condition offhand, but uh, this has been recommended by the the Highways Authority um, in terms of the size of the vehicles not being used at peak times to avoid conflict with road users. Um, John might know some more about that. Yeah. Yeah, and there's two elements there. First, first things first, um, I've requested that no vehicle above um, 3.5 tonnes service the site between the, own, sorry, vehicles larger than 3.5 tonnes can only service the site between 0930 hours and 1430 hours to hopefully mitigate, reduce any impact associated with the school. Um, so that those larger vehicles are only going to the site when the school is actually up on operation, not during pick up and drop off times. In terms of the size of the vehicles, that will be dictated as part of the traffic management plan, i.e. what, how big a vehicle can they actually get in there at the moment? I don't know because I suspect they're going to be relatively small. But as we say, there may be occasions when larger vehicles need to access the site, at which point other mitigation measures can be introduced. In again, in Council of Tombra, um, repairs to the adopted public highway now form part of traffic management plan, as does a condition survey of the existing condition of the adopted public highway prior to any work starting. So while we are doing our best to ensure that any damage create done by the developer is repaired by the developer at no cost to the City Council or the County Council. Thanks. Was there anything else, Tom? Uh, just to confirm yeah, the condition, uh, the the um, size of the construction vehicles being limited uh, in terms of the 3.5 tonnes um, between certain hours of the day is condition 15 uh, of the recommendation. Thanks, Tom. So we're going to have to draw this topic to conclusion soon, councillors. I think I can see hands waving. I've got one, don't worry. So just to say that before we go on, Councillor Northrop Wood did mention EV vehicles, which is an acronym for electric vehicles, and it's very useful and I, good suggestion, I'd say. But um, I think that that could only probably be an informative rather than a condition, but uh, I'll let Tom respond to that in a minute when he goes, comes back again. Councillor Porer. Apologies, Chair. I just would really like a condition somewhere that makes clear that there is an expectation that the applicant actively engages to let people know what phase of development they're getting to. Because I take the officer's point, it is 8 and 14, but to me that's just what's happening at the time. I think my question is something that just means that the people nearby, in particular the school, know the days when there's going to be noisy construction, things being knocked down. Um, and I know we've used one on a similar site in the city, so I'd just be grateful if that could be in there somewhere, because I think that is really important in terms of managing any development. I know it's not a huge site, but it's it's substantial compared to you know a, a small house so i don't know if toby or tom would accept that uh yes and um well we'll see uh toby sorry you were going to say something yes councillor that's absolutely fine we've done a similar thing with the 
condition on the next item um, in relation to construction management. So 14 could be uh, re re revised along the line suggested. And on that, just to be practical, we've had this on city council sites before now. So we have a, a, you have a high quality project manager, which I'm sure you'll have, and people locally like the school and that have a mobile phone number they can contact them when they need to. Councillor Thornborough. Um, the, we asked about the track as well, because we've been told it's unregistered track, but with, but the fire, uh, the tr construction craft traffic, I think, will come over that. But unregistered land doesn't mean it's unowned. It could be owned by someone, and there would need to be an agreement on that. So if there, which would be a private agreement, is there, would the, if that agreement wasn't, forthcoming would the construction traffic come through Alston Road is that a viable uh, is that viable thanks I'm always hesitant to answer questions councillor but I'm, I'm just going to say as we've said before this is a civil matter it'll be up to the applicant to sort that problem out we don't want to deal in hypotheticals in this meeting and Keith is going to respond to your question if that's okay with you um, Tom Keith do I do that now uh, yes thanks chair I was just going to clarify, um, we've heard uh, several times today the um, expressions unregistered and registered used in relation to land. Um, there are two types of title. There is registered land, which simply means that ownership is registered at the land registry, which is a publicly accessible register of who owns what. Unregistered land is precisely the opposite. A, it's not being registered by the owner. There is likely to be an owner. It's just that that individual, as a company or as a private individual, uh, hasn't sought registration. Uh, so, yes, the landowner is probably known locally. Um, there are ways to discover when we need to know who owns by public uh, advert in the press, people will usually come forward. But that's the difference between unregistered and registered title. I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps great. Thanks, Keith. So someone else, Councillor Bajan. Thank you, Chair. Two points. One, I think that it looks like we are making a decision in the way that we're approaching some of these questions. And I would like the Chair to explain to the people here that we haven't done that. It's just that we're covering the ground in case, the, because there may be a decision to agree it. We haven't made that decision. It does look a bit like that, but I'm sure you that we haven't. My, my, my point that I want to make is I'm concerned if this goes ahead, that there will be a lot of contractor parking somewhere. And this causes massive problems in all the large developments where there's surrounded by private houses. I mean, the Ridgeon site in Romsey has caused a lot of problems, both and, and the one in Petersfield, where lots and lots of contractors come to work on these sites, but they don't park, they're not allowed to park on the site. And so they park in these adjoining streets. And I think we need some sort of understanding about how that might work if this is agreed. Thanks, Councillor. Do you want to turn your microphone off, please? Will. So, yeah, I think you made your point already on the first point, uh, but I'll just say further to that, you know, the way we're going through this thing is with various topics, they're all planning matters, we need to discuss those matters as planning committee and form opinions on all of those things, because if we, for example, went against the officer recommendation, which is to approve, then we need to have good planning reasons, so-called, to uh, come to that conclusion, and that we would, if we did do that, we would adjourn, put together a form of words that Put those planning reasons forward and that will be then presented to the applicant and the applicant could choose to accept that or potentially appeal should they so wish to the to the um, government inspector you know the planning uh, national planning policy so um that's not the right term is it but i you know what i mean anyway you know it, they can appeal so um in that case back to you tom Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, condition 14, in response to uh, Councillor Bajant's uh, question about contractor parking, um, point two of condition 14, uh, contractor parking. Uh, so the principal areas of concern that should be addressed are contractor parking with all such parking to be within the curtilage of the site where possible. So there's a requirement there. 
um, to encourage contractor parking within the site. Um, this, the, um, the application site is quite a, a large site. Um, there's quite a lot of hard standing, and um, uh, so I expect that, that that could be that could be achieved. Um, John might want to add anything further to that. <clears throat> just just one point within our um, guidance for for writing a traffic management plan, which we which I included in my comments to the planning authority. We also have a a paragraph which says if there is insufficient parking on site, which hopefully this will not be the case, that the contractor should maintain a register of vehicles and whoever use where they are parking so that if they are causing a nuisance, they can be relocated quickly and hopefully the problem resolved. It is, as you quite rightly point out, Council Pageant, a problem, but we are trying our best to mitigate it. Thank you, officers. As you probably gathered from the last time I spoke, I'm getting tired and hungry. So I think we're done for the minute. No more have come back. OK, so we're halfway through. I apologise again that we're going to have to have a lunch break in between this item. Don't discuss the item amongst one another or with any members of the public, please. We'll come back to the item fresh. Please have a nice break and then we can decide further on the recommendation.
Right, welcome back, um, members of the public online. So uh, we're at midway through uh, a planning item at the moment. Uh, it's Alston Croft, Alston Road. Um, we've, we've had a presentation, we've had speakers and councillors to speak, and we've been debating the item uh, uh, through a series of topics, eight of them, the four we've discussed so far are e ecological and free landscape impacts, scale massing design and impact on the conservation area and, and paradise nature reserve, uh, three highway safety and transport impacts, four construction impacts, including pollution. We're now going to go forward with the next four of eight uh, discussion topics. So those are in order, uh, item five, flood risk and drainage impacts, six amenity impacts, including privacy on the school and users of Paradise Nature Reserve, seven sustainability provisions, eight other matters. So uh, members of the public will be debating those items, asking officers questions, including uh, we might ref the case officer might refer to consultee officers who will give us more technical information. And then at the end of all of that, we may want to ask some further questions, even on, on the topic list, because we need to get a robust debate here. But when we're done, we'll have a vote. And the officer recommendation is one of approval. So we'll vote on that recommendation. We'll either agree with it or, or go against it. And if we go against it, then we'll need to think up good planning reasons, which normally means we'll have an adjournment and it takes a bit longer. And then we come forward with those planning reasons and present those to the applicant. Hope that's all clear. So um, this item has taken longer than uh, normal for a, um, but, but quite rightly so, there's a lot to debate. It's a very important um, item to discuss, but it does mean that we probably won't get through the whole agenda today. So the agenda sheet, if I can find it. Uh, uh, so the next item is, is after this is, um, the Synagogue One, item five. Hopefully we should be able to do that afterwards in terms of speakers who might be waiting to speak. Six, a diva court is less likely but possible. So I'm sorry, that's all I can say at the moment. These things are a movable feast. We can't really give times exactly. We can go up till six o'clock if necessary, but um, best not to go much past that and if, if we can help it. We just defer items. The last two planning items for today, I don't think there's much chance we're going to do those, just to be absolutely clear. There, uh, so item seven, Cherry Hinton Road, um, there are no public speakers, so that's good in that respect. And item eight is it's 346 Milton Road. Uh, there were public speakers on that. Maureen Mace, I don't know if Maureen's here at the moment. I haven't seen her. Um, I'm afraid, Maureen, maybe we're going to do it online, but... Um, we're not going to be able to do the item today. It'll have to be deferred, almost certainly. And um, Brian Clark, um, I'm afraid, Brian, that you won't be able to speak today on that. And Councillor Collis was going to speak also, but I'm afraid that won't be possible. So apologies for that. It's, I, again, I can't be certain, but I've sat in a few planning committees. I can't see we're going to get to those items. So... After all that, let's get on with this item then. So, uh, Alston Croft, and the next bit to chat about is flood risk and drainage impacts, councillors. Hope you've had a good break. Councillor Thornborough. Uh, Councillor Holloway um, raised, um, when he spoke, he raised about flood risk and he talked about the impact on neighbours and the winter ground, water flooding, and fluvial flooding. So um, I, I'm hoping the case officer might have made notes about what Councillor Holloway said and whether he could say whether there's adequate evidence provided already to satisfy the, the concerns raised by Councillor Holloway. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Gawthrop Wood. Um, I mean, in the papers, uh, it was said that instead of going for a one in a hundred year flooding, it was going to, or is it one in 10 to one in a hundred? You said we need to check this. Or one in a hundred to one in a thousand year flooding. However, <clears throat> I'm a little bit concerned if you had a uh, surface runoff, surface water runoff, plus rising river level. Um, so could the officer clarify me, because of clarify for me, which of the, you know, occurrences, what, you know, the probability of this happening, whether um, 
the com combination of the two things are covered. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Yeah, so in terms of the first point, um, yeah, I made some notes. So Councillor Holloway asked basically whether the flood risk assessment was good enough. So we get a response on that. Okay, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, I have uh, Hilary Tandy from the LLFA um, who would hopefully um, be able to answer uh, most of those questions. Well, thank you. Can you can you confirm that you can hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, Hilary. Welcome. Good Brilliant. Afternoon. Hello. So on the, uh, I suppose, the joint probability of the river levels rising and the drainage system being able to discharge into that river, that is something that the uh, developer will, uh, tip, well, it will look at as part of the condition application. Um, what we call it is surcharge modelling. So it's looking at what, basically, how would that water get into the river if the river levels were high? And if it couldn't get into the river, where would it back up? And at what point in the system might it cause an issue? If any issues were identified, that water would then have to be stored somewhere safely, making sure that the development isn't adversely impacted. So that is something that will be considered. Thanks. Tom, was there anything else? So there's a question around um, <clears throat> groundwater and fluvial flood risk. Hilary, if you could respond to that. Yeah, one thing that um, I should note, there's a, this is the, the case nationally, there is a, a gaping chasm in a statutory consultee for groundwater. It, it, it doesn't exist. But what the developer has done, and we've looked at that, and we've also had a second opinion uh, from a specialist consultant about the groundwater, is that the, there, some groundwater levels have been taken, but that we request further groundwater level monitoring for the winter months because that's what's currently lacking at the moment. If that those groundwater levels are found to be higher in the winter that would impact the drainage system, there are things that can be done, such as lining the system to stop that interaction with the groundwater um, that then wouldn't affect the surface water drainage going forward. But I believe the applicant may have agreed if if this were to be approved to accept a condition on the groundwater monitoring for the over the winter months. So is that the case, Tom? Confirm. Let me just uh, check the condition that was uh, that was applied. Uh, so um, there's an assessment required um, in terms of the uh, effects of development upon, upon groundwater levels and the flow of groundwater locally upon the neighbouring properties and land. Um, so that has been attached, that's condition 20, um, and then any mitigation to be carried out. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thanks for that clarification. So, Councillor Thornborough wants to come back briefly, I think. So, I understand that the the objectors have commissioned an uh, independent report on flooding, and it's just whether the statutory consultees have had a chance to respond to that in the same way that, uh, that there was the ecology report, the addition of the independent ecology report. Thanks, Councillor Tom. So, um, yeah, the uh, third parties have co to commission um, consultants to undertake um, hydrological assessment on the proposal. Um, this has been submitted to the lead local flood authority as well as the uh, environment agency. Um, Hilary, um, I think you have had a look at that and uh, you've had independent assessment undertaken uh, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, thank you. We did receive a copy of that and commented as an LFA back in November. And we also passed that the details on and passed the whole report on to our third party consultants that we used, who also included that in their review as well. Thank you. Just to clarify, Hilary. So LFA is Local Flood Authority or something like that, is it? Sorry, yeah, it's the Lead Local Flood Authority. Thanks, Hilary. So I think we're done on that. Any more questions, councillors? Oh, yeah, Councillor Poro. Just a quick one. It's probably obvious, but if it's proven that the 
mitigation measures are needed, are we satisfied that that can be achieved within this planning permission, or would it need to come back, for example, if they need groundwater tanks or something? Thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, Tom? <clears throat> In terms of mitigation measures, um, I think Hilary was talking about uh, sort of um, holding water and, and, or, and lining. Uh, that, 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 that definitely a lining could be undertaken in this in this application, and it wouldn't need substantial changes to the um, to the drainage scheme. Um, perhaps Hilary can can comment more on that. Yeah, there is also a condition that requests the the design of the drainage system, so a detailed design. So if any of those mitigations were measures were required, they could then be incorporated into that detailed design, which would be subject to our consultation again in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Hedry. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> right, moving on. So uh, amenity impacts, including privacy on the school and users of Paradise Nature Reserve or anything to do with that, councillors. Councillor Goldthrop Wood. Um, I am concerned that the uh, most northern block, new block, uh, the windows, which I understand are habitable rooms, will overlook the school and the school playing field. Um, so I wonder if the, uh, could the officer comment on that, please? Thanks, Councillor. <clears throat> please try and speak up, Councillor Sir Evelyn here. Councillor Porra. Um, I think it would be interesting to know what the applicant and our boundary conditions are doing in terms of the fencing between the school and the site. Because we undertook a site visit. At the moment, the fence with the school is quite a porous one. Obviously, it's just a wire fence. And certainly in the winter, the usual shrub cover is lower. So I'd be keen to be confident that any boundary conditions we have would thicken, for want of a better word, the hedgerows and the, the lower planting particularly. Because I think... In terms of closeness, it will be people pushing up towards the boundary. And I've mentioned before my concern that with the suds features, which are obviously needed for the drainage, there is going to be a likelihood that people wandering around the site are going to kind of migrate to that part of the site purely because it's the most walkable on part. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, we did, we did discuss that on site, didn't we? And I, I felt similarly, <clears throat> although I suppose, excuse me, we, that would need to be discussed with the school because um, we can't make any assumptions about what the school might want uh, themselves, although it seems obvious, but I don't know. Um, any more questions, councillors? No, okay, back to you then, Tom. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, in terms of overlooking upon the school grounds, this would be overlooking, um, so the nearest uh, block is 12 metres away. Um, uh, so there would be some overlooking towards the school grounds, which is uh, the playing field. Um, the play, school playgrounds, the area of hard standing next to the, the school building itself, um, that would be approximately 25 metres from the um, nearest habitable room window in the in block one. Um, there is, uh, as Councillor Porras mentioned, a mesh wire mesh fence uh, there existing. Um, I have um, spoken to the applicant about this um, and what possibilities in terms of boundary treatment along that northern boundary uh, could comprise. Uh, the difficulty is the existing tree cover there and shrub planting that's already existing. Um, so that uh, there'll be um, uh, that might impact in terms of that um, established planting along there and the, any and, and the trees as well. Um, it's understood from the applicant uh, that the, the school owns that boundary. Um, uh, obviously, that, I think that's, that's a civil matter between between themselves to 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 uh, possibly come to an agreement about. Um, the lower planting is part of the landscaping scheme. The soft landscape landscaping um, scheme um, does propose um, a number of shrub planting and, and boundary hedges along that. Along that northern boundary, which would would help to sort of mitigate um, some overlooking impacts at ground level. It's Tom. Um, yeah, I mean the schools uh, got the got the fence. I think not a very good fence. It could do with replacing. I don't know if the sites the applicant might want to contribute to that. But I suppose 
I was just thinking, um, you know, I was chair of governance at St. Matthew's Primary School when that was rebuilt, and coincidentally, that was a cross laminated timber construction. But the, the sort of edge barrier between that site and East Road is open to a road, you know, with a lot of pollution. And I think at the time it wasn't talked about, it was talked about privacy, but the trees and bushes and that along there will certainly help with pollution. I wonder if there's any need, Tom, to have any sort of temporary measure along this site edge to do with trying to cut down or mitigate the pollution or dust traveling through onto the school site, whether that's a possibility. I don't know if that's been talked about at all. Thanks, Tom, back to you. Yeah, I believe um, as part of the construction um, management plan for mitigations in terms of um, air pollution and the things like that would be explored. So that in terms of sort of bound, temporary boundary construction and things that would be come under that requirement um, as part of the construction management plan. Okay, thanks, Tom. Any more questions, councillors? Okay. Oh, yes, councillor Gawthorpe Wood. Uh, could Tom um, answer my question about overlooking from window the windows in the new block and any mitigation? Sorry, councillor, I never made a note of that. So, Tom, you forgot one question from councillor Gawthorpe Wood, yeah. overlooking. Yeah, so... Unfortunately, the the, the um, windows along that boundary, majority of those are habitable green windows. Um, so although we could possibly look at obscuring uh, the stairwells, um, it wouldn't be appropriate to obscurely glaze the habitable green windows because that would cut down the, the light levels into in terms of the, the habitable green windows, the bedroom windows, the, the student blocks. Hey, let's put some detail on that then, Tom. So can you show us site plan and show us distances to that school yep. site for overlooking and talk about the sort of normal accepted standards in terms of distances? Uh, this is the proposed site plan. So in terms of distances, the nearest blocks are, say, 12 metres away. Um, Laser pointer at uh, home, please. Sorry. Yeah, so 12 metres away is the nearest block. Um, and so windows uh, would, would be from 12 metres away to 25 metres away from the school boundary. Okay, um, is, there a, is there a drawing that you can show that shows the school in the context of those distances so we can see, because it's that's to the edge of the boundary, isn't it? Then we've got the, the playing field area and then there's the school site, it's the, the buildings themselves. Yeah, yeah. I'll put it, put it just try context. and find a plan. The site location plan would be the one, Tom. You got it, Tom? Yeah, good. Okay. So just talk about the, dis the distances there to the, the playing fields and to the school buildings. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got a plan showing the, the blocks in that context, but uh, the school, obviously school buildings here, playgrounds. Um, uh, so I'm not totally sure about the distances, to be perfectly honest, without 
No, that's uh, okay, Tom. We can we can uh, we can see the drawing. That's fine. I think just seeing it in context is useful because the other drawing didn't show yep. the school or the playing fields, did it? A um, member of the public just approached me. I'm not entirely sure what they were saying, but they were talking about other buildings on site, um, on the school site that exists there at the moment. Um, I think to do with it not being shown on all the drawings, but I don't think... It's a, obviously, everything's important, but it's not uh, up there in terms of the most important thing. And yes, you know anything, Tom, that we're missing on the drawing? No, that, not that I'm aware. So... Chair. Can I ask for Keith? Uh, can I ask for a five-minute adjournment, please? And we'll just okay. So we'll have a five-minute adjournment, please. So we'll re reconvene at ten to two. If you got us offline, concern. <laughs>
Okay, we're live again now, uh, councillors and members of the public. Welcome back. I think we're all here. So um, we had a slight adjournment, four, five minute adjournment there. Can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Um, a member of the public approached me at the chair's table, and um, which is funny, really, because it wouldn't have happened if we were in the other room normally. The, the audience is all at the far end. Anyway, that shouldn't really happen, and um, I don't... Uh, Tom was looking for something at the time, so I wasn't interrupted in terms of hearing anything, because uh, uh, he wasn't saying anything. But the, the members of the public should not approach members of the committee and talk to them while we're debating this item, especially not the chair, as I need to be... You know, I can, I can only multitask so much and I need to run the thing. So um, I don't feel that I was compromised in terms of being spoken to by the resident. I didn't fully understand what the resident was saying. Um, so in that respect, I feel that, again, I'm not compromised in terms of my decision making on this item. So we will continue. But just to say that members of the public must not uh, engage in a debate of this item. And the reason for that is mostly because I'm telling you not to. But, but there's a reason I'm saying it, and the reason is, is if you do that, you, you, you clearly, I presume most of you, at least all of you, possibly, want this, want this item to be decided a certain way. And if you do that, you will compromise the decision to the extent that the applicant will have a strong case for appeal, should they so wish to do that. So it's in your interest to listen and watch, but not take part in this debate going forward, please. Right, so Tom, I think we're in the middle of you saying something back to me, if you're still there. Yeah, so I was uh, looking at the distances to the school buildings. Uh, yeah, okay, I, I think I we bottomed that all out actually, Tom, that's yeah. all fine, thank you. Yeah. And I just asked for more context in terms of where the buildings sat on the site and in relation to buildings adjacent to the site. So, councillors, is there any further on that matter? I know you may have lost track slightly now. We are on six, which is amenity impacts, including privacy on the school and the users of Paradise Nature Reserve. Councillor Thornborough. Is, is there um, block A? Is there any... Is it uh, block A? Called block A. Um, is there any overlooking issues of, from block A, which is the one in the northwest corner? rather than the new residential blocks, the, the extension to the existing building. Thanks, Councillor. Any more? Councillor Porro. In terms of overlooking of anything, particularly school, are there any planning grounds? Uh, well, stating that schools shouldn't be overlooked, just come mindful that obviously in this case, it is a protected open space, but equally, there are plenty of other schools that are overlooked. So I just don't know whether that's something we can consider. So I'd be grateful for advice. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, Tom. Yeah, so uh, Councillor Former's point about um, overlooking from Block A, there is some windows um, in the side elevation at first floor and, and second floor level of the, show us the picture, existing Tom. Tom? Show, show yeah. us the plan. This is the north elevation here. So that's the one overlooking the school. Okay, thanks, Tom. And the other question? Uh, the planning, the uh, counterpoise point about planning grounds, I think, plan, planning policies. <clears throat> In terms of amenity, there's uh, impacts. Uh, if it was a residential site, there is planning uh, policies there to um, refuse uh, proposals but in terms of safeguarding I'm not aware of planning or lo uh, national or local planning policies to be able to refuse uh, it on, on safeguarding grounds. Okay thanks Tom. I mean Tom's given the officer response which is the most important thing I'll just say I referred earlier to that St Matthew's development and I know at the time we talked about overlooking from the ARU side, side of things and that was a factor but I think it's a question of degree, closeness etc all of that is to be weighed up so really okay so moving on seven sustainability provisions councillors Councillor Bajant. Thank you chair um 
got to say that I, I like the current design. I think it's, it's attractive. It's the sort of thing that we might like. I also like, from a sustainability point of view, the fact that students will be taken out of private sector housing. I think that's really important. Concerned about the pollution, and why wouldn't I be? Because I've been fighting a campaign for some time, and that doesn't affect my judgment about pollution. But I recognise completely that as far as the sustainability of this small piece of woodland, which is a sort of a little place where people can go and where bats can breed and where animals can propagate, or whatever it is that animals do. This is so important that despite the fact that houses have been built right up to this site and there's a car park at one end of it and houses at the other, I think for a sustainability point of view, I think it's absolutely essential for me. I'm leaning very much now towards a situation where I I feel that the sustainability of this woodland site far exceeds any suggestion that it, this green field should be built on. But it's a protection area that keeps this, this site safe. And I think that we've had a really interesting debate, but we've come, as far as I'm concerned, to a point now where I'm beginning to make a decision. And I think other councillors ought to be. It's all about the future. In 20, 30, 40 years' time, people will laugh at us if we develop on this site. In the same way, in a way, that I'm laughing at the Victorians who built their houses on greenfields all over this city. So, I just think, I really feel that we are at that point now where we, it's time to fess up. And I'm really closely moving towards, I know I'm not allowed to make a decision until I put my hand up, but my inclination is that we should be looking at the future of the city, the future of biodiversity, and in the simple terms, the nature of our... I think it's important that we protect that at all costs in the circumstances. Right, thank you very much for that rhetorical statement, Councillor. Just to be clear... Um... Uh, you said about bats breeding. I believe that we were told earlier there were no roosts on the site, Paradise Nature Reserve, that is. Um, but I can be corrected on that if need be. Councillor Mokpara. Thank you. So I think, obviously, it's planning committee. We pick holes in everything and we find the negatives. I would like to note, as a development, in terms of being passive house, air source, photovoltaic, that is very welcome, as is the retrofitting of the existing buildings. Um, because I think I wouldn't want the applicant to go away were this not to be agreed to think that that isn't something that we actively encourage on this committee and they are going over and above what they needed to for the local plan. However, in terms of sustainability for the nature reserve, I concur with many of Councillor Bajan's comments in terms of where I'm sitting on that, but I did just want to note, because it often feels like we never say anything positive, there are real positives about the development in terms of what they're doing to be over and above our local plan standards for the actual buildings themselves. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Goldthrop Wood. Well, at the risk of repeating what Councillor Porrier has just said, um, I am extremely pleased to see an application that is passive housing. I would like to see the retrofitting that is proposed in this application um, the retrofitting of, I think it's block A, the original block, um, which sorely needs it, that could still, uh, in a separate application, perhaps be done. I am, though, very concerned about the proximity to the nature reserve, particularly as we're a growing city that needs our green lungs. So, um, yes, I'm. That's, that's all I'm going to say now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thornborough. Um, yeah, I for sustainable development is is building is building for now and for the future, and and I am concerned about the future that we've got. Uh, I I know that the NPPF do call for a balance between 
economic objective, social objective, and environmental objective of every scheme. I'm concerned about um, how this balances out. I, I, I continue to be concerned about the impact on paradise because it is, is so important in the city. Um, there is, I also have concerns about the, the social balance of this scheme and the impact on the neighbours, um, the facilities that the students will need. I'm concerned about coming and goings for deliveries and that because retail's change and if there's 160 students on the site, there's gonna be a lot of deliveries for fast food and things. And I think there's not that many amenity for students in this area. So they will be going through the neighborhood a lot. I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned about the level of uh, objections actually, because the NPPF does talk about consultation and it's always much better to work with all the neighbors and consultees to come to a scheme that um, that maybe is balances and um, people can accept. And I do wonder, the. I believe that they, uh, the applicant said they did ask for consultation on the landscaping and biodiversity, but it seems like it, it that was maybe too late and the residents didn't feel that they did get enough consultation and, and having real consultation is an important part of planning these days. Yeah. So I, I, I am very concerned about this balance and whether it has been achieved or not. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Pagecroft. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and I have to agree with um, everything that's been said here. The actual uh, plans are really good with the passive house and the EV charge and all this sort of stuff. It's really good. But Speak up, please, Councillor. Some people Sorry. can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> Get close to the microphone. I'm, and sort of best, but I'm speaking quiet. Yeah, I have to agree with everybody else. It is a really good design, the passive house, but I have to say that I'm worried about the paradise, I agree with Councillor Thornborough, it went through my head, you'd get Deliverer and everybody else going through there, and it's not meant meant for that. And, and I think we had a lot of people who had a lot to say, and I don't know whether they had their chance to actually say something. It sounded like they had information that would have been pertinent that we couldn't listen to. Um, and I just feel that I would like to know a little bit more about how we're going to stop people going through to paradise. How we're going to control that little bit, little bit of paradise in Cambridge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. So, Tom, I don't know if there. Oh, Councillor Walter Wood. Now I know we're not supposed to re redesign on the ground, and this has taken a long time. This meeting, anyway. Um, the good debate, as Councillor Smart has said. I do wonder whether a smaller development on this site might be more sensitive and more acceptable and more sustainable. So the blocks could be a lot smaller. So that's a comment rather than anything else. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Um, the NPPF was mentioned, so that's the National Planning Policy Framework. That's the kind of national thing that sits above all local policy and plans that we consider here when making decisions. Tom, was there anything there for you to answer? I'm Most of it was statements, I think. I think they were all comments. I don't think there was any questions. Did I miss anything, councillors? No? OK, so lastly, other matters, item eight on my list of topics. Anything else you want to comment on, councillors? OK, I'll start off. So um, in the past, on similar, but not, the, not exactly the same planning items, we've talked about student accommodation and the fact that it doesn't have affordable um, housing in it and that it can then be let out in summer and so on and all that sort of thing. But this one is different, isn't it? I think it is, the accommodation is really year round for people to live in. So I presume all of that conversation about affordable housing not being provided by the applicant falls away. But if there's anything to report on that, Tom, that would be useful to get that out in the public domain, um, aside from in the report. Anyone else got anything else to add? That was just on my list. Case, uh, Councillor Poirot. Thank you. One minor thing I should have brought up earlier. I think at one point we were talking about the importance of the screening between the boundary and the site. 
And there was some suggestion, I think, at some point that we could have a phased tree planting so that if this were to be approved, that would go in early. So that, that would start being put in before the buildings come forward. So would officers accept that? And I'm trying to remember which councillor earlier, one of the ward councillors said they felt that the onus is always on the applicant to prove beyond reasonable doubt, you know, for example, that the bats are protected. And I know the ecology officer mentioned that some of the bat surveys we've got didn't fully comply and have the full data. So I'd be grateful for a comment on that. Because I think, I think councillor Collis said very sensibly, this is a very special site. And one of my concerns at the moment, a lot of it is later on, we'll look at subject to these conditions probably. And I'm, you know, this is such an important site with, with even if it's only one or two Barbastrel bats, they're still important. So that where, where I'm sitting at the moment. So I just appreciate some comments from the officers about if, for example, the surveys aren't fully complete as the ecology officer, I think said about the NKA one. MKA one. I presume the onus is on the applicant to provide full data before we can make an informed decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, that reminded me of one other thing as well that came earlier. So it was talked about having a 50% um, biodiversity net gain. In the report, it's 5.85, referred to as BNG, and that could be closer to 10%. Uh, so, Tom, you might want to just uh, refer to that maybe and talk us through the possibilities that might be useful to know as the wildlife trust in that I, in that um, point makes an objection to the application Tom yeah thank you chat um yeah in terms of the student housing um it is it is for year round uh, postgraduates um there is a um Section 106 obligation to require any individual lettings and no uh, family accommodation um, to be used. Um, so affordable housing is not required. Um, the um, the phase tree planting um, that is part of the landscape condition requiring a phase pla uh, tree planting prior to um, works above slab level of the accommodation blocks. So. Yeah, so that's that is a condition requiring um, an advanced planting plan. And in terms of the um, ecology um, question, survey data and the BNG, um, Guy is still on the call. He'd be able to answer those questions. If that's possible, Guy, please. Certainly, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, with the data it's pre previously raised, um, both within the Bioscan report and in um, my, my comments on the application, um, uh, as far as best practice from the British um, uh, the Bat Conservation Trust, we do not have a full data set for bats as per recommendation. That's um, both for static surveys and transit walks. Um, we, um, uh, in negotiation with or discussions with the um, applicant, we, we'd, we'd extended the, um, uh, the termination period and uh, requested more data uh, throughout the summer months, which, is, which has now come in and in, into October. Um, but they're, they're, we haven't got anything for, for early spring. So um, in, in my scrutiny of that and looking at the data thus far, um, I was comfortable with the proposed lux level conditioning, ecological sensitive lighting. But um, uh, yeah, it, it, there, there, there is room for doubt if we're not having that full data set. So um, uh, it could be requested that we have that sort of early spring data set to, to inform a decision. Um, as far as the biodiversity net gain report, um, for the site, this looks at the existing habitat conditions, the baseline for the site. Doesn't um, include any sort of interpretation as to whether the local nature reserve is there or not. It's purely site based um, and not looking at species, just habitat. So uh, the baseline is essentially amenity grass and hard standing and existing development on that site. So it's relatively low, but given its scale and its strategic position, which also has scores, um, uh, that, 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 produce, that produces the baseline. Um, the proposed habitat, so the suds features, the grasslands, the tree planting and the green roofs. Um, I think the, the Wildlife Trust's um, comments on that were that the 
condition proposed for those habitats so as well as the area of habitat for type of habitat but also the condition of what the habitat will be in as part of the score they were suggesting that the conditions um, proposed um, by mk ecology were uh, elevated and it was unlikely to achieve that now normally there will be an agreement on um, sites with public open space and recreational space on that but in this instance where the college is responsible for the, the management and uh, there are wardens on site as far as recreational presses i felt it was a realistic um, achievable albeit there would be a time delay but that is counted into the metric so i was um, relatively confident that on site the um, biodiversity value will increase um, uh, in, in part of the proposals. Thank you. OK, thanks, Guy. Have you finished, Tom? Yeah, you have, haven't you? Yeah. OK, so <clears throat> just coming back on that, Tom, so it wasn't quite clear. Would that early data set on bats be uh, something we could condition in, or is it needed right now today for the decision? And also, just to be uh, clear, I pointed out that Wildlife Trust, Trust have made an objection, um, but it's also useful to note that sustainability, landscape, cons nature conservation, and the tree officer uh, did, had no objection to the scheme. So, Tom, do you want to just come back on that point I just made? I don't think there's any other questions. No. The so, one, yeah, to, sorry, the bat survey data, yeah. Um, I mean, as, as, early as Guy now, say, is it we're going yeah, into early as Guy spring. says, it's unlikely that, that 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 data is unlikely to change the, the previous findings of the. You know, it's been it's been over several months. Those those survey data have been carried out. Um, I I'll leave it to uh, to the advice of Guy of whether that could be a condition on the planning consent or whether it needs to be prior to termination. Just before you speak, Guy, I'm aware that earlier on it was said that the spring data would be a, a lower quantity than the other data around the year. But it's just that you've, it's been mentioned so many times, I just wondered if it was a useful thing to have as well. Guy. Sure, sure. well, well always a, a fuller picture is a better picture. Um, we, the, the bat activity in general is lower um, at, at spring, but that does depend on on the species and exactly how close to the roost, that kind of stuff. So at the moment, there, there is a hole in our understanding. So if councillors are um, particularly concerned about bats and, and the edge of the, the LNR there, then that additional data would be useful. Um, ideally, um, protected species surveys are not conditioned. They are predetermination. Thank you, that's clear. Any more questions, councillors? No. OK, right. Good. That's a very good debate. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll go to the recommendation, please, Toby. Thanks, Chair. So the recommendations set out on page 97 of the uh, officer report. The recommendation is to approve subject to the planning conditions as set out within the report with delegated authority to carry out minor amendments and uh, also the prior completion of a section 106 agreement under the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, during the course of the debate, a number of additional conditions have also been uh, recommended and informative as well. Firstly, condition um, 18, which is on the amendment sheet, uh, suggests the um, removal of the word entire. There is then um, an amendment to condition 14 to include a single point of contact and active management um, with residents and adjacent occupiers, including the school in terms of the construction um, plan. Um, <clears throat> there is an informative in relation to the encouragement of the use of EV vehicles um, during the construction period, an informative, additional informative recommended in relation to fire safety provisions, their suitability and adequacy in the event of fire. I think that is everything, Chair. Thank you very much, Toby. So all those in favour of that recommendation? One chair. All those against? Two. 
double check. Is there an abstention? I didn't see Keep it. your hands up again, please. All is against. Oh, I see. <laughs> Keep your hands up. Yeah, five chair, the hands are sort of covering each other. Thank you. Uh, no abstention, so that's everyone. Yeah, okay. Right, councillors, so uh, as I said earlier to members of the public, you're already aware that now uh, we're, we're in a limbo land between approval and not approval, so we need to think of reasons for refusal um, that we can put together into a form of words. So obviously we've had the whole debate and officers have made notes along the way and you've listened to all of that as well, but it might be that you, know, you want to sort of highlight certain things that have been said along the way to, to help officers formulate that, that form of words. So, Councillor Thornborough. Yeah, I think the main um, policies are policy 55, responding to context, policy 69, protection of sites of biodiversity, and policy 70, which is protection of priority species. So I think there was a, um, well, for me, the, the, um, the, the policy 50, particularly B about being well connected and integrated with the immediate locality in the wider city that follows on from my concerns about um, the students accessing the site and the impact of that on um, uh, the local nature reserve and also um, uh, amenity facilities for the students. I think 60 there was a uh, for me, again, the, um, con I have continued to have doubts about um, uh, the nature and magnitude of the impact, the ecolo ecological impact on the local nature reserve. Um. Okay, Councillor, you can come back in a minute if you want. Councillor Pora, you speak. I can't link to the policy numbers as well as Councillor Thornborough. Um, so for me... The data being incomplete about the bats, whilst I understand we could have waited for it, my understanding is the onus is on the applicant to provide that in full. So for me, that provides enough uncertainty because I want to be absolutely certain if this goes ahead that we aren't damaging red listed species. And in particular, I think Guy mentioned we don't have the static and transit walks for the whole of the year. So that for me was quite a big issue. <laughs> I think I have an issue with obviously the lots of protected um, species. I support the wetland idea, but linked to my concerns about the massing and the amenity space for the student residents, I am concerned that whilst the wetland should protect it and enhance the boundary, actually, what is likely to happen is the people using those houses, if it were me, I'd be wandering off and probably going for a little walk down to the boundary because that's where the free flowing space is. Similarly, on more boring planning terms, the massing for me is inappropriate at the block ends, uh, particularly I think blocks two and three that Tom showed us in the visuals. You know, there's, there's not enough stepping down. And I think, is it block four? So in effect, the nursery block, whilst I appreciate it's probably nicer looking in itself than the existing block, it's six metres off the boundary, which I think for me also, in adds to my concerns about the light pollution. And the thing is, we keep saying, well, we think it can be achieved. We think this, you know, I, I would prefer to have some more concrete evidence because six metres off the boundary off the local nature reserve for me is too close. I do note the sustainability is brilliant for the actual buildings. But for me, that hasn't unfortunately outweighed the sustainability of the wetlands and, and the nature reserve. Well, so, sorry, I couldn't give you the policy numbers though, Toby. That's fine, Councillor, no worries. Uh, Councillor Thornborough, you were a mid... I think it's just that would be policy 57A, designing... OK, uh, Councillor Patient, were you going to say something? Yeah. Chair, I'm just going to support or back up, I suppose. For me, it's about ecology, it's about the landscape, it's about the defence of an area that needs to be defended, and this is not defending it, it's a definite challenge to it. So... I am really 
It's about ecology to me. It's about our biodiversity in this city. You know, we can go on eating lumps of land, but these are the places that are going to save this planet, and we need to save them. And this design, wonderful that it is, right up to spec in every way, is in the wrong place. Thank you, Councillor. Let's remember we need good planning reasons here to be able to defend this decision, Councillors. Any more? Okay. In that case, you sure? Yeah. Okay, we'll stop for a bit then. So officers will need time to write up the reasons because we need to be able to get, you know, get the reasons uh, as best we can to be able to defend them if you need to. So, Toby, were you going to say something? Thanks, Chair. I, I was just going to say, I think policy 59 may also be um, relevant in terms of the kind of landscape and kind of public realm um, issues as, as well. But I think I've, I've, got, I've, got, I've, got, I've got a general I, I, idea from what members have said with regard to my two reasons for refusal. So we will draft them and we will come back. I'm... To my mind, um, certainly a reason for refusal on, uh, straight out reason for refusal on kind of ecology and biodiversity may be quite difficult to defend ultimately given the advice that Guy Belcher has given. It sounds as if that might be an issue that could be quite easily overcome with an additional survey, particularly on the on, on, on the bats. But the, the more broader point from what I take it is that the members are feeling that the, the, the buildings and their configuration and layouts on the site are too close to the LNR, um, the nature re reserve, and too imposing on um, uh, that space and the people that would be and using it in the future. So we will draft some uh, reasons for refusal and come back shortly. So would I be right thinking about 15, 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Long enough? Yeah. So we'll say 15 then, so that'll be coming back at 20 to four, please. Um, continue to not debate the item with fellow councillors or with members of the public, because we've not finished yet. And um, so what happens, people, members of the public, is that we come back with this form of reasons. Toby will read them out. Of uh, councillors will listen and consider whether they like them or not, or whether they want to change them or add to them. And then, when we're satisfied that we have the reasons for refusal that we seek to have, we will vote on them, and then we'll be finished and um, may have made a decision. So, uh, yeah, if you just put us offline, then please, Sarah, and we'll come back at 22.
you, sir. Okay, we're live back on the screen again. Welcome back to um, members of the public listening online. So we just had a short break to get the planning reasons form of words, as they say. Um, and now we'll um, look at those in this committee and decide whether we want to support them or not or change them at all before we go forward. So I believe, Tom, you have the planning reasons that you can put onto screen so we can see them. And perhaps if you could read them out, I guess is the best thing to do, Tom. Um, if you do it one at a time and then councillors can consider, thanks. Yep, so the first reason for refusal is by virtue of the proposed developments, excessive height, scale and massing, and siting in close proximity to the Paradise Local Nature Reserve, it would result in a cramped and imposing form of development and loss of openness experienced by users from the local nature reserve. As such, the proposal would be out of context with its immediate surroundings. The proposal will result in harm upon the recreational and immediate value of Paradise Local Nature Reserve, which is protected open space within the local plan and set within the wider River Cam corridor. Consequently, the proposal will be contrary to policies 8, 55, 56, 57, 59, and 67 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018 and paragraph 174 of the MPPF 2021. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so Toby's going to say something first. Thanks, Chair. I'm conscious that policies 8 and 67 weren't referenced in the discussion, but 8 actually, I think, picked up on the wider point that Councillor Bajant was making with regard to the kind of ri river corridor in the wider context so officers thought that that was an important policy to reference and 67 um, is the policy in relation to protected open space. Thanks uh, Toby. Speak, speak closer to the microphone Toby. Okay so um, councillors any any thoughts on that? Well, let's do one at a time. So, uh, oh, okay, all right, fine, okay. So, to, uh, Tom, do the next reason for refusal, then, please. So, number two, incomplete bat survey information has been provided to demonstrate that protected species would not be unduly harmed, contrary to policy sixty-nine and seventy of the Cambridge Local Plan two thousand eighteen and paragraph one eighty of the MPPF two thousand and twenty-one. Okay, thanks, Tom. So, uh, do the last one as well, I guess. Is that the last one, three? Yeah, number three. By virtue of the lack of amenity space for future students, the associated on-site wetland habitat would be adversely impacted. On. Um, Tom, hold on. Bit of, bit of a misunderstanding in the room. Somebody's standing in front of the screen. So, um, right, I think we're all good to go now. So, Tom, can you just start that one again, please? Just read from the start. Yeah. By virtue of the lack of amenity space for future students, the associated on-site wetland habitat would be adversely impacted and the proposed biodiversity net gain may not be delivered in accordance with the proposal. Furthermore, there is insufficient information to demonstrate that the scheme would not result in harm upon the biodiversity within Paradise Local Nature Reserve. Contrary to policies 55, 56, 59, 69 and 70 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. Hey, thanks, Tom. So Toby's going to say something again. So close to the microphone, please, Toby. Thank you, Chair. I think this reason for refusal, it, it is defendable, but it, it's perhaps more difficult than the others, as indicated um, previously. So I wouldn't recommend that mem members um, voted for this particular reason, reason for refusal. I think it would be difficult to defend on, on, on appeal. Uh, Councillor, if you want to sort of speak in the microphone so members on, the people online can hear as well, please. So, any other reactions? Yeah, Councillor Thornborough. Sorry, um, when you went out, I was also wondering about the issue about the integrated water management and whether that needed to be redone. And I thought that's what the officer had said, that it, it could benefit from being redone because it wasn't adequate. Uh, do you want to respond to that first, Toby? Or, uh, yeah, so Tom, I guess, Tom. 
Yeah, I think what the um, Hillary from the LFA was saying was um, that the detailed design um, of that scheme, so the drainage scheme, um, would be conditioned as part of the application, so it can be dealt with by condition. And Toby too, just so a, a bit more reasoning for, for members, but as you saw from the plans, there is private outside private amenity space for the students provided. There is a warden that's going to be um, on, on site and the wetland area is going to be managed. So um, if I were an inspector looking at this, I, I would say that there are adequate provisions to make sure that, that the on-site wetland scheme um, can be delivered and maintained as envisaged through the plans. And that's why I think it would be difficult to defend on appeal. The second part of that reason for refusal relates to off-site impacts. Um, there was no evidence as far as I could um, apprehend from the discussion around how um, additional students on this site would impact on uh, the local nature reserve in particular, particularly in, in, in in the context that this this the LNR is a site that's accessed by people um, city wide, and this is a relatively modest increase in students and, and, and use upon that LNR. As a result, I, I would see that as a difficult reason to to uh, defend on appeal. Thanks, Toby. So, Councillor Pagecroft, you were going to say something in your microphone. If they think Toby just explained that, I just wanted to know why that wouldn't go through on appeal, um, because there, there, there were so plenty of policy numbers up there. So I just wondered why it would come back and that there would be a problem with it, uh, as we all know what students can get up to. Yeah, okay, so just for members of the public, this is all somewhat hypothetical. We don't know if the applicant will wish to appeal. They might wish to work with officers going forward anyway. But Councillor Pora. Um, so, in relation to the massing, I wondered if we should make explicit reference to the one that's six metres off the boundary, or whether you're happy that that could be addressed were it to come to appeal. Because obviously, for me, that was a particular issue. Not only was the massing large from the boardwalk sort of view, but also where it's very tight on the boundary, combined with the lack of full bat survey. The other thing is, should we note that there are red list species? Or, or, um, I don't know whether that's important or not, but obviously I think we're putting particular weight on the, those issues because of the fact that these are um, rare species. And finally, well, it was me who obviously was keen on the amenity issue. So I do, I take Toby's point. I suppose what, what I was trying to get across is that the natural circulation of the site because of the massing and the fact that it is quite intensely developed, I suppose you could say, leads me to think that even if people, don't, people will be walking that way, and obviously, as I understand, it won't necessarily always be wetland, because obviously if the river's lower, it would be dry land. So I absolutely take your point about that reason being weaker if it's just about them using it in an unmanaged way. But my concern is the flow of the site suggests that people would walk that way. And obviously, if the wetland isn't wet, they're going to be walking on that. So I don't know whether that's something you might be able to incorporate either in reason one or... Because that, that's where I was coming from on that. Because even if someone's managing it, the natural thing is you open your door at that end block and you'll just turn right and walk along it. So. Thanks. So I'll let Toby respond just to say, all the councillors and you, especially thanks to Councillor Pora, spoke about um, the scaling massing of the buildings and how you, well, you, you suggested, I think, that they could be stepped down. That isn't re reflected in the reasons for refusal. I don't know if Toby wants to respond to that as well. I think certainly on that last point, um, we could introduce some phrasing around the proposal not being subservient. Um, I wouldn't suggest that we only pick out one block. I think we looked at a variety of views and if the council were defending that reason, then it could, any witness could look at the different views and the different levels of harm from that view, perhaps with the view where it's closest um, being demonstrated as more, more, um, more harmful. Um, 
I'm not particularly sure that actually referencing the, 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 the red list will will kind of advance the council's case that would come out in any evidence associated with the with, with the with, with the application um, have I covered everything chair I think Tom um, in line with that discussion it might be worth just pulling up the reason for refusal one again and seeing if there is room for some wording around subservience First sentence. A lack of subservience. Yeah, I guess that does it, Tom. Yeah, and then sorry, lastly, Councillor, your your point about kind of the kind of wet and dry nature and the flow. Um I'm not sure that that belongs in reason for refusal one. Tom, could you go down to reason for refusal three? I think it, if we were to insert temporary after associated seasonal if I think we just need seasonal rather than temporary actually Tom sorry Sorry, I thought we were waiting for more typing to happen. So, um, Councillor Thornbury, you had something? Yeah, I just, I think this is an important one because actually there's a lot of merit to the scheme that came forward and nobody, well, I think generally it was, nobody criticised the fact that the student accommodation wasn't being improved. So that this, I'm hoping that the applicants would read these as a message about the real concerns and actually come back having looked at these and worked with residents. That's why I think this one is important. Councillor, Councillor Poro. Sorry, come back. I think it's not, the biodiversity net gain is important, but we're pretty confident it's 10% anyway. My concern is that the circulation of people will just damage that buffer zone. It's not the BNG per se, you know, whether it's 10% or 20, that's less relevant. For me, it's the use of the wetland because of the way the buildings are constructed and the flow of people walking would have an impact on the buffer zone as in its function to protect the reserve rather than the BNG of the site per se. Sorry, Toby. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the biodiversity net gain is not something that we can really argue on because we don't have a strong case. This may seem odd to members of the public, but... The way this is working is we need to get a form of words that we can defend against appeal. And so it's very important that we do the best we can with that and represent the, the, the debate we've had today. Of course, the applicant is still in the room and they'll be using this information should they so wish if they do go to appeal. However, you know, we hope that in being transparent, we're doing a good job as city councillors and as a planning committee. And also we hope that applicants will work with officers going forward rather than taking a route of litigation. But we'll see. Toby. It's a bit difficult, Chair, because I can't, um, I'm, I'm not in this document. But so, um, so this, it, perhaps it could read, by virtue of the lack of amenity space for future students, the associated seasonal on-site wetland habitat would be adversely affected and the ecological relationship with the local nature reserve would be diminished. Rubbing out then, Tom, the from and. Okay. 
I mean, well done, officers. This is, again, another challenge of post-COVID. We have an officer in the room, an officer somewhere else who's typing this on another screen, and we're trying to work between officers and councillors, but we'll get there in the end, everyone. Councillor Bohr. Sorry, mindful, as you say, Chair, we want to get this right. I don't think it's the lack of amenity space that is the problem. It is the flow, because it's a small amenity space, but, you know, there are these lovely gardens around it. So, because, obviously, lack of amenities, you've pointed out, they have small terraces. My concern is the natural, the design of the site, particularly with the suds in between the blocks, meaning that in effect those middle strips are un unusable. So, Chair, through you, so yeah. by, so by, if by there virtue was more, of the, the layout of the site. Yes, and as Councillor Thorpe said, it's not, there is a lack in the sense of where people might naturally circulate, I think. But I appreciate if you say lack of amenity, it could be challenged that there is amenity because they've got a garden. My concern is that the way it's laid out means that the immunity that's there is going to be used in a way that's detrimental to the wildlife preserve, as you've rightly put there. Okay, thanks for that, councillors. Uh, obviously, you can still put your hand up for anything else, but um, are, I wasn't quite clear. Are we going to drop uh, reason three? And just on that, just so everyone's clear, it's not the amount of reasons, it's about the quality. So one, two, three, it could be any number. Are we happy with two? Looks like it. No, you want three. You want the third one as well. So, Toby? I, I mean, it, it, I think, as I said, it, it's the more difficult one to defend, but it's, it's not an unreasonably phrased. So what we need to do now is to kind of vote to accept these as uh, minded two reasons for refusal. Then we need to make the substantive vote to... Um, I'm assuming refuse the application, but a member will have to kind of propose that. Thank you. Right, thanks, Toby. Yep. So, in that case, I think we can probably take these three reasons of refusal on block. Yes? Vote together? Yep. Okay, so uh, all those in favour of accepting the three reasons of refusal as shown? It's all six councillors, Chair. That's unanimous. So, um, in that case, we need to vote on the substantive decision now, which is with regard to these reasons for refusal. Uh, oh, uh, somebody's proposed it, don't they? It won't be me, because that's not, not me. So, someone can propose that, please. Councillor Thornborough, right, okay. A seconder? Councillor Parra, okay. So, the proposal is to... Yeah. Vote to refuse the item. Okay. All those in favour of that refusal? It's all six, Chair. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. So the item is refused. Thank you very much for that debate. Very good. I think we'll just get on with the next item now, if that's okay, councillors. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, if members of the public want to leave, that's fine. We, we won't get going for a minute or two anyway. So... Um, the next item is item number, if they could just leave quietly though, please. Item number five, the synagogue on Thompson's Lane. Um, so just before we start the item, it's now 10 past four. I think that there's not much chance of us doing any items after that, that item. So the one after that would have been Adiva Court, item six. And we already said we wouldn't just do seven and eight. So I think we're going to have to stop after we've done item five, because that will take us probably as close as damn it to six o'clock, I reckon. So no one's shaking their head on that. I'm taking that as okay with officers. Good idea. So any speakers on Adiva Court and following items, I'm afraid if you're here already, I do apologise, but that's the way planning goes. We can't really say how long things will take. So as I say, we'll go to item five, and um, let me just get it up on my screen. So Mary Collins is the officer, and we've got speakers, um, Richard Fentiman, Robert Perlman, and, and Carl Sanderson, and then we've got the ward councillor. So, um, but first of all, before the speakers, we'll have the presentation. 
So, okay, councillors, we'll get going then. So, um, if Mary, if you want to present the item, then please. Hi, Mary. Good okay. afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair. I'm just going to put my um, headphones on. Right, can be okay. Can I? Sorry, yes, yes, Mary. We can oh, yes. Um, oh, uh, sorry, Chair, I couldn't hear you for a minute there. Right. Okay, I'll start the presentation then. Um, um, so, yeah, first of all, the planning committee members' attention is drawn to the amendment sheet um, with changes to recommended conditions and the addition of a condition requiring a demolition and environmental management plan. Um, yeah, so the planning permission is sought for the demolition of the existing synagogue and Jewish community facility and for the erection of a new synagogue and a Jewish community facility. This will include replacement parking spaces, new cycle storage and associated works. Um, the officer recommendation to the committee is one of approval, but it's a finely balanced one because of the site constraints, and the tight and constrained context of the site, um, which I'll sort of go on to explain. Um, so, Councillor, yes. Oh. Yes, you may, Councillor. Just hold on, Mary, while we shut the door, because there's a lot of noise interruption in the room. Sorry, Mary. Thank you. That's okay. Okay, carry on, Mary. Thanks. So, yeah, this, this slide just shows basically the context of the site. Um, you've got Bridge Street here, um, Thompson's Lane here. The existing synagogue is situated here. So the building is set back from the frontage with Thompson's Lane. Um, you've got St. Clement's Church here and the churchyard. And then to the rear, you've got the Portugal Place with properties um, adjoining the application site to the rear there. Uh, this is another slide just showing basically the constrained um, um, nature of the site. Uh, you've got the Portugal Place Terrace here, which is a listed, which are listed grade two. You've got the listed uh, church there, and you've got the listed old vicarage there. Um, This is another one showing it just from another direction, an aerial view, but showing the relationship of the rear of the properties in Portugal Place to the rear wall with the existing synagogue building. Um, it's just, um, just more of a bird's eye view showing the gap between the, the application site and um, that neighbouring terrace. Um, so this is um, a street view of the synagogue. Um, this was taken in the summer, obviously, um, but um, it shows that the existing building is set back from the main road frontage uh, between buildings to either side. So here and here, this is the old vicarage and this is the Cambridge um, Visual Arts building. Um, there's Currently, three trees on the site, the three olive trees, these are all to be removed as part of the um, proposal. So, uh, this just basically shows the relationship of the um, Portugal Place Terrace in particular with other surrounding buildings and the 
um, a replacement synagogue building. As you can see, the line of the existing rear wall of the synagogue um, is to be maintained for the replacement building. So the this rear wall of the synagogue will not be any closer to these properties. Um, so yeah, so briefly um, I'll describe this proposal. Um, two parking spaces um, are to be retained at the front. One is an accessible space and there will also be an EV charging point provided. Um, to the rear of the building and to the south, um, there would be a rainwater garden. Um, there's parking, uh, bicycle parking, um, 10 uncovered spaces to the front for forecourt to the building and another 18 in a covered park um, area there. Um, we've got an indicative plan to show that two trees are to be planted once the development is um, underway. Um, now this um, slide just shows the existing street scene um, and um, just indicates um, existing and what um, how the, the street scene may change or will change if this um, application is approved. Um, so as you can see, the height of the building is fairly similar to the existing synagogue building there. Um, and it nestles in quite well with the two buildings to either side. So this is the Cambridge um, Performing Arts Library and you know the list of building the old vicarage. Um, when viewed from the um, Thompson's Lane frontage, a lot of the actual massing that um, you see from the west elevation, which you'll see later in the slide, is actually obscured by this building here because the proposed building wraps round the rear of this one. So um, the profile of the building um, respects the rhythm and scale of the buildings to either side. In terms of its impact on the conservation area, um, we feel it would uh, make a positive contribution by providing a visual stepping stone between the shorter and taller, taller buildings. Um, so the, in terms of the view from, oh, so yeah, this is just another one showing the front of the building. As I say, this blue line here, which you may better just see, is the outline of the performance arts building. And this is the, the old vicarage here. Um, so in terms of the conservation area, it's obviously important that this um, end wall, side wall of the old vicarage is seen um, as part of views within the conservation area, but also to respect its setting. And um, the building, although further forward within that um, courtyard area, um, respect um, and not block any views of that, the, you know, the chimneys, which are particularly noted in the conservation area appraisal. Uh, this plan is just indicative, just showing a, how the massing would relate to those two buildings either side. Um, this is just another showing what the proposed building they look like. So in terms of um, the rear elevation, this would be the one um, which would um, be experienced but from the properties um, in Portugal Place. This is the existing sort of elevation that they would appreciate um, sort of from their gardens and this is what is proposed here. So there's um 
an articulated roof, mostly sloping up, up and away from the boundary with the properties in Portugal Place. Um, here you can see um, there's a slight see outline of the existing building. Um, so in particular, the properties at 20. Six, 25 and 26, um, which currently face the flat roof section, would be looking at this section of roof, um, which is articulated into several sections. Um, so this is close up showing that articulated roof. So it's got a slight flat roof section a vertical section and then two sections sloping up and away. Um, this is just a section showing what it would look like from Portugal Place. So again, you've got these articulated roof slopes sloping up and away. Um, so in terms of views generally around the site of the, the proposed new synagogue building. Uh, there would be views through from Portugal Place and across the churchyard into the site. So you can currently see where the synagogue is at the moment. Um, and this is an indication of what would be seen from the Portugal Place and from the public realm and conservation area. Um, so the south elevation of the proposed building would face um, towards the old vicarage. So this is the synagogue as existing, where there's currently views between the two buildings. Um, as proposed, um, You can see that some of the gap between the existing highest point of the building of now in field. So this will reduce this gap, this visual gap some to some degree. Um, so yeah, this just shows it again, showing the outline of the red outline of the existing building and how the additional massing is filling that gap. But officers consider that because um, the main view of, the, of that particular elevation is from Bridge Street, um, and so you've got some quite mature trees which are to be protected as part of the planning application, um, and the proposed synagogue is not as tall as the um, the old vicarage so officers feel that this the filling in of this gap um, would not be sort of harmful to any sort of views um, in and out to the concert you know you know from the, con the conservation area and that more public area of it um, so yeah this is just I think another wonder showing that relationship. Um, so the north elevation, the blue, there's a faint blue line that shows the outline of the adjacent building, um, Cambridge School of Visual and Performing Arts. So the proposed building wraps around this one. So not all of this elevation would ever be seen in one go. Um, and this is just a section through the building. Um, so I'll just um, describe some of the other plans we have in the proposal. Um, so all plant is to be in the proposed basement. There's a plant room and um, so yeah. Um, oh, shouldn't really come to that one yet. Oh, perhaps I could. Yeah, so in terms of um, what the building would look like, the material palette is um, sort of warmer hues um, that would hopefully assimilate with the 
character and surrounding buildings, which are of a sort of reddish brown brick. Um, the proposed um, roofing material is to be an anodized bronze metal. Um, and officers um, would be looking for the warmer of these tones. And um, this material is also has a matte finish, so the expanse of roofing wouldn't wouldn't have um, a shiny and sort of reflective appearance. So um, this is just showing the um, proximity to the rear wall um, and how close it is to. Um, Portugal Place properties and how it, as I say, wraps around the rear of the um, this building here. First floor um, is set in slightly um, from the boundary with the properties here. Um, it's a section of flat roof here and this is a section of sloping roof which will then continues Upwards to a point. So the um, the roof is articulated. There's lots of angles and various roof slopes, but this breaks up the massing of the building and also um, provides a lot of sort of interest to it. Um, so hopefully you can see here we've got a very very shallow. As I say, it's almost a flat roof here with two roof lights. Then we've got an upstand sort of vertical wall, then roof sloping up and away again. But there's, as I say, various sections. And there's also, between the articulated sections of roof, there are flat roof sections. Um, so this is showing the building from, as I say, from the main um, the main neighbours which are, are likely to be impacted on the scheme and as you can see where you've got the red line of the existing building outlined you can see the additional created by the proposed new synagogue building. Um, now this plan hopefully will explain and show things a bit more clearly regarding these um, various roof slopes. So between, uh, so behind, sorry, uh, 29 and 28 and 27 Portugal Place, you'd have a long sloping roof going up to that point there. Beyond that would be this slightly higher section, um, which would be visible from these properties. And then behind uh, 25 and 26, um, there would be a flat roof section, then a vertical wall, then other roofs sloping up and away. So here you've got a small section of roof, then a flat section. This is like a longer articulated section. Um, which is sort of got that sort of hipped end and then it's also canted away um, from this boundary. So this shows um, that cutaway section where you've got this flat roof section um, to the rear, a vertical section and then the roof sloping up and away. Um, so you can see from, from this um, illustration the proximity of the rear of the properties in Portugal Place and the proposal. This is another all zoomed in picture just showing um, how that roof would is articulated. So we've got this section here, flat. Um, a vertical section and then roof slopes, the 
different um, angles sloping up and away. So this um, shows um, an indication. This is out of um, a window at, uh, I think it was number 23, Portugal Place, which is right at the end of the terrace, the far end, showing the relationship between the existing building and the terrace of properties. And it really shows their close proximity. So in terms of neighbour impact, I'll just go back to a few slides, if that's OK. Um, This here shows the impact um, sort of looking from the Portugal Place end with this flat roof section that's been cut away. Um, the, the angle of the roof um, is um, one that um, officers don't consider would um, be, sorry, because of the angle of the roof, officers consider there wouldn't be any detrimental impact through loss of light. Um, from the, the structure, um, but given the proximity to that, um, those existing properties, um, officers consider that there is likely to be or is a, a loss of outlook from these properties. So, sorry, I'll just um, find that slide again. So in particular to the properties here, which currently just overlook the, the flat roof section. So as the previous slide showed, um, amendments have been made to reduce the amount of roof slope visible directly from these properties and to just um, break up the massing of that, that section. Um, so, let's go through a few slides now, back to where I was. So, another issue that um, has been raised is that there are trees in quite um, close proximity to, to the application site. As, as I've mentioned before, it's a very constrained site with a lot of um, existing trees and yeah, proximity to listed buildings as shown here. Um, so um, our records show that um, there is a tree protected by a TPO um, on the site, but, um, and this is um, listed as being an Arizona cypress tree. So this tree isn't there anymore. Um, I've had a look on Google Street View going back to 2008, which is the earliest time it goes back to. And it shows the three existing olive trees, obviously in a smaller, less mature state, but um, it doesn't show the Arizona Cypress. So there are no trees. So there may be a tree protection order on the site, but the tree is is not there. Um, the trees as existing, um, as I say, the three trees on the site are all these olive trees, which are proposed to be removed. But there are also trees in quite close proximity um, to the application site. And um, these are to be retained. And so they're, you know, the future retention and health of these trees is obviously a major consideration for this application. Um, these ones here form part of the, the churchyard and as I mentioned earlier are, are important in screening the building from views from, from Bridge Street. Um, so yeah these are the three trees to be removed. Um, in terms of tree 
uh, retention and protection. Again, yeah, this, this slide is just showing pretty much the same thing, which trees are to be protected. Um, within the um, root protection area, um, there would be um, the work would be constructed following the no dig specification and specialist foundations or structural supports will be required for two sections of the, the building either end close to these these trees which are to be retained um, and this will be secured by condition um, so the other thing um, Existing trees that are uh, um, on joining land are to have their crowns lifted, and um, some would have um, some linear root pruning. This is to, all to sort of help uh, the trees cope with the additional building in close proximity. Um, so, to conclude, uh, the proposal would introduce additional massing and provide additional enclosure to existing properties and their outlook along Portugal, Portugal Place. Um, so most notably um, 25, 26 and 27, but also to a lesser extent those at 28 and 29. Um, During the course of the application, um, the applicant has um, sought to attempt to reduce the impact of the scheme on neighbouring amenity through revisions. Um, any harm um, which would arise to the amenity of the occupants of the of Portugal place um, properties would need to be balanced against the wider community benefits that would arise from the scheme. Um, the replacement building would be of a high architectural quality and highly sustainable and targeted BREAM excellent standards. Um, it would um, preserve the conservation area and setting of listed buildings and would provide a much needed new community building. Um, but that, that's the balance for, for councillors to, um, to debate. OK, I think that's um, my presentation, so I'll stop sharing for now and um, go back to other slides as, as required. OK, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mary. State Office of Recommendation is one of approval. So I've got speakers, uh, Richard Pentiman is objector, and I've got uh, Robert Perlman speaking on behalf of the applicant, and also another uh, speaker, Carl Sanderson, who's going to uh, supports the application. I understand the applicant and the supporter will be okay with three minutes, normally three minutes to share between them. Nothing to the contrary. Okay, in that case, so the objector first, uh, Richard, if you'd like to speak first, then please, you've got to take your seat at the little table there. And um, you press the right hand button on the microphone thing. And um, just half a minute before the end, someone will ding a bell just to tell you you're coming to the end of your three minutes. So when you're ready. Thank you. So, sorry, hold on a minute. Just one thing has come up. So, Mary, did you make reference to the um, uh, amendments list, amendment sheet? No. You did, yeah. Thank okay, you. sorry, we missed amendment. that. Thank you. Okay, sorry if you were to carry on now. Thank you. I'm speaking to object to this proposal on behalf of the residents of 23 to 29 Portugal Place, who are those most affected by this development. Our objection is on the ground of loss of amenity, which the officers identify as the factor which may count against approval of this application. In this context, loss of amenity has special significance, as the officers state, owing to the proximity of our properties to the site and their relative depth below the site level. As they say, this means that the impact of the development will be magnified, and as they state, this impact will require very careful consideration by the committee. Of course, our objections are summarised in the officer's report, but I would emphasise the following points. 
First, the very close proximity between the rear elevations of our houses and the new building, in combination with a significant slope in Portugal Place as it descends from number 29, simply exacerbates the proposed building's overbearing character, especially in relation to numbers 25 to 27, which sit lowest in the slope. Its effect is of excessive height and mass, causing significant additional enclosure and curtailed outlook, a matter of particular significance because our small rear gardens are our only external spaces. Second, although as we have heard, the design has been amended, principally in relation to numbers 25 to 27, this is no solution. As the officers state, there is still a loss of outlook and increased enclosure to these properties, which, as they say, must weigh in the planning balance. Third, I would add that since the development forum in 2021, no consultations have taken place between the developer and the residents of Portugal Place, which is disappointing given the potential impact on our properties. Of course, we recognise that this manifest loss of amenity must be set against the factors listed in favour of approval. And of course, as the committee is aware, such a balance depends not on weighing the number of factors for or against a proposal, but on the strength of those factors. In our view, the matters that we and the officers have highlighted makes amenity in this case a factor of overriding importance. Most importantly, it outweighs any community benefit for two reasons. First, any benefit must be set in context. Our understanding is that the new building will be used for short periods of time, limited mainly to the 24 weeks of the Cambridge academic year. By contrast, the manifest detriment to our properties will be felt every day. It will be permanent. Second, any such benefit is by itself irrelevant, if that benefit might just as effectively be achieved by a different modified scheme. Certainly there is no evidence that this benefit could only be achieved by this design. Overall, if amenity is to have any meaning as a planning consideration, it must be decisive here. And it is on this basis that we invite the committee to refuse this application. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, about three minutes? That was about three minutes, well done. So, um, uh, Robert, you're next. Second. Like I say, just press the right-hand button, lights up, and half a minute before the end, fellow goes to let you know you're coming to the end. Before you start, then, just to be clear, I, I don't know if you have uh, liaised with uh, the other speaker, Carl Sanderson, who wishes to speak. Yeah, and he will have a bit of a three-minute time. Is that going to work for you? Yeah, okay, all right. Are you ready? Go. Okay. <laughs> The documents um, submitted to the Council Committee for planning and for giving planning permission at Three Thompsons Lane are the product of more than a decade of consultations and painstaking efforts to accommodate all parties. The development is designed to meet the needs of the local Jewish community, but takes serious account of the concerns raised during the consultation process. Those consulted included representatives from the local Jewish community, Jewish students at Cambridge, and of course, neighbours. Those objecting to the proposed development are mainly residents, some of the residents of Portugal Place. Pre-application meetings took place in 2011, 2015, 2018, and public consultation meetings took place in 2018 and 2019. A development control forum identified remaining issues which were subsequently addressed. We worked with RH Partnership Architects, a local firm which has a proven track record of building developments in Cambridge. The existing facilities are inadequate and not fit for purpose. They make a positive contribution to Thompson's Lane. Notably, the conservation report supports the project. Fundamental to the project will be the establishment of an endowment fund to cover costs for professional services 
that will ensure that the new building will be managed to a high, a very high standard and respect the environment. Our aim is reasonable, to transform the space at 3 Thompson's Lane into an up-to-date, attractive, sustainable and responsibly operated venue for students and for Cambridge locals. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, next up is uh, Carl. So you've got the remaining time. How long is left? 40 seconds. About 40 seconds left or so, but just finish your sentence, obviously, after the bell goes. Uh, speak as the, <coughs> the petitioner that requested the Development Control Forum for this project in February 2021, and as the <coughs> owner-occupier of the old Vicarage Grade 2 listed building dating from 1627, it's among the most affected by the development the project site boundary touches the foundations of the old vicarage along the full length of the two flank walls. Uh, the DCF midway during the cons through the consultation, uh, about 100 uh, specific objections had already been raised and overcome already by then uh, by negotiation amendments to the plans. And in the two years since, the issue of noise, which was a largely outstanding issue at the DCF, has largely been resolved, notably by the developer moving roof mounted plants into the new basement and the council constraining the facility's use. From a Thompson's Lane perspective, the issue of massing is also acceptable. The existing building presents neighbours with issues of noise, waste, and security that the proposed design aims to resolve. Uh, the committee's attention is drawn to several requests at the DCF, including the need for an undertaking by the CUJS trustees to establish improved and permanent management arrangements for the newly enlarged facility. Thank you very much, Carl. I hope the uh, objective won't mind, but you had a few seconds longer than three minutes okay. there just to get your point in. Not hearing anything. Good. Okay. Thank you for that. So uh, we have uh, Councillor Bick. Will Councillor Bick to speak? No. Councillor Bick. Yeah, you're up. Yep. Unlimited time. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you for permitting me to speak on this application, which, um, which is, lies in my ward. I'd like to start by thanking the officers for their their exposition of the application. And I'd also uh, like to recognise the efforts made by officers and the applicant to address the issues surrounding the, the listed old vicarage on Thompson's Lane, which as you just heard, um, I'm pleased that that has brought um, acceptance from, from that side of the neighbourhood. But there is, however, an important remaining issue as the case officer has outlined. Now, the remaining issue is also not about something. It's not about the unquestionable, unquestionable right of the Jewish community in the city and the university to aspire to improve their facilities for worship and social life. It is about whether the site and the complexity of this particular site make this possible in the form of this application when taking account of other legitimate interested parties who are not the ones making the proposals for change and are looking for continued peaceful enjoyment of what is in place today. Specifically, the issue is the amenity of residents of Portugal Place, whose property is back onto the application site. And I'd like to, to reinforce the comments made by Richard Fentiman on their behalf. The fact that this is identified by officers as the only major factor in the balance against approving this application doesn't mean it cannot be the most important among all the other factors listed. There is something even deeper about people's homes where they live all of the time than about a place where people come together for just some of theirs. For a healthy and vibrant city centre, we need both activities to continue in some equitable balance. I think members of the public would actually be surprised if today they looked behind the terraced house, the terrace of houses concerned in Portugal Place. The complete absence of gardens or more than a few feet of, of backyard between them and their rear boundary 
and the proximity beyond that of the existing quite dominant synagogue buildings is not what you'd expect. It was obviously a different time when the existing synagogue was permitted to be built, and my guess is that it would have struggled today being so close and so obstructive. But that ought not to provide the benchmark for further incrementalism. On the argument that the prospect from the backs of those houses is already so devalued that there is no serious reason why it cannot be made a bit worse. The proposals in today's application, even after its recent amendment, without doubt further increases the enclosure of the Portugal Place houses through greater mass and greater height. Residents feel that every site has its ultimate limits and this application is pushing those of this site too far, at least at this eastern end of it. In a, in a significant development on a constrained site like this, it would have been good practice to reach out and carry out stakeholder engagement in the preparation of this application. Contrary to what has been outlined earlier, so far as the neighbouring residents of Portugal Place are concerned, this hasn't happened. The development control forum that's been referred to was initiated by residents and was at a much too late stage in the process for serious discussion of the, of the issues and options of the kind that could have resolved their concerns. It has contributed to a sense on their part of feeling quite written off in advance and discounted. I would, I would welcome it um, as ward councillor if the committee rejected this application because of its enclosure and massing to the rear of the Portugal Place houses. Rejecting it would enable the applicant to rethink their approach for the site and how to better use it. Now, Chair, because I have just one chance to say something and I must cover all the bases, um, I'd also like to say that if the committee nevertheless approves this application, I would like to ask members to pay particular attention to the conditions on demolition and construction. If the presence, if the presence of this proposed building after it's built will enclose the Portugal Place houses, you can only imagine the potential of demolition and construction to make lives there a complete misery especially given that working from home is now practised extensively. Old buildings like that, theirs are particularly susceptible to environmental disturbance and residents are currently experiencing considerable impact from work on the Park Street car park site, which is much further away. I think my suggestion has in part given rise to this new condition 40, which is on your um, amendment sheet, which I do welcome but I would ask office, that officers assist the committee in taking this further by adding to this that actual timetables are periodically shared with neighbouring residents by the developer and that a continuous point of contact is communicated to them, allowing a channel for questions, concerns and complaints to be responded to. This happens on larger, on larger applications and I think that it's something because of the complexity and proximity involved in this site should be considered here. And I would be grateful if officers could address this. And I would re request um, that they try and suggest a method of achieving it. Um, if, as I say, and as I hope doesn't, isn't the case, that this, is, um, this application is approved. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I'm aware we never had a comfort break this afternoon. I need to go to the loo, so we're going to have a few minutes and then come back at five o'clock at the latest, and we'll go on with the debate. So if we just take us offline, please, Sarah.
Okay, no, please, Sarah. Thank you. We are now live. Welcome back, everyone who's listening online. Just a short comfort break there. So we're back on um, uh, item number five, which is the synagogue uh, item. So uh, we've had the speakers, and now we'll go on to councillor debate. So who's first? Councillors. Councillor Thornborough. Um, <clears throat> this is, a, this is a, I think this is a particularly difficult project a difficult scheme to understand three-dimensionally. And I think it would have been really helpful to have a mod, an actual model um, for, for the residents and for us as well. So I think um, elevations are very deceptive. And the, uh, I think the, 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 the roof, three-dimensional roof diagram that we had was um, one, the, one of the most useful, but it, it would. We also saw um, a view from one of the residents, Portugal Place's back view, um, looking down the boundary really, and to the existing building. And again, I think that would have been useful as a um, a three a three dimensional view of what was proposed, because I think actually the. The, the roofs sloping away obviously diminish the impact on Portugal Place. And it's un, un, I think very much understanding the, the impact on Portugal Place is what we're, the balance here that we're looking at. So I'm, I'm thinking hard about that. A couple of other points. The, the, the plant room is um, not exactly the same as the, the, the new plant room isn't the exact same footprint as the old plant room. So it, that seems a shame because demolition, this is a very tight site. So the condition about construction needs to be considered very carefully and demolition is disruptive and, and groundworks are, are disruptive as well. And it's a, it's a real shame that the existing basement couldn't have been used it seems to be about the same area as the new one but it's a it's slightly different format but I'm just saying that if this goes ahead maybe they could reconsider that I'm concerned about um, the existing trees um, to the north and the south um, I know there's Mary put up a plan fairly briefly about the, the impact on the trees and the root protection <coughs> area. Because they're existing trees and quite big, they, the, there's no foundations in the new building, but uh, there's no lower ground floor, but the foundations will have to be very deep, I believe, through because of, um, for, to comply with building control. So there may be a lot of sub-ground work there to protect the existing trees. One thing I don't want, and we're finding, is that new buildings um, are affected by climate change when they're built near existing trees. And regardless of the foundations, we've been told, if the trees, the existing trees cause the new buildings to form movement cracks, the, the tree that you can make an application to remove the trees, so I, I, if this goes ahead, I want to be absolutely cast in steel or whatever. The, the, the existing trees must be protected. So the, the foundations and everything, the structure, must take into account the existing trees so they are not ri at risk in the future through climate change and excessive drying out that might happen through. So I, I would really like to... I know there's the... There are two conditions about the trees, but I don't know whether we can look at uh, really safeguarding them against possible future claims of uh, subsidence due to um, climate crisis and the existing trees. So it's really the, uh, the trees I can, I'm concerned with. I can, I'm gonna, I think we should consider the construction because this is so sad. We've talked about where subcontractors' cars will park on other sites and dis the real disruption during construction, which is, uh, can blight residents' lives. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Goldthrop-Wood. 
Um, in addition to the trees, I've got concerns about the vastness of the east and the north wall um, when the construction starts. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm basically worried it might fall down. I'm not also completely clear who owns the walls. Um, I got another question about the anodized bronze roof and the color. Uh, I know they say warmer tones, but it looked pretty dark on the CGI 3D uh, model. Um, so I wonder if could some clarification on that. And again, it, it's as Councillor Thornborough said on the construction, this is going to be a very tight construction site. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Poro. Thank you, Chair. I had some sort of um, questions. Firstly, could I just check at the moment, there's quite a lot of shrubbery at the front and the olive trees and the olive trees are going. Um, could the officer just comment on what's going back instead? Because on the design and access statement, there is some shrubbery at the front, but it's not clear whether it's equivalent. And obviously, I welcome the fact I think there's astroturf around the back, so it would be good that obviously that is being replaced with a, a rain garden. Like Councillor Thornborough, I am concerned about the current trees, and I would like to see some strengthening of conditions five and six. So talking about the no dig or minimum dig areas, because I think that is absolutely critical. And currently, for me, I, I don't think that's robust enough. Or I'm concerned. Um, I know we're losing the three trees, but only two are being replaced. So I was going to ask the case officer if they felt that that was reasonable or whether we should be looking to put three back. I also wanted to check about cycle parking. I think there's 18 spaces, um, but it does say also there could be up to 100 users. So I'm not sure what our local plan standards are for sort of community areas. But I, and I am mindful that there is other parking nearby. But for me, the critical issue here is, is the views from those three houses in Portugal Place. And I do agree with uh, Councillor Thornborough that it's a really difficult one without CGI visualisations, because if you look on the plans as they are, it looks incredibly imposing, but of course it's stepped. So we've got some of the visualisations that the case officer bought, but it's a really difficult decision without, without a CGI. And I appreciate that costs money to get and things, but it, you know, that to me is the main issue. I'm very supportive of the general principle of development. I'm supportive of practically everything else about it, but it is that particular first floor extension that goes out further than it does currently at the rear that, for me, is the, the main concern, I think, as the officer highlighted. So I'm struggling without better visualisations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Pagecroft. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I appreciate that this has been a long time in the planning and I appreciate the hard work you've put in for it. But I have to have, say I have reservations about the houses in Portugal Place as well. Um, and I quite agree that I think I would like a little bit more information about that massing and how it's going to look into their windows and all, all, the, all of it that goes with it. So a little bit more information would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bajans. Thank you, Chair. I think that there's a dilemma, really. The, as the person against it said, it's pretty bad at the back, but not so bad that it doesn't matter. And I think that's a key phrase. Um, I like the idea that it's sloping away, but I, I'm having trouble visualising what it really looks like. And I, I think I'd like Mary to show the pictures again. I don't need the plans, but the pictures, I think they would be very good. One thought that I had, I worked on one of these before, where they gave the residents the right to choose the colour of the roof, which if it went to an agreement that we might be prepared to do so the residents can decide if they want it to be sky blue so it disappears and fades away or, or has some clouds on it or something like that. But, I mean, it's a, a pretty uninteresting building at the moment. It can't be pleasant to look at from Portugal Place, but it may be not as bad as it doesn't matter. So I'd like, I'd like if that was OK, if Mary could show us the pictures again. Because as Katie's, as Councillor Thornborough said, 
it would be nice to see a model. You don't have that authority. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so I'll say I've got a few bullet points here I've written down. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the work that's been done over the years to get to this stage. Um, of course, at the moment, you know, what we've got is what we've got on the table and we have to um, speak about that. So it is a very sensitive site. And um, uh, it's been said already, we said on site when we were there that, or I said at least, that um, some more idea of what it would look like in context would have been good. And Councillor Thornborough has mentioned the model. Uh, you know, they used to be called artist impressions, but CGIs would be good as well, um, so that we could have more of an idea. And I think really what that's all about is trying to mitigate against what we see in front of us, which is, doesn't look very good, and um, uh, trying to get our heads around how it, it might actually be acceptable. So what I can see from what I can see, what's been presented, is that there's a, uh, a lot of bulky roofscape in a bad way, and that part of the application site will be looked over by the residents of Portugal Place or future residents. And uh, although it may be matte and it may be a warm colour, the southwest and, and southern sun will still reflect off that surface toward the, the um, you know, the, the neighbours in Portugal Place. And I mean, I think that's not the main factor. The main factor is the first thing I just said, which is that it's a, it's a large, bulky roof state. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised really that architects have come up with this because although, you know, the uh, conservation officer has found, finds it acceptable, although he, he, she does point out that there are problems with the lack of trees that are being lost in it, and I'll come to that later. Um, in terms of the, 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 the proposal, and I'm very much in favour of contemporary buildings, modern buildings, and they can fit in very well in, in sensitive sites like this. Um, and, and this is meant to be that, a contemporary building. It, what I get from it is, aside from the bulky roof state, and I'm sorry, this is all a bit of rhetorical conversation, but I think it's worth saying, um, the, the elevations give the impression of very sort of industrial or, or maybe even a prison type look with the sort of slit windows. And th th that's my main point, really. It's not even just about the bulky roof state that faces Portugal Place. It turns its back on Portugal Place. It doesn't, it doesn't smile at Portugal Place. It doesn't say anything nice to Portugal Place. It just sits there and sort of with its back to it, uh, and a big back it is. And, and it won't be a nice thing to look out over from your bedroom window or whatever from the, those houses. So I'm concerned also about the trees on the as you look at it, the top and the bottom of the plans, which are going to be effectively built over, the roofs are going to be built over by this application site, which doesn't seem like something we normally come across in planning committee. I understand it can be achieved uh, by special and careful um, foundations, but it doesn't seem like a very good idea for the trees, and Councillor Thornborough has already alluded to that problem. Um, so, in essence, I, I just don't think it's a very attractive building, including the elevation at the front, in fact. I mean, it, it, it doesn't sing to me at all. As a, as a, it, this should be a, a, an exemplary building. It's in a very sensitive area. It's in the centre of Cambridge. It should be saying, yay, I'm a really fantastic contemporary modern building. And it just seems to hide a bit and show a big back to the Portugal place and not a very attractive facade at the front either. So I just can't find much good about it, to be honest. That's, that's it, I, not, no questions. Anyone else? Councillor Pora. I just wondered, I know we were sent photos from a site visit that I think Mary had undertaken. I don't know whether it's possible to get those up where we had the views from the windows in the actual houses, because I think that would help. Because again, I'm just struggling with visualising at the moment. I'm almost tempted to say deferral, but I'm happy to roll the debate on a bit, but it would be useful to have those in the public domain here as well, please, if that's possible. Yeah, good point, Councillor. Any more? Okay, uh, back to you then, Mary, if there were any questions to answer. And also, that was a good point from last, uh, from Councillor Bohr about seeing those pictures in the windows, if possible, Mary. Oh, sorry, sorry, did I miss you, Councillor Howard. I apologise, Mary, just hold on. So, can, yes, Councillor Howard. 
Yeah, I'd just like to check, do we have a, an estimated an amount of actual sunlight time that's lost by the residents in Portugal Place? Yeah. For example, on, say, a, a March day, if, if that calculation's been done. OK, got the last question, Mary. Um, yes, that has been done, uh, Chair. Um, and the, the, I think the conclusion of the daylighting report was that there wouldn't be a, any more um, detrimental impact on those rear gardens than or they are already experiencing. And I think that is addressed in, in, the, um, in the report. OK, thanks, Mary. Were, were there any other questions? I know a lot of people made statements as opposed to ask questions, but uh, anybody feel they haven't had a question answered by Mary? Yep. Councillor Thornborough, Councillor... I Wood asked Ashley. if the tree, one of the tree conditions could be strengthened to ensure there wasn't any future claims on subsidence as a result of the existing tree. Yep, thanks. And Councillor Gorthup Wood? Uh, it was what any damage that might occur to the walls on the north and east side and the colour of the bronze mm. roof. That's Lepora. Uh, the size of the shrubbery bit at the front comparative and whether two trees is appropriate when there's three being taken out, I think, and also cycle parking. Uh, there you go, then, Mary. Can you get answers yeah, to those, okay. please? Yeah, OK. Yeah, so in terms of the um, the historic walls that um, surround the, the existing synagogue, um, the new proposed condition 40 includes a provision um, for the protection of these retained historic walls. Um, but we don't know who, who owns them. Um, may be sections that the synagogue may own but yeah we don't know who owns them but we've got a condition that could protect them um in terms of the the removal of the tree um the planting of new trees two are shown indicatively um or are shown on the site plan but that um We have also got a um, requirement for a landscaping scheme, so it, it's feasible potentially that we could have three trees replacing the existing the trees to be lost in in that forecourt, and that you know there would be a lot more greenery put in. Um, so it may not be a sort of loss of um, trees on the site. Um, with the the. The cycle parking standards uh, from Appendix L of the local plan um, say for, for a place of worship, um, it would be one short stay space for every four seats. So I'm not sh sure how many seats there are, so I would probably need to get back to you on that, um, on that um, question but I could have a look on the plans for that. Yeah, so yeah, in terms of the shrubbery as well to the front, um, I think there would be potential for some shrub beds to be put um, back into the, you know, the revised landscaping scheme for, for the synagogue. Is that it, Mary? I think that. Yeah, I yeah. think so, Chair, at the moment, yeah. And um, so, will you get back to us during this meeting with the number of cycle parking spaces or. I'll just I'll need to check, check. Yeah, yeah, check some. a plan. But yeah, I may be able to, Chair, yes. I mean, do you know how many cycle parking spaces there are? I can't see from the plan in front of me. That number might be useful. There's 18 in. 18 in the, in the covered area, and I think there's 10 um, in the forecourt to the front of the, the site. OK, councillors, whilst Mary's looking for that, then any more questions? Councillor Pora. 
I'm coming back to the frontage with the greenery, because obviously at the moment I appreciate it's going to come further out, but in the design and access statement, I look, there did appear to be some greenery. I'm a little unhappy with the idea that we could condition it, we could get it later. I'd, I'd like to be clear what is proposed in the current plans, because I think that is important. You know, it's not a particularly verdant area, understandably, it's a town centre road, but I'd be keen to make sure that that is there. Um, I think as well, I think it was Council Pick mentioned, but I mentioned it for the other application separately, about the idea of the kind of management plan for the works, about alerting residents to when each phase is happening, if this is approved, and um, which I think we've used in the Emmanuel Pembroke development in town, which is what I was thinking of it. And I think we added to the previous application, so I don't know if the officer could just confirm whether they're happy to add in a kind of construction management plan if this is approved, so that local the churches nearby and the houses nearby are informed about the phases of development and when they might anticipate, you know, the loud work so they can plan their own homework around it. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Any more? No? Okay, so Mary, did you find out about the cycle parking? Yeah. Um, well, on the plan that I'm sharing at the moment, it does show um, some sort of layout of how many the building, um, how many the seats the place of worship would have um so i'd need to add those up i, I don't think out. so mary that that will just be indicative that's not going to be something we can rely on so you're saying we'll have 28 places and you're saying there should be one for every four seats so that would be about 100 so i reckon that's probably going to be about the right amount shall we stick with that councillors councillor thornborough you asked it is that satisfactory? I think we're okay with that. That's not a big factor. Obviously, there's also the question of other parking for bikes, like cargo bikes and that sort of thing, but they can be parked at the front, can't they, with those uh, Sheffield stands, I guess. Any other questions, councillors? Yes, Councillor Howard. Uh, apologies if this is already in the submission, but I wondered if uh, I could confirm what is in the plant room exactly and whether the heating system is it's on gas or if it's uh, got a heat pump. Thanks for that, Councillor. That reminded me that I had another note as well. There's a, a ventilation plant at the back, right next to the Portugal Street Gardens, Mary. So I understand there's going to be a sort of a, a, an active sort of noise measurement device there, but that's a bit of a concern. Is there anything you can say about that, Mary? So was this the, the power to the building? You were... say, that, say that again. Was this how the how the building is going to be powered? I think it's it's shown on the plans as a ventilation plant, and, and also Councillor Howard asked generally about the the plant room and what's in there. Two separate questions: one from me and one from Councillor Howard. Is that clear, Mary, or are you? Yes, sorry, Chair. I'm just trying to actually find out the information. Yeah, so in terms of heating, provision of heating in hot water will be via air source heat pumps. Um, Um, so those, some of those heat pumps are in, in the basement plant room. Um, and then the building is also um, been redesigned to be a sealed building with no need to open windows. So the plant for that, those um, that equipment is what, what it would be in the basement. Okay, thanks, Mary. And the issue that I raised about the noise of the uh, ventilation plant and next to the Portugal Street neighbours. Well, the environmental health haven't, um, they haven't raised any objections to that. I think there is condition 
regarding noise assessment. Um, let's try and find that one. Yeah, so condition 22 is asking for details. Um, well, it's to, it says that no operational plant machinery or equipment shall be installed until there's a noise insulation mitigation scheme that's been spitted and approved by the local planning authority. Um, and then there's an additional condition that says that um, there would also be post-construction completion of the noise insulation scheme. So anything to do with um, ventilation and plant noise and so on um, would have that um, be tested um, and sort of monitored. So um, it's in compliance with that noise assessment. So the reason for those conditions is yet yeah, to protect the immunity of um, nearby residential properties. Okay, thanks, Mary. I guess Toby's going to say something first. I'm going to come in very quickly, Chair, just to cover a couple of points that I think have been raised. First one in relation to conditions five and six and tree. I think condition five in relation to trees, that there could be additional reference to soil shrinkage within that condition, particularly with reference to periods of dry weather. I don't think we could ever kind of exclude potential kind of claims for Comp comp compensation, but I, I think the foundation design in particular and its construction could be referenced within condition five. And they're just going back to Councillor Fora's um, reference with regard to the construction management plan. The, the, the condition actually is drafted on the amendment sheet, which will be condition 40. It does include reference to a phasing programme and it includes reference to a stakeholder engagement and residents' communication plan together with reference for a single point of contact. I, I think that covers most of the points that um, have been raised by Councillor Thora. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Councillor Thornborough. Um, I was just looking at Councillor Howard's question about reduction in light level, and it seems to me that the, the existing building that's there is partly two-storey and partly single-storey. The two-storey bit, which uh, from the Portugal Road houses, the, the roof slopes away from the back gardens. But it seems like, from what I can see from the drawings, that the slope is actually further away. The new slope is further away than the current slope. So it may not be a, a pleasant outlook, but the, uh, the it's actually further away, I think. But the it looks like the, the houses further up, which back onto the single story, um, part be behind 25 and 26, they have they look out over a flat roof towards the building at the front, and they will now be looking out over um, this metal roof. But the but there's a greater distance between their back wall and the building, and so I'm just saying that um, I think that Councillor Bajant's suggestion that if this is approved, that the residents are consulted on the final colour of the um, roof materials is a good suggestion and I don't know whether it could be an informative I know the materials have to be signed off but it may I think it would be a, a good a good thing that uh, the the neighbours who have to look on to that material have a say about what they look on to. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, that example was from the train shed, wasn't it, in Romsey, and a bit different in, I feel. I feel it's a bit unfair on the applicant to be uh, told what colour to make their building, um, although I'm, uh, I'm aware that residents might well have to make, have, ideally have input into that. So uh, I'd, I'd support an informative, but I'm not too sure about a condition for that kind of plan. I think an informative would be... Uh, a more amenable way forward, but others might disagree. Councillors, Councillor Pora, do you want to speak? 
only to say whether we were able to see the photos from the windows we'd asked about. Yes, sorry. Yes, Mary, um, Councillor Port asked to see the um, views from the windows of us from, from outside yes, the windows yes. Across, across the place. Yes, sorry, Chair, I was looking at other things to find. So um, it's on a separate PowerPoint. So I'll see if I can find it and then um, share. So if you bear with me, I'll find that. We were awaiting Councillor Bajan, if I may address you directly. Uh, were you shaking your head at the informative suggestion you want for condition on the colour to be chosen by residents? If, if we take that route, Chair, to approve, then I, I don't see what difference it makes to the developer what the colour of the roof is. It certainly will make a great deal of difference to the people that have to look at it. So I would like it to be a condition. Well, maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I think, you know, it's it's the applicant's building, the applicant's site. It's their decision in the end. Councillor Thornborough. I, I'm just looking at the, three, the 3D drawing and the, the building be, where there was a flat roof and now it's two storey. I think it's between 25 and 26. There's two roof lights there. And I'm, I'm just concerned that um, they'll, they could... I think they need to be dark at night. We don't want, I don't think it would be very good looking out over two bright roof lights during winter months. Can that, do you know the, one, the ones I mean, the small sloping roof? I think it'd be very important that, that, that they can be shut off at night so there's no light pollution from that, those for the, for the residents' amenity, the back residents' amenity. Yeah, that's a good point, Councillor, this proposed roof plan. Um, I think we need to refer to officers. Mary, do you have an answer on that, or are you busy with the other thing? Um, well, yeah, I will answer the questions, yeah, as yeah, as I'm able to, and I'll try and do it in the logical order. Um, so, okay, I'll take a look at the, uh, see if I can find the, this is, the ground floor plan. So the windows would be in approximately this sort of location. Um, so above the worship space. Um, so there may be times when that isn't um, in use at night, but if it is, perhaps we could, I don't know, if, if they could have a blind or something that is shut to reduce light spillage. Um. Yeah, I mean, definitely, Mary. If you let the windows, if that's what they are, can have inbuilt electric blinds or m m operated blinds, whichever, but it's all possible, yeah. Yeah, this is quite shallow. So this is almost a flat roof. Um, so it would be sort of upward light rather than sort of angled light coming out if you're with me um so yeah so that's that's that question then um so in terms of the the photographs we we showing the impact from properties do you want me to just go through these yes please mary yep okay so obviously 25 Portugal Place. Um, this shows the existing view across the flat roof section. Um, um, yeah, and beyond to you. Um, so you've got the, um, oh, sorry, you've got the Cambridge Visual Performing Arts Building there, and this is the other side of Thompson's Lane. This is from... Um, Hang on, Mary. Yes, Councillor. Just on that photo before, Mary, could you confirm, just if you could just go back to the other one. So uh, that's 25. That's Mary. the one, yeah. So would the, would the new ridgeline rise above the current view of the distant ridgeline of the buildings? In other words, would the sun set earlier, given the new buildings in place? Follow up, Mary. It's a bit of a difficult question to answer, to be honest, Councillor. Um, 
to say whatever. Could I rephrase that slide to just say yeah, how, on, yeah. how big would the building be? Because my yeah. understanding is that would, in effect, the building would be up to the height of the thing you can just see on the left. So in effect, it would be in front of that whole window. Yeah, we need verified views, really. We don't have them. So ca carry on, Mary, anyway. Do, do what you can. So... This is looking for, this is, I think this one is from, oh yeah, from 27, um, where they got a partial view of the two-storey element and the flat-roofed section. Um, this is a view from their top window. So this, it's pretty much in line with this section of the existing building. So it would pretty much go across and fill in that that gap there, that section there. Then I think there's a there's a lower section of flat roof here, or, um, and then it would rise again there. Um, this just shows the um, the relationship of the existing building with um, the courtyard of 28. So you can see. It, if you're in that courtyard, you don't really appreciate the massing of the existing building. And given the roof is going to slope away, this is why in terms of impact on the actual outside amenity space, we don't feel there'd be a detrimental impact. Um, and then this is, so yeah, that's the existing views of the, the um, And then 29 um, is right at the end. So it doesn't really overlook too much of the existing synagogue at the moment, but this there will be a roof slope coming in this sort of direction. So a bit of the a bit of the sky will be obscured um, as a result of the proposal. Is there any you, you want me to show, to show you again? again. Sorry. Yes, Councillor so, Thornborough. Could we go back to 25 and 26? 25 again? and 26, Mary. Any particular questions, Councillor Thornborough, on that? And 26, please, Mary. So this is the um, this is ground floor or basement level. So that's not impacted by the proposal. So, and then. Okay, Councillor, so I can hear you saying a couple of things, probably thinking out loud, looking at those photos, but let's have all debate transparently in the open on the microphones, please. So anything else to say, Councillor Bajant? Chair, I, I, I'm... Nothing to... No problem with the massing on the site. I've got the problem with the bit that's adjacent to Portugal Place. And I think it's really sad that there couldn't be a position where that could have been moved back a little bit further and, the, and we didn't need to go to this double story because I know there's a double story there already, but there could have been a bit of a concession there. I think that's really affecting... I mean, the building itself, it's a big building, but, you know, it's all big buildings around there. But this is, this is encroaching a little bit more than I would be comfortable with that sort of Clapham omnibus question, I suppose. What would that person say, or what would I say? So, I'm... I'm just saddened that this wasn't sorted out before it came here a bit more. I think I'm, I'm moving towards a rejection, but not on the basis that I don't want the thing on there or I don't think that I think it's too big or anything like that. I just think it's too close and it could have been done better. Right, thank you, Councillor. Anything else? No? Okay. I think you said all you needed to say, didn't you, Mary? There wasn't anything else to pick up? 
Um, I don't. I think. I think I have, Chair. Um, but if there is anything that's missed, I'll, I'll address it. Thanks. I mean, the tree officer isn't here today, but um, I think we had our tree questions answered, didn't we? Okay, there was nothing outstanding from that, you know, because those were a concern. Okay, in that case, we'll get the recommendation then, please, Toby. Thank you, Chair. So the recommendations um, set out at paragraph 10.83 of the report, that is to approve the scheme subject to the planning conditions as set out with minor amendments as drafted and delegated to officers. It also includes uh, revisions as set out in the amendment sheet to condition one in relation to the uh, start date period, condition 16 in relation to uh, noise insulation. A new condition 40 in terms of the construction management plan, which includes reference to phasing and a communications plan for neighbours. An amendment to condition five to include reference to sh soil shrinking in particular. Um, a new condition in relation to roof lights um, to ensure that blinds are pulled over at an appropriate time. Uh, the final drafting of that to be delegated to officers and an informative in relation to consultation with neighbours in relation to the uh, roofing materials that would face Portugal Place properties. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, say, say that again with the microphone on, please, Councillor Bajant. Yeah, I'd like that to be a condition about the roofing colour. So, uh, officers, is that a reasonable condition? Uh, no, it would be an unreasonable condition. Um, it's perfectly reasonable to have an, in, an, in, an informative, but the, the, that, that can, the materials are for the applicants to propose and officers to determine through uh, the planning conditions attached already to the um, recommendation. It would not be reasonable at all to allow um, that decision to fall within uh, the remit of uh, adjacent residents. All right, thanks for that, Toby. I haven't forgotten you, Councillor Bajan, and we'll come back to that just that Councillor Howard has signed up as well. So, Councillor Howard? Yeah, I'm just interested in as a question for the committee, your recent precedents. Has the committee set a precedent of a similar symbolic or real material offer that the applicant might make to uh, petitioners in a similar sense to that one that would be reasonable? Every item is considered on its own merits. You don't really have those sort of precedent setting occasions. Um, Councillor Bajan, if you wish to propose that, which I think you are, is there a seconder for a condition on the residents to be able to choose the colour of the roof materials? No. Okay, that falls then. So in that case, you've heard the recommendation. Uh, did you finish, Toby? I think you did, didn't you? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so the recommendation is one of approval, just to be clear. All those in favour of that recommendation? Can't see any hands up, no, that's not. All those against? Seven, Chair. That's unanimous. So in that case, we'll uh, need to put a form of words together for our reasons for refusal. And um, so... Councillors, if you want to suggest what, how this works is councillors suggest things. We've already had the debate anyway. Uh, officers have made notes. Then officers will go away, write the reasons up for refusal, come back. We'll have a little break during that period. They'll come back. And then um, we'll put the reasons for refusal to councillors who will vote on them. And if they accept them or adjust them or whatever, whatever we choose to end up with, that will be our reasons for refusal. And then we'll go from there. So, Councillor Thorborough. Uh, for me, the main thing is uh, policy 37 designing new buildings and it's uh, where they they have to demonstrate to have a positive impact on their setting in terms of location of the site height scale form material detailing wider townscape I, I particularly 25 and 26 where they looked over to they I think there's a loss of light and the outlook is 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 not uh, demonstrated to be positive. 
Thank months. you. Okay, Kasapor. Yeah, I agree. I think for me, the only issue I can wait to really is, is that outlook from Portugal Place. And I think also the fact that with the drawings we've been provided, it's been really hard to see it. So I think because obviously the, the onus is on the applicant to show us the evidence of it. And for me, I haven't been satisfied that my concerns about the massing of the first, so the additional story could be overcome. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gorthrop Wood. Just to um, really reiterate this, it's all around 10.81 and the um, additional massing and enclosure to existing properties and particularly 24, uh, 25, 26 um, and possibly 27. Thank you. Ms. Councillor, so uh, I don't know if these things have been said already, but I'd say we've discussed the scale, massing, bulkiness, proximity of the, especially the roofscape of the building generally to the occupants or future occupants of Portugal Place. That'd be the first thing. The thing that I wanted to highlight was I felt the design of the building was lacking in terms of being a quality contemporary building. I just didn't feel that it presented a good face both to its uh, neighbours behind or to the street. That was my opinion. And, um, and yeah, that's that. And then finally, the, um, we talked and I mentioned the trees uh, that were going to be probably affected by this development and how, you know, building over the roots would not so, normally something we see in this committee and I'm not quite sure if they would survive, but that, you know, that would need, could be achieved, I guess, by some special engineering measures, but... Um, not good, and also losing the trees at the front, although we understand two more trees would be replanted, so there was a concern there, I think, but lesser than the previous two. Any more, councillors? Councillor Thornborough? I just, so I think that's uh, policy 55, responding to context, and also policy 61, which is the conservation enhancement of historic Cambridge historic environments. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? Yeah, Councillor Howard? Yeah, I think I agree with the statements that have been made. Um, probably not supposed to try and redesign, but if, if the massing could be pushed further towards the Thompson Road end to move it away from Portugal Place further, I, I imagine it could be more palatable. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I think that might be it for the time being. So, obviously, we'll let officers come back with a form of words and we can have a look at those and adjust as necessary, go from there. So thanks, councillors. We're going to have to wait a bit for them to do that. So it's going to be at least 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. We're we'll laying for 10, so 6 o'clock back here then, please. So continue not to discuss the item, please, while you're out, because we're still in, in this item. So no discussion amongst one another or with members of the public. Thank you.
We want to go live again now, please, Sarah. I can hear, hear an echo. Someone's got something on. Um, so, welcome back, members of the public online. Uh, we've had a short break. There is an echo in the room. Is that better? That's better, I think. Yes, good, thank you. Um, so, uh, we're now at the stage where the officers are going to present us with a form of words that outlines our reasons for refusal for this item. So, Toby, if you want to do that then, please, I presume you're going to do it. I'm struggling to share my screen at the moment. Uh, okay, I'm going to read these. I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to read them out, Chair. Well, we've read them out before in the past, so that yeah. should be fine. Go for that, yeah. Okay. Listen, right, listen up. First reason for refusal, by virtue of the scale and massing of the proposal, the confined nature of the site and the building's close proximity to Portugal Place properties, which have small and confined rear amenity spaces and windows in close proximity to the boundary of the site. The proposal would result in additional significant harm as a result of enclosure to the outlook from the rear of Portugal Place properties. The proposal would therefore not have a positive impact on its neighbours and is therefore contrary to Cambridge Local Plan 2018, policies 55 and 57 and the MPPF 2021 paragraph 130. Okay, thanks Toby. I think you might as well go on and read the, uh, the other text you've got there. The second reason for refusal, the proposed design of the building would fail to assimilate itself successfully into its surroundings and therefore fail to respond successfully to its historical context. As such, it would harm the character and appearance of the conservation area and be contrary to policy 61 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018 and the MPPF Paras 200 and 202, amounting to less than substantial harm. The public benefits would not outweigh the harm that were that would arise to the conservation area. The third reason for uh, refusal, uh, the proposal has failed to demonstrate that the scheme could be delivered without harm and or the loss of trees on or adjacent to the site. The potential harm and loss of trees of high amenity value would result in wider harm to the setting of the conservation area that is not outweighed by the public benefits arising from the scheme. Thereby, the proposal is contrary to policies 55, 56, 61 and 71 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018 and Para 131 of the MPPF 2021, which seeks for existing trees to be retained wherever possible. Toby, any comments? Actually, just before we start on that, uh, we just need to do the sort of admin thing because we've gone past six o'clock. So um, I'm proposing that we continue the meeting to the end of this item and then adjourn the rest of the agenda. Any, can we all say yay? Yep, yep, thank you very much. Okay, carry on, Councillor Pora. Is it worth particularly mentioning, is it 25 to 27, as the affected ones most particularly? And for me personally, it, it was that first floor extension at the back that was the most issue, most important issue I could you know if that wasn't there I think for me on balance it would have been okay I don't know whether you feel we need to reflect that in the reason or not but that was certainly for myself and I think possibly for some other members the biggest issue for you chair I, I think probably a, a broader brush approach is better the officer report does identify those particular properties but I, I, I think you would probably want any inspector to consider the impact on all of those those particular properties hey councillor Pora thank you any more okay well it looks like we're all content with the reasons for refusal in that case if I can take them on block and vote for all three so all those in favor of accepting the three reasons for refusal that's all the councillors here except the minded to refuse reasons. Yeah. Okay, so we set the reasons for refusal. So now we need to vote on the substantive item, which is to refuse the item. To refuse the to refuse the item for the three reasons as just read out, Chair. 
Yep, thank you, Toby. So all those in favour of refusing the item? Seven, Chair. Okay, that's unanimous, so the item is refused. Thank you very much. So thank you, councillors. It's been a long day. Uh, so uh, thanks for all that debate today. Very good. And um, obviously there's other items we need to come back to a future meeting of this committee to be confirmed. The next meeting of this committee is in three weeks' time. Um, uh, uh, officers will be in touch about a, a future meeting, whether we need to slot those items into a future scheduled meeting or whether we need to add an additional meeting to the schedule. Uh, but if we do that, officers will get in touch as soon as possible. And I can't say exactly when it will be at the moment, but the diary is quite full, so do our best. Thanks, councillors. Okay, safe journey home. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.